has expired. I'm sorry, that's the second time in two days I've cut you off. Uh, because uh, I did remind senators that we passed the motion earlier in the day to do a sharp cut off at 3.30. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against the ayes have it. We now back to government business, social services, ledge. Do I need to call the clerk? Yes, I'll call the clerk. Social Services Legislation Amendment Energy Assistance Payment Bill 2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cameron. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Now, I'm just trying to remember where I was up to uh, in that last speech. It was something about the government being an absolute rabble. I think that's where I got up to, and I think I was dead on when I, I did that uh, position. And it was also I was talking about you know, the budget falling apart overnight, and it didn't last from late line to lunch. You know, th this is a government that has just lost it completely. This government has just got no focus. They are still trying to deal with the division and the dysfunction that has epitomised a government now with three prime ministers. It's just a terrible situation that we're in. And this budget won't be the silver bullet that makes people forget about how bad this government has been over a period of six years. Now, here we are, you know, after six years. We're probably six weeks out from an election, and I can tell you a $75 tax cut won't undo the cuts and cruelty that this government has been dishing out over the last six weeks. As I said, we sought to move an amendment in the House to see the payment extended because there's no good reason for people in these payments to be excluded. They face the same cost of living and, in many cases, are in fact on a lower payment. While Labour supports this payment, make no mistake, after six years of chaos and cruel cuts, the Australian people will see right through this cynical and desperate attempt from this rabble of a government to save its own skin. This government must take the Australian public for fools. They must think pensioners. Have, got, have forgotten what they tried to do to pensioners. What the government will do today on this one-off payment doesn't undo the fact that this budget is being propped up by vulnerable Australians. Shamefully, this government has built almost a quarter of their projected budget surplus on underspends in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Next year, the Prime Minister has counted a $1.6 billion underspend towards the budget bottom line. This is a disgrace, not an achievement. It's $1.6 billion in services and support that people with disability will miss out on because the government has botched the NDIS and underspend at every turn. It comes on top of a shocking $3.4 billion underspend in the 2018-19 financial year and over $6 billion to date. This is a direct result of delays in the NDIS rollout, with over 77,000 people missing out on the NDIS this year alone. And it's a consequence of people being unable to use their plans because services and support are simply not available. People are waiting months and in some cases years for basic equipment. People are going without the right therapy and personal support. The NDIS has fallen into crisis under this government. People are getting poor quality plans, they are not being treated with respect, services are being pushed to the brink, and waiting times are completely unacceptable. After six years of neglect, the government's knee-jerk announcement on NDIS prices six weeks out from an election is too little, 
too late. The bottom line is, Australians with disability are the ones paying, so Scott Morrison can bolster his books. For, for 834 days, the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government tried to cut the pension for over 1.5 million pensioners, as well as recipients of Newstart, Youth Allowance and other payments, by scrapping the energy supplement. The energy supplement was designed to help vulnerable Australians with the cost of power bills. Scott Morrison's plan would have cost a single pensioner $14.10 per fortnight, or around $365 per year, and cut $21.20 a fortnight, or around $550 a year, from couple pensioners. This wasn't a plan for a one-off cut. It was a cut every fortnight, every year, for decades. Labour opposed this cut and committed to reversing it. Pensioners will never forget that in every single budget, the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government has tried time and again to cut the age pension. In 2013, Prime Minister Abbott promised that there would be no cuts to the pension, and yet in 2014, the Liberals tried to cut pension indexation, a cut that would have meant pensioners would have been forced to live on $80 a week less within 10 years. In that very same 2014 horror budget, the Liberals slashed $1 billion from pensioner concessions, support designed to help pensioners with the cost of living. In 2015, the Liberals did a deal with the Greens political party to cut the pension to 370,000 pensioners by as much as $12,000 a year by changing the pension assets test. In 2016, the Liberals tried to cut the pension to around 190,000 pensioners as part of a plan to limit overseas travel for pensioners to six weeks. For over three years, the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government has refused to review and adjust the deeming rates, while the Reserve Bank's cash rate has fallen from 2.25% in February 2015 to 1.5 per cent today. And for two years, the Liberals planned to scrap the energy supplement, cutting the age pension to 1.5 million pensioners. For four years, the Liberals tried to raise the pension age to 70. And Labour has fought each and every one of these cuts to the age pension. We have fought them tooth and nail. Meanwhile, over the past three years, the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government has cut and outsourced over 2,500 jobs from Centrelink. During this time, we have seen a blowout in call wait times to Centrelink and wait times to get on to the pension. This government has made it even more difficult for pensioners to contact Centrelink and to access the pension. Labour will boost Centrelink with 1,200 jobs. We will improve the services and reduce the wait times and make income support available and accessible as and when Australians need it. Try as they may, the government can't gloss over their gaping lack of energy policy with their energy support payment, this miserly energy support payment. After six years, they continue to be at each other's throats over energy policy. Thirteen energy policies over six years. They are more interested in tackling each other than tackling climate change or energy prices. Since the Liberals formed government in 2013, wholesale energy prices have doubled. In contrast, Labour has a comprehensive plan to boost renewable energy and put downward pressures on prices. We do have an energy policy. I would love to know what happened to this bill. How did something that wasn't in the budget last night 
end up in the Parliament this morning? Was there a crisis meeting? When was the crisis meeting? Who was there? Did they deliberately leave out New Start and other payments? Or was it an accident? And in the House this morning, the Minister for Social Services, Paul Fletcher, said, and I quote, You know, you're either fair dinkum or you're not. The numbers are either in your budget or they are not. Well, I mean, Paul Fletcher doesn't set the world alight, but I've got to tell you, you know, this just shows you all you need to know about this government. The government isn't fair dinkum about people on Newstart, our youth allowance, or the double orphan pension, because it wasn't in their budget last night. Now, Labour is of the view that it's well past time that the Australian public get a chance to pass their judgment on this rabble of a government, on this government who don't care about families, who don't care about young people, who don't care about the underprivileged, who don't care about the vulnerable in our society. This is a government that is simply about the big end of town. Because they were prepared, rather than deal with the issues that are important to the vulnerable in our society, to hand over $80 billion of tax cuts to multinational corporations, the banks and the richest corporations in this country. Again, that tells you all you need to know about this disjointed, discredited rabble of a government. We need a government who understands the pressures that are on ordinary working families. The reason they don't know is that most of them come from privileged backgrounds. Not all of them, but most of them. Those that haven't come from privileged backgrounds have abandoned the working class and formed an alliance with the powerful and the privileged. They've get, I've got even more contempt for them than I have for these privileged ponces that sit over there lecturing workers about having to lose their penalty rates. They don't understand what it's like to roll up to the checkout at Woolworths, Coles or Aldi and just pray that your MasterCard won't bounce so that you can pay for your groceries. I've been there. My family's been in that position. We understand how tough it is for people to be in that situation. You know, blue collar workers earning 40 grand a year are doing it tough. The cost of living's going through the roof. And all this lot want to do is hand $80 billion over to the big end of town. That's exactly what they, could, they would do if they could get away with it. Because we heard Senator Corman during question time again raising the issues about you know, lowering tax and you know, getting the economy moving, trickle-down economics. They are a pathetic mob. They are an absolute pathetic mob. Working-class people need better. Working-class people deserve better. You know, and when this government comes in, and spends the bulk of their time changing leader, attacking each other, how could they ever get it right to actually look after the people that deserve to be looked after in this country? You know, they talk about <coughs> equality of opportunity. Well, how can a poor family and say Mount Druitt in the western suburbs of Sydney, you know, faced with institutional poverty, faced with intergenerational unemployment, how can they have equality of opportunity? How can their kids get equality of opportunity when this mob want to cut funding to public schools, when they, when they want to hand more money over to the private schools? when they won't put proper money into the health system, 
How can any working class family in suburbs like Mount Drew around this country get a fair go? They can't do it under this terrible government. And this is the government that wants to cut penalty rates. You know, basically up here, day in, day out, arguing that penalty rates were old-fashioned, that penalty rates were not appropriate anymore. And yet when I, was, when I worked, my penalty rates at least gave me the opportunity to maybe not every year, but once every couple of years, save up to take my family on a holiday, if I was lucky. And they just think penalty rates are an old-fashioned institution. No, penalty rates actually put food on the table for working-class families. Penalty rates actually put shoes on children's feet, school uniforms on their back. But, you know, given that they are so remote, so privileged, on $200,000 a year base rate, how could they ever understand how, how hard it is for working-class families to battle? If there's one thing we need to do, it's to get rid of this coalition government. The National Party, who supposedly represent rural and regional Australia, some of the poorest regions in the country, talk a big game when they're up in the bush, but when they come in here, they back cuts to penalty rates, they back tax cuts for the millionaires, the billionaires and the multinational corporations. And then they wonder why <clears throat> that they're being abandoned by traditional National Party voters. Well, I'll tell you why they're being abandoned. Because the public have had enough of them, kowtowing to the Liberals, the doormat of the Liberals when they're down here, not taking the right steps to protect rural and regional Australia on welfare, on wages, on climate change. It's time for a change. It's time for a new government. It's time for a Labour government that looks after working people in this country. Thank you, Senator Cameron. Senator Seward. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution on the debate of the Bill of the Social Services Legislation Amendment Energy Assessment Payment Bill 2019. Now, as we know, this is a once-off energy assistance payment of the grand total of $75 for a range of uh, Income people on a range of income support payments. Now, having said once off payment of $75, any dollar that goes into the pockets of people trying to survive on income support means a lot to each of those. But in the scheme of things, $75 once off payment will not address some of the most fundamental issues that people on income support face. Now, let us remember here this government did not, never intended for this payment to go to people on New Start and Youth Allowance. They never intended it to. They have been shamed, shamed into making this payment also go to people on income on, on New Start. I bet it's through gritted teeth. And we know they didn't want it to go to, to people on New Start because when this issue was first leaked to the media, there was outrage outrage about Newstart. They could have fixed this before last night when they went to the budget, but no, it was overnight. It was overnight and all of a sudden there's different figures now for this particular payment than what was in the budget papers originally. It's very clear this is a last minute thing. They were shamed into doing it. If they really cared about people on Newstart, we would have seen an increase in Newstart. And this is why, where I find some of the commentary from the Labor Party outrageous when they know very well they know very well that people trying to survive on the measly new start payment that has not been increased for 25 years 25 years they know very well that people are living in poverty they know that people are living in poverty and the arguments that the government and in that and for that matter some on the other side of the chamber when they comment about this being a transition paper, uh, payment and the Treasurer himself this morning on the radio when he finally acknowledged and let people know that New Start recipients will get this $75, still repeated the same old myth 
that this is a transition payment when 64 per cent of people on Newstart have been on for over a year, 44 per cent for over two years, and 15 per cent, 15 per cent for over five years. This is a payment that was designed when the labour market was different. It is a very different situation now, and we have both of the old parties unprepared to increase New Start. People trying to struggle to survive on New Start need an increase now. Some members of the government even agree with that, and their <laughs> former Prime Minister, John Howard, the architect of welfare to work, even now admits that we need to increase New Start. So yes, let's review income support payments, but after we have seen an increase to New Start immediately. That is what's needed in this country, and that's what the Greens are going to this election with. An increase in New Start. And we've been in campaigning for an increase to New Start for years and years and years. Members in this chamber who have been here long enough know that I tried to live in it for a week in 2012. It hasn't seen a real increase since then. Then it was difficult. Seven years later, it's even more difficult for people to live on New Start. It is outrageous that they are still condemned to this, and this government doesn't care. They were completely ignored in the budget. For the government to come out and say this is a, this is a budget for people on low incomes, it's just not true. Because those on low incomes are those very, uh, very people that are struggling on New Start, struggling on youth allowance. They deserve an increase. Instead, the government layers out largesse on the wealthy end of town. That's where the bulk of the tax cuts go, the wealthy end of town. So they prefer to lay a largesse on them and ignore the people that are struggling to survive on New Start. That is what the community is hearing really clearly from the government. We, don't, we, didn't, even, we didn't even want them to get the government didn't even want people on New Start to get the $75 energy assistance payment. The very people that would make the most out of this payment to help them struggling to survive. This bill, along with a whole range of other bills, are being forced through the chamber by five o'clock tonight. There was over 21 bills on the list because some of the bills were cognated or done with together. We're at Bill 4. In just over an hour, we will then stop, go into another process of first speeches and valedictories, which I'm sure will be very worthy and I will be here listening intently, but then we'll go into a series of divisions to knock through those 17 bills, one of which is the cashless debit card which of course affects people on Newstart as well, affects people on Newstart and a whole range of other payments, a cruel budget measure which the government told a blatant untruth about in the budget speech to say that it cuts alcohol, it's cut alcohol by half, it's reduced gambling, which is a blatant untruth when they know that the ANAO report clearly said there is no evidence to support a claim of reduction in social harms. It's a blatant untruth. And yet they're ramming through this place with complicity of the ALP, I might add. The ALP know very well we won't get to debate the CDC bill because it'll be one of the ones, the 17 that's rammed through this place with no debate come five o'clock. That bill condemns people to another 12 months at least on CDC. And if the government has their way, they'll be transferring all the people on basics card on the terrible, flawed experiment of income management in the NT. They'll be pushing them onto the cashless debit card as well. So here is the ALP who claims and who did not, to be fair, did not support the rollout of the trial in the goldfields, but now they are supporting that rollout or continuation of the cashless debit card in the goldfields in East Kimberley and in Sejuna. Now they've got some amendments that have circulated, which again we won't get to debate, we'll just get to vote on that they try, they're going to try and convince the community that we're trying to make it a little bit easier for you to get off. Order. Well, last night Order. in this place, I also articulated very clearly that 
To get off the cashless debit card is very hard. The amendments that I've seen circulated on the cashless debit card do not improve it that much, because it leaves it up to the department quite a bit. It also leaves it up to the flawed community panel where there is one. And those processes, anybody living in the community, if they'd bothered to ask anybody living in those communities, they would know that that process is flawed too. These, again, are people that this government demonises because they are unfortunate enough to have to try and survive on income support, specifically Newstart being the lowest of those payments, and youth allowance, in fact, even lower. The ALP are assisting the government to get that done and let no one else tell you different because that's what they're doing by agreeing to the hours motion this morning, by agreeing to ram through these 21 bills through this place, most of them without debate. What they are doing is being complicit in driving those flawed approaches through. And I, for one, am not going to let the community forget what has happened in this place and how it affects people's daily lives. It is appalling that this government forgets the people on Newstart and is ably assisted by the opposition in, in punishing people on income support even more. People deserve to be living on more than $40 a day, which is what they are currently doing if they are trying to survive on Newstart. Given the timing, I will pass on, because we've got so many bills um, to continue on, I could talk for a very long time about the injustices of this budget, about the injustices of the measures this government is trying to force through this place. However, I'm aware that other senators want to make contributions on the over 21 bills that, this is, that are, are going to be forced through this place in a very short amount of time. However, I do want to move the second reading amendment that has been circulated in my name on behalf of the Australian Greens that reads at the end of the motion add, but the Senate calls upon the government to re-regulate electricity prices and establish a public re retailer to lower energy prices. This payment will help for a tiny bit people that are living on income support payments. It will help for a small amount for those trying to struggle to survive on New Start and New Allowance. But, but that is not a solution to the problem. The problem is people are living on the, below the poverty line. They are struggling. They are vulnerable. They need an increase in New Start, and it needs to happen immediately. Not wait while some sort of review is done. It needs to happen immediately. And if this government cared about the whole of the Australian community, they would have ensured that there was an increase to new start and youth allowance in this budget, not handing out the largesse to the big end of town. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Storer. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> if any more evidence were needed of this government's insensitivity, to the need for enhancing fairness in our society, it came with the Treasurer's overnight backflip on the energy assistance payment. Like many others, I was appalled that it was, not, that it was denied to people on Newstart. As if it is not bad enough that the value of Newstart and associated payments has not increased in real terms in a quarter of a century, some of the poorest people in the community were, be, were to be denied help, keeping themselves warm, cooking their food. Overnight, the government thought better of this, of its stinginess, not because it genuinely cares about the most unfortunate, unfortunate in our society, but because there is an election around the corner. Something is better than nothing, but a one-off payment of $75 is tantamount to an insult to the less well-off in our community who have been struggling with rises of much, much more in their energy bills in recent years. Australians are paying a high price, literally for the failure of this government to get its act together on energy and climate change. The $365 million for one-off energy assistance payments is not evidence-based policy. If the government was really taking the problem of energy bills seriously, it would spend that money on energy efficiency. Improving energy efficiency tackles an underlying cause of high energy bills, whereas the benefits of the one-off energy assistance payment will be short-lived. 
My bill, the Improving the Energy Efficiency of Rental Properties Bill 2018, would only cost 21 to 29 million in total, in contrast to the 365 million. Importantly, my bill would offer not simply temporary stimulus but long-lasting benefits, despite its modest cost. It not only cuts power bills for some of the most needy, but cuts consumption as well. Win-win. The bill was designed to help those worst off in our society, those who have been left behind by successive energy policies. It was narrowly targeted at renters who could benefit most from energy-efficient measures but have been forgotten. The energy debate in Australia is stubbornly focused on the supply side, on prices. But the demand side, energy efficiency, lacks sufficient scrutiny, even despite overwhelming evidence of its benefits to reduce energy bills. Energy efficiency offers the single, single greatest, simplest mechanism to cut energy bills, not just for one quarter but over decades. According to a report released earlier this year by Green Energy Markets, energy efficiency investment which could slash $7.7 billion per year from energy bills and create the equivalents of, equivalent of 120,000 full-time jobs. Taking the problem of energy bills seriously requires careful policy development, not a desperate last-minute cash splash. Taking the problem of energy bills seriously must involve a national energy efficiency strategy. The scale of the problem is too large and important for energy efficiency to be an afterthought. Policies that promote sustainability, that give relief and hope to those who need it most, should be supported. While I support this bill, I do so reservedly, noting that there are better policy options available that would do far more in much better ways. Evidence-based policies that would have lasting impact on reducing energy bills have been put aside in favour of simplistic, insulting policies like this bill. How fair is that? Hardly fair. Thank you, Senator Storer. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise uh, to indicate that, I, uh, that Senator Alliance will be supporting this uh, bill, but I think it's actually important to, to lay out a perspective that uh, has not yet been sort of put to the chamber, and that is uh, a little bit of a history around uh, one-off energy payments. Um, I, I asked people to reflect back to, 19, uh, to sorry, 2017 when we were dealing with the, uh, with the uh, Treasury's Law Amendment Tax Enterprise, uh, Enterprise Tax Plan uh, to reduce uh, the amount of tax that uh, companies who had a turnover of less than $50 million um, uh, to try and reduce their tax burden. Now, uh, it was during, that start, during, that, uh, during negotiations in respect of that bill uh, that Senator, uh, then Senator Xenophon, and, and I was uh, an advisor at the time uh, to, to uh, Senator Xenophon, we had a discussion with the government. Uh, they were trying to reduce uh, the burden on business, yet the largest burden on, on businesses, the thing that everyone was coming to us and saying, uh, in uh, the constituent office in, in Adelaide was that energy prices were too high. Um, businesses were suffering because of high energy costs um, and uh, some of them were facing closure. So as part of our negotiation to get a better outcome, we supported uh, the tax breaks for uh, the smaller uh, businesses, but we also insisted on some, some changes that, uh, that needed to be made or some additional things that needed to happen in order to assist, uh, assist businesses deal with high uh, energy prices. Uh, we, we did ask for a study to be done on, uh, uh, on, the EI, on the EIS arrangements. We asked for uh, uh, gas retention leases to be uh, viewed from a use it or lose it perspective. We asked the government, and they ended up, of course they agreed to doing uh, uh, these things. We asked the government to invoke the Australian, or what is now known as the Australian, or sorry, develop the Australian domestic gas security mechanism, which is now in regulation, and I point out has not been used. And in my view, uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, hasn't been used in error. That's a mechanism that allows the government to uh, to forecast what's going to happen with gas. Uh, supplies in the next year, and if they feel that there's going to be a, uh, a deficit of supply, uh, they can invoke this mechanism 
uh, which has the effect of cancelling all export licences, which then have to be renegotiated and, and need to be renegotiated in a way that ensures we have supply to the domestic uh, market. And in my view, uh, uh, that should have been invoked already because we're now facing a situation just through this poor um, uh, 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 management by the government in respect of, uh, of gas prices, gas prices are now back on the rise. Um, we, uh, we, ha we even had the ACCC doing a mea culpa in respect of uh, some of the uh, arrangements they had uh, or things that they had suggested about gas. So we're facing a real, uh, you know, we were then facing a real issue with gas prices and electricity prices. A mechanism was, was, uh, was introduced by the government, but unfortunately they haven't exercised it. They they're sort of uh, appear to be uh, a little bit uh, reluctant to do so on the basis that uh, some of these big energy, energy companies will, uh, will no longer offer support to, uh, to the Liberal Nationals. Um, it was also during that uh, negotiation uh, that Centre Alliance, uh, th then the Nick Xenophon team, negotiated a one-off payment, energy, uh, energy assistance payment. So it's interesting because when I look through this bill, uh, it talks about a one-off payment. It's not actually a one-off payment. This is a repeat. And it's a repeat because uh, over the last uh, 24 months, the government uh, was supposed to basically sort out the energy problem, the electricity, the energy problems that we have here in Australia, uh, and uh, we, we wanted to have a, uh, then a one-off payment that got people through those hard times while the government got on and fixed um, our, um, our energy uh, issues. Since that time, we had an EIS proposed. Then we went to a clean any energy uh, tar target uh, with. Uh, uh, Dr. Finkel, uh, we also uh, then had a, had a neg that was proposed, national energy energy guarantee. Then uh, we had uh, we had neg plus, and then most recently the big stick was proposed. But in every single one of these instances, the government failed. The, this is probably one of the biggest policy failures of the Liberal National government: uh, is they simply have not dealt with rising energy costs. That is, that is crippling Australian businesses. Uh, it's seeing some people making decisions to move offshore. And of course, it then results in the need for a bill like this, which once again we will support. But we support knowing that it's, it's in fact probably the, the starkest uh, uh, evidence that we've got that there is failed policy on the energy front, on energy prices here in Australia. And, uh, uh, I don't think there's any excuse that government can offer up as to how they, you know, we walk through EIS, through CET, through NEG, NEG Plus uh, to, uh, to a big stick, none of which got implemented, and, and not because uh, there would not have been support in this chamber, simply because there was uh, significant in infighting. And I, you know, I don't really want to play politics, but it has been a failure on the Australian people. Uh, energy costs are too high in this country. Uh, that's why we need this bill, but uh, it should have been fixed, and it hasn't been. Thank you. Senator Spender, for your first speech. No, um, this again is not my first speech. Oh. Uh, I, rise, anyway. <laughs> I rise to be the only parliamentarian, I suspect, who will oppose this bill, the Energy Assistance Payment Bill 2019. Uh, this bill provides a one-off payment to various welfare recipients, ostensibly for the purposes of electricity costs, but of course you can use the payment for whatever you want. This bill robs Peter to pay Paul. Now, Peter has had a terrible deal over the past 11 years because Peter represents the future generations. And over the past 11 years, we've had deficits, year in, year out. That means more debt. That means more of a debt burden on Peter, our representative of the future generations. Now, this policy is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Paul are current welfare recipients. We should not provide money to current welfare re recipients if that involves hurting future welfare recipients by putting Australians more in debt, less able to have a sustainable welfare system in the future and more likely to have a crippling tax burden in the future. Last night in the federal budget, Josh Frydenberg, our treasurer, said 
we've got to avoid this crippling interest debt that we have, this interest bill that we're paying year in, year out. I think he referred to $18 billion. Well, this payment is adding to the interest burden. It is absolutely ridiculous for the Treasurer in the one speech to say, we've got to avoid adding to the interest burden on future generations, and then within sentences, add to the interest burden on future generations. It is sheer hypocrisy. The only reason why this payment exists is because they want to get it out the door now because they're going to have a deficit this year anyway, and they don't want to hurt their chances of getting a surplus in future years. It is dodgy accounting and it is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy, Deputy President. I uh, rise to speak uh, in regards to the energy assistance payment, and I note that there's um, a second reading amendment uh, moved uh, already by uh, Senator Seward on behalf of uh, the Australian Greens that uh, adds at the end of the motion, but the Senate calls upon the government to re-regulate electricity prices and establish a public retailer to lower electricity prices. And of course, the reason we're having this debate is many people in Australia are struggling uh, with their power bills, and that's uh, as, a as a result of uh, a few different policy settings. But there's no doubt that um, the poles and wires that have been uh, invested into uh, in recent years and, in fact, decades up to a gold-plated standard have contributed significantly to power bills, which is one of the reasons that the Greens have been advocating for, for many years that we need to do more to empower people to generate and store their own electricity on premises, whether that be in people's homes or people's small businesses. And we certainly need to do more to encourage people uh, to invest and to actually provide financial assistance to help people to invest into things like rooftop solar uh, and batteries, which are now uh, available and, uh, if they follow uh, the price curve of um, most aspects of technology, will start to significantly reduce in price in the very near future. Now, of course, um, in last night's budget, the government didn't provide any meaningful support for those things, and in fact, um, the budget was um, negligent, grossly negligent in its response to the greatest pro public policy challenge facing humanity at the moment, which is the breakdown of our climate and the climate emergency in which we find ourselves. Uh, it was uh, another budget, another year of the coalition selling out our future. It contained billions of dollars in fossil fuel subsidies. It contained money to help unlock new gas resources in places like the Northern Territory. Um, there is a bill being rammed through later tonight with Labor's assistance to enable taxpayer money, Australian taxpayer money, to push more fossil fuel projects overseas. And in fact, um, this budget contains more money to reopen the Christmas Island detention centre so Prime Minister Morrison could conduct the most expensive press conference in our country's history than it does new money to address climate change. This is the wrong way and the government needs to go back. Our temperature records have been broken. We are at the moment 2.2 degrees above the long-term trend. Colleagues, our climate is crumbling around us as we debate this budget. In recent times, apocalyptic scenes have dominated the news. In my home state of Tasmania, communities have been threatened and our precious, unique Wilderness World Heritage Area devastated by fires made more likely and more dangerous by the breakdown of our climate. We've seen vast areas of northern Queensland and mid-northern Queensland in flood. We've seen a million dead fish floating in the parched Murray-Darling Basin. These are the graphic results of a disaster caused by humanity, and it is caused by humanity burning fossil fuels. And this is only the beginning, unless we get serious about climate action. And we can't get serious about climate action until we get serious about getting out of coal, which the Labor 
and Liberal parties in this place are refusing to do. Why do they refuse to act? It's a very simple answer. Because together they accept millions of dollars in dirty donations from the coal corporations in this country. Now, unlike the major parties, the Greens do not take donations from the big polluters. We will not let the corrupting influence of those donations rob us and our children and our grandchildren of their future. And we don't take those donations, which means we can develop a clear plan to phase out of coal and embrace the jobs-rich renewable energy revolution. We want to make this election a referendum on climate change and a referendum on coal. And we are asking people to vote Green in the Senate to send a message to the major parties that they need to end their love affair with coal. And we're asking people to vote Green in the Senate for a strong voice to, dem to demand climate action now. Because we think about the future, not just in budget cycles, not just in electoral cycles, but the long-term future. We care about people, we care about the natural world, and we are here in the Senate to hold the major parties to account. We do have a plan to transform our energy future in this country, to create jobs, to deliver better and higher quality public services and a better quality of life for us and for generations of the future. When thousands of children walked out of their classrooms last month to strike and demand strong action on climate change, we didn't lecture them like the Prime Minister did and government ministers did. We paid them the respect by listening to them. And I went to the action in Hobart. It was one of the most uplifting, empowering events I have ever been to. It was a cacophony of noise, of passion, of intelligence, of determination and, yes, of anger. Because these kids see so clearly what so many in this place cannot or will not see, that their future is being stolen from them by the dirty emitters, the big polluters and their lackeys in here in the major, major parties to whom they donate their dirty political donations. So when people go to the ballot bo box next month, they have a choice. They can vote for major parties who take the corrupting donations from the big polluters, from the coal industry, from the gas industry in this country, or they can vote for a party that refuses to take that dirty money and, as a result, has the courage to stand up and demand strong action on climate change and demand an end to the mining, burning and exporting of coal from this country. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, and thank colleagues for their contribution. Uh, this bill will enable a one-off energy assistance payment to be made to all pension uh, allowance and veterans payments uh, who are payable and uh, residing in Australia on 2 April 2019 to assist them with their energy costs. The payment will be $75 for singles and $62.50 for each eligible member of a couple. The payment will not be taxed and will not reduce their rate of income support. The payment will help around 5 million Australians at a total cost of around $365 million, and I commend the bill to colleagues. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. No. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the, uh, uh, the noes and Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes. Order, there being 11 ayes and 28, 28 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. As there have been no amendments, oh, Bill, uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. Uh, as no amendments have yet to be circulated, uh, I don't intend to call a committee stage unless any senator requests one. Are there any such requests? There being none, I call the minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment Medicare Levy and Medicare Levy Surcharge Bill of 2019 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read at the first time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill will be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. S Senator Cameron. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, Labor supports this bill. Uh, Labor supports the Treasury Laws Amendment Medicare Levy and Medicare Levy Surcharge Bill 2019 and the Medicare Levy Act 1986 and the A New Tax System Medicare Levy Surcharge Fring Fringe Benefits Act 1999 to increase. The Medicare Levy Low Income Threshold for individuals and families, along with the dependent child student component of the family th threshold, in line with movements in the CPI. The Medicare levy low income thresholds for individuals and families eligible for the seniors, senior and pensioners tax offset, along with dependent child student component of the family threshold, in line with movements in the CPI. 
and the Medicare levy surcharge low income threshold in, lo in line with movements in the CPI. The measure applies to the 2018-19 income year and later yeah. income years. This follows the practice of doing so annually as per the tax and superannuation law amendment, Medicare levy and Medicare levy surcharge bill 2018 last year. This is a regular process that ensures that the most vulnerable Australians are not disadvantaged while maintaining their access to Medicare, our world-class universal health system. I just want to make a few brief points reflecting upon what my colleagues in the other place have said this morning. The Shadow Minister for Health and Medicare, Catherine King, noted this morning that the 2019-20 budget has locked in the Prime Minister's cuts to public hospitals in a too little, too late health budget full of reheated announcements that don't make up for six years of Liberal chaos. As Treasurer Scott Morrison cut hospitals in every budget he wrote, and as Prime Minister he has now locked them in. For six years the Liberals have prioritised an $80 billion tax handout for the top end of town, and they have done that over prioritising Medicare, schools and hospitals. This is a Prime Minister completely out of touch and he only cares about the top end of town. Prime Minister Morrison has refused to restore the $715 million he cut from hospitals under the current funding period and he's persisting with his plans to rip billions more out of our hospitals over the next six years. Patients will suffer because of these cuts as they are confronted with longer emergency department and elective surgery waiting times or are forced to travel far from home for treatment. Bill Shorten and Labour will deliver a fair go for Australia by reversing these cuts and making massive new investments with our $2.8 billion Better Hospitals Fund. And while Labour will always welcome new investments in general practice, this budget doesn't come close to making up for the five-year rebate freeze that has ripped $3 billion out of Medicare. This is a freeze the Liberals first imposed in 2014. Now they are promising to lift it, matching Labour's long-held commitment, and they are doing this just six weeks out from an election. In the other place this morning, the Shadow Assistant Treasurer said that the Australian people are far too, far too smart to fall for this spin. They know that the cost of going to the doctor has risen, and that's why so many of them have been delaying going to the doctor. Last year, Labour noted that the official Bureau of Statistics figures showed that one million Australians delay or avoid seeing their GP each year. They do that because of the cost. And with another 1.7 million Australians skipping specialist appointments, this means that the health of Australians are not being properly dealt with under this government. Yet the li Liberals make the laughable claim that Medicare has never been stronger and that their commitment is rock solid. Remember all of Tony Abbott's promises before he became Prime Minister? Well, this is certainly the similar position. Uh, from this government. You know, and, and I must say, Senator Williams has not covered himself with glory uh, today. He's had a good parliamentary career, but he's really slipping towards the end. You know, to defend Tony Abbott, to defend the cuts during that 2014-15 budget that caused so much damage in rural and regional Australia oh, is an no. absolute joke. So, Senator Williams, you know, you've, you're, you've been, you're a mate, you've been, uh, you've been a good parliamentarian, but man, you have dropped the ball today. You know, whether it's making Medicare more expensive, cutting public hospitals, or putting health insurance profits before patients, Prime Minister Morrison can never be trusted on health. Labour created Medicare. And only Labour will ensure that Australians can access the health care they deserve. 
Although Labour will support this bill, a bill largely a product, product of convention rather than passion, we must em emphasise the existential threat that the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison, Hanson government and its recklessness poses to our valuable and cherished universal health care system. Only Labour will protect Medicare. Thank you. The Minister? Yes. Today, if possible. Yes. So, just, just one moment, one moment, Minister. One moment, Minister. Are you seeking the call, Senator? No, I'm not. Next to you, I am. You looked like you were seeking the call. You were sort of. Thank you, the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Firstly, I think I'd like to thank those who have contributed to the debate. Thank you, Senator Cameron. Um, the Treasury Laws Amendment Medicare Levy and Medicare Levy Surcharge Bill 2019 amends the Medicare Levy Act 1986 and a new tax system Medicare Levy Surcharge Fringe Benefits Act 1999 to increase the Medicare Levy low-income thresholds for singles, families and seniors and pensioners in line with increases in the consumer price index. This will ensure that the low-income thresholds keep pace with increases in the cost of living. The amendments to the Medicare levy low-income thresholds apply to the 2018-19 year of income and future income years. Full details of the measures in this bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. Now the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, those opposed say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. As no amendments have been circulated, does any senator require a committee stage? I shall call the minister uh, to move the third reading. I move the bill be read a third time. And the question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the uh, Treasury Laws Amendment increasing the instant asset write-off of small business entities, Bill 2019, for concurrence. I call the Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Well, the question is that the bill be read a second time and, well, first of all, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, the question is now that the bill be read a second time. Senator Cameron. Um, I rise to indicate Labor's support uh, for the Treasury Laws Amendment increasing the instant asset write-off for small business entities bill 2019. I'm pleased to see a great Labour initiative debated in the Senate and pleased those small businesses across the country will continue to benefit from it. It's particularly good to see the Liberal Party and the National Party once again adopting sound Labour policy in favour of small businesses in this country. As we know, it was the... Well, so, you know, I've got to say, uh, Senator Williams, any government that would put Senator Cash in charge of anything, especially small business, is not looking after the interests of small business. It's particularly good to see the Liberal and Part National Party adopting our policy. As we know, it was the Australian Labour Party that first legislated for an expanded instant asset write-off from the $6,500 threshold in 2012. 
The coalition subsequently abolished the instant, uh, instant asset write-off, returning it to a $1,000 threshold before reintroducing an expanded instant asset write-off with a $20,000 threshold in 2015. The government has since renewed it in 2017, 2018 and again now in 2019. Of course, Labour supported the original measure and has supported its two previous renewals and will support this one today. While there is no difference between Labour and the government on taxes for small business, the principal difference at the moment is in relation to the Australian Investment Guarantee announced last year. It will allow businesses to deduct up front 20 per cent of all new investments with the remaining amount depreciated in line with normal depreciation schedules. Assets such as machinery, plant and equipment, for example, things like trucks or utes, and intangible investments such as patents and copyrights will be eligible for the immediate deduction. This investment guarantee promotes investment in local economies. The investment guarantee is well targeted fully funded, cost-effective, fiscally responsible and funded by Labour's reforms to the tax system. I want to make it clear to everyone, under a shortened Labour government, 99 per cent of business businesses will receive a tax cut and no business will have its tax rate increased and all businesses will be able to plan and invest with confidence and certainty. But let me turn to the amendment. Yesterday in this place, the other place, uh, sorry, yesterday in the other place, we debated this bill on the understanding it would increase in the instant asset write-off to $25,000. And yet today the government announced budget measures that increased the instant, uh, instant asset write-off again to $30,000 for businesses of up to $50 million in turnover. This is just more policy chaos for this rabble of a government. The real challenge for small business in this country is this government and its hopeless policy development and, of course, relentless instability. How can you concentrate on doing the right thing by small business when the minister is in personal crisis, when the government is in collective crisis? It just doesn't work. Labour has been leading the way on small business policy with our small business access to justice policy passing into law in the last parliamentary sitting period. Because small businesses are less likely to seek help from our court system to stand up to big business. Small business access to justice will make sure they get support to defend themselves against anti-competitive conduct. It's a policy the small business sector have wanted for a long time, but which the coalition repeatedly voted against. And you know why? All their mates are up there at the big end of town. Only with Labour and the help of some renegade nationals did this important reform pass through the House. Labour will provide the stability small business needs. Labour will support small businesses with the Australian Investment Guarantee. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Wacker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my apologies, Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I just want to make a few comments on this very good piece of legislation. Amazing Senator Cameron saying that support, supports anti-competitive behaviour. We brought in the effects test, the amendment to section 46. Where was Labor? They are over there opposing the effects test. They wanted to protect big business so they could just crush little business. Quite ironic, isn't it? We are the government for, for lower taxes, especially for small business. And this is another good, good uh, policy brought in last night, the addition to the instant write-offs. When I came in, Mr Acting Deputy President, I spoke to business in Inverell, like chainsaw outlets, retails, mower centres and how it stimulated their business where people would come and say, look, I can buy a chainsaw or a four-wheel four motorbike, a, 
ATV, even a side by side and ride off straight away. Of course, it's not happening as much now because of the drought. Unfortunately, that's cost a lot of money in regional Australia, but hopefully that'll change soon. But it's a case where it stimulates people to spend money, keeps small businesses going, and we're glad to see that the the criteria has been changed to up to thirty thousand dollars, and not for businesses any longer for just ten million dollars turnover, Mr. Acting Deputy President, up to fifty million dollars turnover. So an increase in the instant write-off of purchasing capital equipment from computers to heaters to air conditioners to machinery, you name it. And that stimulates activity, keeps people, the money going around the community and keeps people in a job. It's a good policy and I commend Treasurer Josh Frydenberg for bringing it on last night. It's also good to see, and I'll make this comment while I'm here, Mr Acting Deputy President, finally the budget into the black print at the bottom. I remember back in 2012 we had a Treasurer called Mr Wayne Swan. People would remember him. Four budget surpluses he promised. Four. How many did he deliver? Zero. None. When it comes to black print budget surplus, it is something that is rarely seen in my life, whether it be state government or federal government. When Labor's there, the budget only goes in the red print. I think it was 1989 the last time we saw a budget surplus from the Labor government. What's that, 30 years ago? Yes, and they criticise our budget, our good, spe good spending curtailing and getting the budget back to the blacks so we can stop mortgaging our children's futures away and making them pay our standard of living with interest. It is so wrong. And I can commend uh, the Treasurer for a good budget last night and finally the end to the borrowing. I hope it lasts. Uh, I really do. And this uh, bill is another incentive for business to spend, for small business to create economic activity to keep the money turning around and to keep people in the job. Call the minister. You, Deputy President, again I thank uh, those senators who have contributed to the debate. This government backs business growth and investment. We have fast-tracked uh, tax relief for millions of small and medium-sized businesses as part of our plan for a stronger economy and more jobs. This bill is yet another illustration of the government's com commitment to deliver support for hard-working Australian small and medium-sized businesses, reducing their tax burden and helping them to invest and grow. The amended bill increases the instant asset right off to $30,000 and expands it to businesses with turnover of less than $50 million. Around 3.4 million businesses employing around 7.7 .7 million workers will be eligible. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Uh, the question is uh, that the bill be read a second time. That of those opinions say aye. Uh, those opposed say no. Uh, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, uh, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill will call the minister. Thank you, Chair. I table supplementary explanatory uh, memorandum relating to the government amendments we'll to be moved to this bill. The minister. You seeking leave to move the amendments all together? Movements, uh, amendments one through eighteen is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move the government amendments. Senator Cameron. Yeah, uh, Labor supports the amendments. The question is uh, that amendments 1 through 18 on sheet QQ104 taken together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question that the, 
is that the, the question is that the bill is amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So the committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment increasing the instant asset write-off for small business entities bill 2019 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding, forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment North Queensland Flood Recovery Bill 2019 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that the bill uh, proceed without formalities and now be read for a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to make provision in relation to certain aspects of flood and storm related assistance and for related purposes. The Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cameron, you're seeking the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, this bill clarifies that specific disaster recovery grants relating to flooding between 25 January 2019 and 28 February 2019, primarily in Townsville, uh, are to be exempted from income tax. It clarifies that specific storm assistance payments relating to storm activity on or around 25 October 2018, primarily in the Fassifern Valley in Queensland, are to be exempted from income tax. It implements an announcement made by the Prime Minister on 1 March 2019 of a loan scheme to provide financial assistance to primary producers affected by northern Queensland floods. According to research uh, from the Parliamentary Library, currently under the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements 2018, grants to businesses are taxable, but grants to non-profit organisations are not. The North Queensland floods devastated primary industries surrounding Townsville. It's estimated half a million head of livestock were killed during the flood event. Small businesses and households in urban areas have also suffered lingering effects. The bill will clarify that Category C or D disaster recovery grants made under the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements 2018 to small businesses, primary producers or non-profit organisations within the time period specified are non-assessable, non-exempt income for taxation purposes. The amendments apply to the 2018 financial year and later financial year for qualifying grants. The bill will also make grants to primary producers non-assessable, non-assessable, uh, non non-exempt income if the grants are for repairing or replacing farm infrastructure, restocking or replanting, and if they are made as part of an agreement between the Commonwealth and state or territory governments. This covers agreements entered into between 1 February 2019 and 1 July 2019 that are outside the Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements 2018. In Schedule 2 of the Bill uh, deals with uh, the damaging storms of October 25, 2018, storms that hit the towns of Oakley and Boona <coughs> in south-east Queensland 
and in the Fasifern Valley and Darling Down regions. Primary producers in the Fasifern Valley estimated hail caused $10 million worth of damage to crops on more than 20 farms. The bill makes payments made through the Foundation for Rural and Regional Renewal, a private, not-for-profit organisation based in Bendigo, Victoria, exempt from income tax. The payments have been made by the Foundation under grants totalling $1 million from the Commonwealth to support primary producers in the Fasifern Valley. The amendments apply to the 2018-19 financial year and later financial years for qualifying grants. On Schedule 3, uh, the Prime Minister on 1 March 2019 announced, and I quote, the government has offered ADIs low-cost loans which they would be required to pass on to eligible farmers in lower interest rates. This will help those farmers to stabilise their financial position and is estimated to be worth up to $2 billion. The bill implements a loan scheme that will see the Commonwealth give a total $1.75 billion in loans to participating authorised deposit-taking institutions. The bill makes a special appropriation for that money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. For the purposes of making loans to financial institutions under the programme, known as Urgent Assistance for Eligible Primary Producers Affected by Floods in Northern Queensland. According to the bill's explanatory memorandum, the money will be given to the ADIs as a low-interest loan, which will enable the ADIs in turn to offer low interest on new and existing loans to eligible primary producers. It's estimated the impact of the underlying cash balance between 2019-20 and 2022-23 is uh, $0.7 million. Uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, Labour supports this bill. We want to ensure that as much assistance is provided uh, to these communities in North Queensland who have suffered terribly because of the ravages uh, of the floods. Um, this is an extremely important uh, bill. It's a bill that will provide assistance, and that's why Labour supports this bill. We are seeing too many storms, too many floods, too many droughts in this country, and the sooner the Coalition actually got on with dealing with climate change, the better it will be uh, for this country. Thank you, Senator Cameron. Senator MacDonald. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Obviously, I support this bill. Uh, as uh, most senators will know, I'm based in Townsville. I live in Eyre and uh, uh, treat uh, northern Queensland as, uh, as, as my electorate. Uh, I'm very, very familiar with the uh, cattle industry, the pastoral industry in western Queensland, uh, stretching from Charters Towers uh, out to the uh, Mount Isa and beyond Camerwell to the border. And uh, it's, it's a remarkable industry. Uh, it's uh, a, a wealth creator for Australia. It has its uh, difficult times, but the horrific pictures we all saw of, uh, of uh, cattle uh, uh, dying as a result of the flood uh, caught in trees, and I think, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, you were out there actually not long after the uh, floods themselves, and uh, you would be well aware of the distress, the hurt, uh, the loss of income. Uh, can I uh, thank the government for introducing these uh, bills, and as Senator Cameron has uh, explained them, and as they're explained in the uh, second reading speech of the minister, uh, the detail of what these are about. But I just wanted to use uh, my contribution to, on behalf of the people of uh, North West Queensland and the floods, uh, on behalf of the uh, people of Townsville, those that were inundated and are still, uh, some are still suffering, in spite of the enormous government expenditure, uh, grants from the government which have been generously given by the government and supported by every parliamentarian, I just want to express my thanks. Uh, whilst it's um, uh, very much alive in the minds of uh, Queenslanders, I also want to thank those who live in the capital cities uh, in the South for their forbearance. Uh, very often, uh, uh, some might say, you know, well, why is all this money going to these uh, industries far away? But I know that people in these cities, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, every, every capital city, 
um, support the work the government is doing to try and ameliorate as best uh, the government can, as best the taxpayer can, uh, some of the impacts uh, of the um, uh, flood. Uh, I can only feel for the um, uh, pastoralists, the uh, primary producers in the northwest. Uh, they do face droughts regularly. Uh, there have been floods of this magnitude before uh, and uh, in relatively recent times. Uh, not quite as bad floods, not quite in the same area, but they are part of uh, life out there. Then, of course, these, uh, these pastoralists had the live cattle export ban, which uh, perhaps did more economically to destroy them uh, than these floods have done. And so they've had a pretty rough time. They're just coming out of uh, that live export ban, just um, uh, dealing with the drought, and then these floods come. So uh, can I, on their behalf, uh, thank uh, the government, thank uh, uh, those uh, who live in other parts of Australia for their support at this very difficult time. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. As we approach 5 p.m., we are going to move to first speeches for two of our new senators. And we'll be it. We're a couple of seconds early. I will call Senator Askew. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. It is with great pride that I rise to deliver my first speech in this place. I have spent many hours over recent years in this beautiful building, and I have immense respect for all it represents. As a result, I am humbled to be standing in this chamber as a senator for Tasmania. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the welcome I have received from you, Mr President, together with the clerk, the Black Rod and the other officers of the Senate. You have been ready with welcome advice and assistance in recent weeks, which is much appreciated. I also acknowledge the warmth I have received from honourable senators around the chamber. It was a great honour yesterday to be sworn in as the 605th senator in the Australian Parliament and the 85th senator for Tasmania since Federation. I am acutely aware of the level of expectation and responsibilities that accompany the oath of office, and I intend to use my best endeavours to live up to the commitment that I have given to the people of Australia. As you know, Mr President, I am standing here today following the resignation of David Bushby. David represented Tasmania with dedication and commitment over the past 11 and a half years. He was a proactive and influential member of the Tasmanian Liberal Senate team and as de both Deputy Whip and then Chief Government Whip in the Senate, I believe he earned the respect of those around him. Many who come to serve their country in Parliament can often identify the one person who instilled the initial thought that one day we could ourselves be elected to serve. Interestingly, that person for me was David, during a conversation as far back as 2006. He is not only my predecessor but also my brother and we were both greatly influenced by a challenge from our father shortly before he died to get actively involved with politics. Growing up in Tasmania, I am the third and middle child of Max and Elaine Bushby. My father, Max Bushby, OBE, was a member of the House of Assembly in Tasmania from 1961 to 1986 and Speaker of that House for four of those years. My dad was a proud Tasmanian who during his life worked in real estate and property development. He was a United Nations war correspondent during the Korean War, a lay preacher, and also very involved in numerous church and community organisations. Sadly, we lost him to prostate cancer in August 1994 at the age of 67, a great man lost to us far too soon. With Dad regularly absent from home due to parliamentary commitments, my mother Elaine was the backbone of our family in our formative years. She too was also involved in many church and community organisations, and we all grew up with a clear understanding of the importance of making a difference in the world through active participation and a strong expectation. Mum, who cannot be here today due to her deteriorating health, was also politically active particularly through her long involvement in the National Council of Women in the area of policies affecting women. She was awarded life membership of that council for her efforts spanning more than 40 years, and I have often thought that she should have followed my father into politics. They certainly were a strong team, both in their marriage and in public life. 
If she had decided to run for office, that would certainly not have been unprecedented in Tasmania. The first woman to enter our Australian parliament did just that. Dame Enid Lyons, the widow of Prime Minister Joe Lyons, was elected to the House of Representatives in 1943, representing the original United Australia Party in the then Tasmanian seat of Darwin, since renamed Braddon, in northwest Tasmania. She remained an MP until ill health led to her resignation in 1951. Her time in parliament was short but distinguished, and she went on to be active in public organisations for another 30 years. Dame Enid Lyons was the first Conservative woman from Tasmania to enter the federal parliamentary scene and, as senators will know, the first woman to be appointed to Cabinet. Regrettably, since Dame Enid, there have only been two other Conservative Tasmanian women elected to the federal parliament until now. Interestingly, all four women to represent Tasmania and Canberra have had family links. Two succeeded their husbands in parliament, and the other two of us were the daughters of politicians. Shirley Walters was the first woman elected as a senator for Tasmania from any party. She served from 1975 until 1993. Shirley's father was Sir Eric Harrison, who was deputy leader, first of the United Australia Party and then the Liberal Party, under Prime Minister Robert Menzies. A leader at the time, Senator Walters was an early champion for the right of women to choose to be in the workforce or not. Teamed with former Labor Senator Pat Giles, they made a formidable duo in developing policy in the social services and community affairs areas, which were adopted by both major political parties. Their joint contribution has not been recognised enough. Senator Walters was joined in the Senate by Jocelyn Newman in 1986. Jocelyn's husband, Kevin Newman, was the member for Bass from the famous Bass by-election in 1975 until 1984, and he was a minister for most of that time. Senator Jocelyn Newman was the Minister for Social Services from 1996 to 1998, and then Minister for Family and Community Services from 1998 to 2001. She also held the Status of Women portfolio during the period 1998 to 2001. Jocelyn resigned in 2002, leaving a lasting legacy in reshaping the delivery of social security entitlements and being recognised as a minister responsible for establishing Centrelink. It has often disappointed me that the Liberal Party has not better celebrated its achievement in areas of social policy. It was the Menzies government that introduced child endowment, the first governmental recognition of the additional costs borne by families. It was also a Liberal government that recognised the importance of adequate housing in the post-war era, and the first Australian woman to administer a department with, was Senator Dame Annabel Rankin, who was appointed Minister for Housing by Harold Holt on Australia Day 1966. She held that ministry for the next five years before achieving another first, the first Australian woman to be appointed head of a diplomatic mission as High Commissioner to New Zealand. It's important that we remember the achievements of these trailblazing women, Enid Lyons, Shirley Walters, Jocelyn Newman and Annabel Rankin, all of them able politicians and, Mr President, all of them Liberals. I feel honoured and inspired to be standing in the shadow of such highly regarded and respected women. They are, however, just some who have paved the way for women in politics today. We often hear about the need to increase the represent representation of women in politics. I agree. The simple truth is we live in a representative democracy and it is self-evident that women comprise around 50 per cent of our populace. However, this is only one part of the equation. I also believe that we need diversity in all areas, be that age, gender, religious belief or work background. We rightly trumpet that Australia is a multicultural country and we can reasonably hold up our example to the rest of the world of welcoming people from across the globe to be part of our community. But do our state and federal parliaments reflect this fact? They are beginning to, slowly, but it is a long journey and we still have a long way to go. In this regard, it is worth noting that with the re-election of Liberal member Joan Ryler to the Tasmanian House of Assembly, 14 members in that 25-member chamber are now women, I believe the highest percentage in any parliament since Federation. 
But the media seems a little fixated on parliaments. What is often not properly acknowledged and celebrated is the large number of capable elected women representatives in local governments across Australia. In my own state, there are 29 local councils, 12 of which are led by women mayors, such as the Georgetown Mayor Bridget Archer, and there are many more women councillors. Most large businesses see the merit of increasing female representations on their boards, which is only logical since I think they will find many of their shareholders are women, especially women who hold shares through managed superannuation funds. But in this public debate, the women who head up other organisations are often overlooked, including those who lead local or community organisations, not-for-profit bodies and professional associations, and dare a liberal say it, even trade unions and employee bodies. They are all part of the superstructure that contributes to our Australian society. Mr President, my journey to this place has been interesting and may vary from that of many honourable senators. I left school following matriculation and my latest study was undertaken after having my family. I sincerely believe that I have valuable experience which I bring to the deliberations of the Senate and its committees. I worked in the banking and financial sector, I have worked in the not-for-profit sector and I have been privileged to serve on charitable boards. I have also worked in public service alongside a number of politicians and ministers at both the state and federal government level. Through my banking career, I have been fortunate to be offered many opportunities to grow and learn. I was encouraged to advance into leadership and management positions, and I am grateful to the managers and colleagues who believed in me. The business, retail and commercial knowledge I gained in that banking experience has underpinned my career. It is true that the Banking Royal Commission, so ably chaired by former Justice Kenneth Hayne, has shed light not only on poor practice in banking but also in other financial institutions. As the old saying goes, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Yeah. However, the exposure of poor practice by some people in some banks and finance companies <coughs> does, I submit, not truly reflect the vital work done banks do in securing and strengthening our economy. As someone who has spent the vast bulk of my working life in retail banking, I am the first to say that poor practices should be exposed and those undertaking them should be held to account. But it is important not to overlook the diligent work being undertaken by tens of thousands of loyal and committed staff who get great job satisfaction in assisting Australians with their everyday banking needs. The only thing that separates a bank officer from a bank customer is a counter. We all share the same pressures of home budgets, making ends meet, working out how to buy a house, planning for retirement and dealing with unexpected expenses which can arise. My experience with former banking colleagues and with senior managers is that almost everyone I met approached their job and their responsibilities with integrity and care for the circumstances of the individual customer. With this background, I welcome the Treasurer's announcement delivered yesterday in the budget of $35 million to support a corporate criminal jurisdiction in the federal court to address referrals for prosecution stemming from the Royal Commission. Another part of my career was working in the not-for-profit sector. For a short time, I had the privilege of working with the St Giles Society in Tasmania, a disability provider originally formed to care for children affected by the polio outbreak in the 1930s. Eighty years later, St Giles now assists thousands of children and adults with disabilities each year across Tasmania. Growing up, our family lived quite close to the original St Giles complex. I remember as a young child attending the annual fete at St Giles with my parents and participating in the primary school choir when we visited to sing for the children. I always came away moved by that experience and inspired by the children who were so positive and excited despite the physical difficulties they faced and living in what was then a residential-style institution. The future is certainly vastly different for people with disabilities. The introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme has changed the lives of so many people, giving them greater control over the services they use and ownership and certainty over their future. This initiative, which was developed with bipartisan support, is a classic example of what can be done when we, as politicians, work together to achieve the best outcomes for the people of Australia. 
As I alluded to earlier, I have worked with several members of parliament at a state and federal level. I would like to place on record my personal thanks to each of them for the opportunities they afforded me and their encouragement as I have pursued my aspirations over recent years. I would particularly mention Guy Barnett, Michael Ferguson, Will Hodgman, Andrew Nikolic, Sarah Courtney and Dan Tehan. One thing they all have in common is a commitment to hard work and public service, which I may say has been consistent experience in almost all of my interactions with members of parliament over the years, regardless of political allegiance. Mr President, as a fifth generation Tasmanian, I'm enormously proud of my home state. It has been a great pleasure to see Tasmania flourish under the leadership of Premier Will Hodgman and his government since 2014. With the influence of strong fiscal leadership, the state has turned around and is leading in many indicators, including business confidence and investment, tourism growth and, most importantly, reversal of population decline. With world-leading ecotourism ventures, internationally acclaimed mountain bike trails and golf courses rated in the top ten in the world, who wouldn't want to visit there? or even better still, move there. Tasmania's hidden secrets have been discovered and our beautiful state is now attracting record numbers of tourists, with international tourist numbers up 15 per cent last year alone. Our population is growing and many people from mainland states are making the Tassie change, selling up and moving to Tasmania to enjoy our relaxed, healthy and very enticing lifestyle. Of course, renewable energy is nothing new to any Tasmanian. We grew up to think it was the norm, and it was worth remembering that for all the spectacular achievements of the Snowy Mountain Scheme, the Tasmanian network of dams and power generation built by the Hydroelectric Commission and its successor is larger still. The federal government's recent announcement of the Battery of the Nation will significantly enhance this asset and Tasmania's status as a home of renewable energy. Mr President, I welcomed the Prime Minister's recent announcement that migrants will be encouraged to settle in regional Australia and that will be an incentive for them on the path to achieve permanent residency. It is a truism that our major cities on Australia's eastern seaboard are becoming overcrowded with the associated infrastructure pressures that go with fast, increasing population, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. It is also true that the Tasmanian government and employers in my state welcome new arrivals with open arms. I think my colleagues from South Australia, Western Australia and Northern Territory would echo those views. It is essential that our population policy recognises where the needs are and that the migration framework caters for that. In welcoming permanent migrants, I think it is important for us to remind ourselves just why people choose to come to live in Australia. When asked, one of the common points they make is the stability of our government and our institutions. We might understand that Australians have a healthy cynicism about politicians, part of the tall poppy syndrome, which may be seen to be part of our national makeup. But it is important to reflect that many of the wave of post-war migrants came to Australia because of the disruption in Europe of the two world wars, and many who have come in recent years from Asia express the same view about yearning for a country with stability, not only in government but in our courts and institutions, and stability of gainful employment with an education system they can rely on for their children. I believe it is a mistake to jettison the bedrock values that have been the foundation of Australia since European settlement and the misplaced view that this is what new migrants want. One typical example comes to mind. Our system of government and laws is based one topical example, sorry. Our system of government and laws is based on Judeo-Christian principles, and we begin our day's proceedings with a Christian prayer. Senators do not have to say the prayer or even be present in the chamber when it is said. There is no compulsion, but it has been a part of our parliamentary proceedings since the first meeting in 1901. There has been a proposal in Victoria to abolish the Lord's Prayer in that parliament. It was made by a minor party in that state's upper house but I want to place on record that it seems to me to be a particularly poorly timed proposal in the wake of the awful events in Christchurch. A response to intolerance should never logically be more intolerance. We respect those who have come to Australia of all faiths, or indeed those of no faith, just as we respect Australians born here according to their creed or belief. I have never heard one leader of a non-Christian faith call for the abolition of the Lord's Prayer in our parliament. These suggestions always come from other quarters and, as I say, when unpacked, aren't at their core really about inclusion at all. 
quite the opposite. On the theme of stamping out intolerance, one of the campaigns I look forward to supporting in the Senate is the initiatives against cyberbullying. Every generation has its bullies, but the electronic age has given bullying a devastating and sinister new dimension. All of us have been shocked by examples of young Australians who have taken their own lives or have been profoundly affected by bullying on social media with their parents and other friends often totally oblivious. We need, as a parliament, to support all endeavours to stamp out this type of behaviour and, at the same time, establish safe haven structures for those who are being bullied. Mr President, it is a great privilege to be standing here today representing the people of Tasmania on behalf of the Liberal Party. I thank the members of the party for the confidence they have given, shown in me, my Liberal Senate team colleagues, Senator Abetz, Colbeck and Dunningham, and the leadership of the Tasmanian Division especially the State President Jeff Page and State Director Sam McQuiston. I have known and worked with them for many years in a variety of capacities and thank them for their consistent advice and support. I am very fortunate to have a wide circle of friends and colleagues, many of whom work in this building and some who are here today. There, are really, uh, there really are too many to mention by, by name, however, please accept my thanks for your guidance, support and friendship over many years. Having said that, I would like to acknowledge just two, Phil Canole and Don Morris. They are not just long-term friends but also mentors, and I thank them for their valued advice over many years. To my staff, who despite our short time together are already a strong, cohesive team, thank you for your commitment, dedication and hard work, and thanks in anticipation for what I am going to ask you to do. None of us here could operate with the support, without the support of our staff. I would also like to recognise those of my family who have joined me here today. My brothers, Peter and Michael, my sister Helen, sisters-in-law Debbie, Janine and Jan with her partner John. I am proud to see my son Thomas and his partner Hannah. And I'd like, of course, to thank my husband John. The encouragement and support you have all given to me is appreciated more than you will ever know. As a family, we are so fortunate to have such a close and supportive relationship despite our geographical spread. Although my mother could not join us today, I'm sure that she is watching me from the Sandhill Nursing Home in Launceston, accompanied by my daughter Amanda. I'm confident, like all mothers, she will be my greatest critic, but I know she will also be my most vocal supporter. Mum, you have always been an inspiration to me, demonstrating your Christian faith through the life you have lived and sharing us with your unconditional love. We could not have asked for more. Mr President, only a few months ago I could not have contemplated being sworn in yesterday as a senator for Tasmania. None of us knows what the future holds. Whether my time in this place is long or short, I commit to serving the people of Tasmania to the best of my ability and to represent their views and aspirations in this place. I thank the Senate. Thank you.
Check. If senators could take their seats, we have another first speech to hear. I remind senators this is the first speech of Senator Spender and ask them to um, maintain the normal courtesies. Senator Spender. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senators, for indulging me with this opportunity at the busy time that it is to deliver my maiden speech. Like many of you, I will be facing the electorate in a matter of weeks, so if I don't win, this speech will double as my maiden speech and my valedictory speech, uh, which might be a first, so I might even get into Odgers, which is great. In perhaps another first for a first speech, I will be promoting policies that I know are unpopular. But that's because the Liberal Democrats craft policies intentionally not to maximise popularity, but out of empathy for all people affected, including those who are often dismissed or ignored in Australian politics. By way of introduction, I admit to being a policy wonk. Uh, in 2001, when I was in the Federal Treasury Department, uh, a colleague and I, John Humphreys, uh, created this Libertarian Party that we sneakily called the Liberal Democrats. It wasn't us really being sneaky. We just read a lot of books about liberal democracy and we thought it was a good idea, honest. So I've devoted all my adult life to studying and working in government, learning its many failings and trying to restrict it. For the past five years, I've been Senator David Lionhelm's right-hand man. So I'll take credit for all the things he said and did that you liked, and everything else I'll leave the blame with David. I'm a libertarian, which I think means that we think about others when we think about policy. I'm a man, so I'll never need an abortion, but I think they should be legal. I'll never need breastfeeding aids but I think they should be GST-free, just like water, milk and medical devices. And I'll never choose to carry pepper spray, but if others want to take up that option, they should be free to do so, to defend themselves against vile thugs. I'm not really a drinker, but I think you should be able to drink at all hours. And I've never been addicted to nicotine, but I think you should be able to vape instead of smoke cigarettes. Uh, I'm not a regular shooter, but I think shooting is a fantastic pastime and sport that is regularly subject to unthought through policy change. I'm more at home in front of a book than in the great outdoors, but I think that four-wheel drivers and other outdoor enthusiasts should be able to access public lands and waterways. And unlike David Lionhelm, you will never find me on a motorbike. But if you and your mates like jumping on a motorbike, I will not declare you to be an outlaw bikey gang. This is typical of all, all libertarians. It's a live and let live philosophy. I'm not pretending that politicians from the Liberal Democrats are the only politicians who can show empathy. It's just that our political party is so naive that we let our politicians show their empathy even when it is politically suicidal to do so. Mr President, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal people whose ancestors owned this land. To me, land rights continues to represent a fantastic opportunity for self-determination, prosperity and security. I think our governments can do even better on land rights than what we've done in the past. We can avoid imposing conditions on land rights and we can remove the conditions that we've imposed in the past. If the indigenous owners of Uluru want to stop people climbing Uluru, they should be free to do so. I believe that land rights should always be provided as freehold so that Indigenous owners have the security to make long-term investments. And I believe that land rights should be alienable so that Indigenous owners can borrow against the land 
and if they choose, they can even sell land. And I believe that governments should assist with converting large land holding bodies into smaller separate land holding bodies if Indigenous members wish for that. Mr President, I support a First Nations voice enshrined in our constitution. The First Nations voice proposal is a modest proposal. It is a body that could be routinely ignored and tasked with nothing, so it would be hardly a new ATSIC and it would be hardly a third chamber of parliament. Think about the Indigenous voices we most often hear. They are often associated with the delivery of existing government policies and have a vested interest in the continuation of those particular policies. If we had Indigenous leaders directly elected by Indigenous Australians, they could end up being the same people, in which case we would have gained nothing and lost nothing. But they could end up being different, in which case they could help us move on from the current failing status quo of policy. Let me also just raise an alternative to having a standalone Indigenous body. We could provide those who identify as Indigenous Australians with the option at federal elections of voting in an Indigenous electorate rather than their local electorate as New Zealand provides. This would conform with the important principle of one vote, one value. And it would also mean that Indigenous leaders elected by Indigenous Australians would be in the parliament, in the main game. Again, there is the risk that we would have uninspiring parliamentarians just asking for more taxpayer funds for existing Indigenous programs. But there is a chance that we end up with leaders who are more inspirational and visionary than that. Mr President, the Liberal Democrats base their policies on empathy, but a political philosophy based on empathy is not a recipe for popularity. Because most policies have two sides, and if your policies recognise that, they end up being based on tolerance and compromise rather than trying to attract the extreme. Think of the issue of environmental protection. Like many others, I believe that land clearing should stop, that habitats should be protected and that land should be reforested. But people who share these views invariably do not own the land that we are concerned about. It is lazy and inconsiderate to just wipe out the rights of landowners. Instead, concerned Australians should put their money where their mouth is and pay for the preservation and reforestation of land themselves. If we did this, Australia could be covered with conservation covenants, which are agreements where landholders are paid by concerned Australians to preserve and reforest their land. And if we did this, the amount of land that would be protected would depend on how much we truly care about the environment. Mr President, another way to assist in environmental protection would to be to slow population growth. Unfortunately, the population debate in Australia is mired in the immigration debate. But if we are serious about slowing population growth, we need to discuss homegrown population growth. It might not be popular to say so, but we need to think about how we assist those with children. Australians should be free to have as many children as they wish, but governments should not encourage people to have children, which they currently do by providing family payments of up to $10,000 per year per child. This is on top 
of parenting payments designed to keep low-income people out of poverty. I propose that family payments per child family payments should continue for those with children and those about to have children, but they should be phased out for those in the future who have children. This would make only a small contribution to slowing population growth because it would be rare for financial assistance to determine how many children people have. But the contribution would be important and warranted. This approach would have regard to Australians without children, including those Australians who desperately want to have children but can't. Those Australians who are paying money through their taxes to fortunate people like me who have the gift of children. Unfortunately, in Australian politics, Australians without children are forgotten. They are invisible. Political parties also tend to fail to empathise with taxpayers in general because they get benefits from big spending policy announcements where the costs are spread out across all taxpayers and the taxes are often hidden. But the Liberal Democrats will fight new spending proposals anyway. A highly concerning new area of government spending is millions of dollars of corporate welfare going to the private defence export industry. This is our very own grubby and creepy attempt to have our own military industrial complex. Right now, Australian taxpayers are subsidising companies to provide materiel, including remote weapon systems, to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Those repressive dictatorships that favour torture over freedom and human rights. It is absolutely galling that taxpayers are forced to support this putrid dealing with the devil. Closer to home, a less extreme form of taxpayer abuse is the provision of age pensions to families and households that own million dollar houses. This is the major parties buying votes by extending a payment intended for those who need it to those who don't. Another form of taxpayer abuse are the various policies to attempt to reduce Australia's greenhouse gas emissions, particularly the Coalition's Direct Action Plan, which involves paying emitters who promise, hand on heart, to emit at a level less than some arbitrary level. I'm not pretending that the Liberal Democrats will be able to determine energy and greenhouse policy in Australia. But if the Liberal Democrats are re-elected to this crossbench, and if the coalition is re-elected to the government benches, the Liberal Democrats will vote against all extensions of the direct action plan to waste taxpayers' funds. And if Labor forms government, we will vote under their scheme that any money that goes from emission-intensive generators like coal-fired generators does not end up in the pockets of less emission-intensive generators like wind farms, but ends up in the pockets of Australians through lower income taxes and lower fuel taxes. And any deal that we strike will involve the abolition of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, and will involve the legalisation and regulation of nuclear power, the safest form of power there is. The Liberal Democrats' concern for households facing high electricity prices and high income taxes and fuel taxes also extends to households facing stamp duties. 
Stamp duties are oppressive. They keep renters out of the housing market. In Sydney, you need to pay tens of thousands of dollars to the state government for nothing in return to buy a house. If we abolished stamp duties, we would help renters without hurting existing homeowners. And existing homeowners would be helped because they could move houses when they change jobs rather than live their life in commuting hell. The only way we could get rid of stamp duties is through Commonwealth leadership, because the states are addicted to stamp duty revenues. I used to own my own house, and it was fantastic to do so. I could put up pictures on my own walls, and I could dig up my backyard to my heart's content. More Australians should have this opportunity, but it will take leadership in this place to achieve it. As well as dealing with the first world problem of getting Australians into their own home, we should confront the reality that there are millions of refugees who would love to call Australia their home. And we need to confront the reality that there are millions of Australians who don't want one more refugee in this country. How do we deal with these two realities? How do we show empathy for refugees and empathy for those Australians who don't want a bar of them? We need to reinvigorate the policy where concerned Australians, rather than taxpayer-funded government agencies, fund, support and house refugees. Think of all the cars emblazoned with the bumper sticker say yes to refugees. Imagine if all those car owners said yes to housing in their own home and covering the expenses for as long as required a refugee, refugee family. We need to be the change we want to see in the world. Mr President, in my last few minutes, let me speak about liberal democracy. This system of Western civilization based on empathy. This system where our friends have freedom of speech, religion, association, assembly and movement. And more importantly, our enemies have freedom of speech, religion, assembly, association and movement where laws apply to all equally, regardless of colour and creed, where laws are made by elected officials, where laws apply from the moment they are enacted and not before, and where laws do not seize property without just compensation, where you cannot be searched, you cannot be arrested, and your property cannot be seized without probable cause where you cannot be imprisoned unless your criminal act and your guilty mind are proved beyond reasonable doubt in a single trial, not based on self-incrimination, but based on evidence that you can criticise and scrutinise. And a system where contracts are routinely respected because of mutual trust, but where disputes arise contracts are enforceable by courts. This is our liberal democracy, and it is often referred to as Western civilization, even though there are great liberal democracies in the East. <coughs> Some amongst us say they support Western civilization, but say that Western civilization is under threat from external forces and that we need to compromise Western civilization in order to save it. On each count, they are wrong. Liberal democracy and Western civilization is thriving. It is winning, and it has been winning for decades. Those who seem to doubt this don't seem to realize how intoxicating liberal democracy is. People come from far and wide to liberal democracies and immediately love 
the tenets of liberal democracy and defend it. They become the staunchest defenders of liberal democracy. Some decades ago, Pauline Hanson, who I wish a speedy recovery for, said that we are in danger of being swamped by Asians. Well, the Asians came and it was an absolute triumph. It was possibly the best decision Australia ever made. Australians of Asian descent are marching in our streets demanding action on climate change. And Australians of Asian descent are in our police forces supervising those protests. Australians of Asian descent are prosecuting criminals in our courts and they're defending them as well. Australians of Asian descent are working in our businesses, owning them as well. And in a couple of weeks' time, Australians of Asian descent will be manning our polling booths, sometimes in shirts of blue and sometimes in shirts of red. Liberal democracy won and keeps on winning. More recently, Senator Hanson said that we are in danger of being swamped by Muslims and, and suggested that we ban immigration from certain Muslim-majority countries. But the overwhelming majority of Muslim migrants are already converts to liberal democracy, not radical Islam. In fact, many of them are fleeing radical Islam. We have well-resourced security agencies to preempt and detect attacks from radical Islam. But the absolute strongest defence we have is the overwhelming support in our communities for the opposing philosophy, liberal democracy. Those who fear radical Islam sometimes suggest that we should do away with tenets of liberal democracy, like non-discriminatory immigration, uh, freedom of association, and freedom from arbitrary detention. But out of fear of radical Islam, they are providing a lifeline to radical Islam. Instead, we should support our liberal democracy because liberal democracy will always beat the unattractive weakling that is radical Islam. Mr. President, I hopefully have conveyed to you how the Liberal Democrats stand for liberal values and how no matter who the Liberal Democrat politician is, we all share the same principles. So we are a force for stability, where other parties are subject to the whims of focus groups and changing leaders. The Liberal Democrats will always fight for free speech, a lower tax burden, the end of the nanny state, the end of the police state, and the end of the war on drugs. We will fight for power so we can leave you alone. Unlike other maiden speeches, I won't be thanking a list of people who have helped me in my achievements simply because I'm a casual appointee and I haven't achieved anything to date. I will just again thank the senators for indulging me with this opportunity and I wish the best of luck to those senators who are facing re-election. Thank you.
ask senators to resume their place. We will now move to valedictory statements from Senators Scullion, Moore and Cameron. I will invite the three senators to make their statements before I call for contributions from around the chamber regarding all three. I'll commence with Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, uh, as I rise, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples on whose traditional lands uh, this parliament house stands. I also acknowledge their elders, both past and present, and I'd like to particularly recognise one such elder in the gallery today, uh, Matilda House, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Matilda was also in the gallery nearly 18 years ago to hear my maiden speech. So, uh, thank you, Matilda, and your extended family for making me so welcome on your country. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I rise in this place today to offer my thanks and acknowledgement to those individuals and communities that, I have, that have supported me in my time as the country Liberal Senator for the Northern Territory and to also offer some observation about my time in this place. Uh, Mr. President, uh, first and most importantly, could I offer my thanks to all those Territorians from all walks of life who supported and, in fact, voted for me in the last six elections. You can always rely on Territorians for good judgment. I thank the country Liberals for their unwavering support. I am proud to belong to a political movement that always puts Territorians first, and I acknowledge just how tough it is for so many Territorians at the moment, and I hear your cries for change. But I must say it has been a real honour to have been the first ever Conservative Cabinet Minister uh, to hail from the Northern Territory, and I genuinely hope it is not the last. I simply can't overstate how critical it is to, have the governance of our, to the governance of our nation to have representatives from North Australia sitting around the cabinet table. <laughs> Mr. President, can I thank and acknowledge your professional and impartial leadership of the Senate? It's an absolutely crucial role, and I acknowledge all the presidents since I've arrived in this place. They've done a remarkable job in often difficult circumstances in maintaining peace and good order particularly with those on the other side. I would also like to thank the Nationals for their support during my time in the Senate, and I have been supported by such great leaders—John Anderson, Mark Vale, Warren Trust, Barnaby Joyce and now the excellent Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormack. Now, I know for a fact that every other senator in this place secretly wishes they could be part of our National Senate team. <laughs> and Why wouldn't you want to be? Uh, part of such a close-knit family that so effectively levers the best outcomes for regional Australia. And I can tell you, Mr President, we have a lot more fun doing it. A party of great characters like my good mate Wacker Williams. What a wonderful contribution you've made. Australia, and particularly your constituents in New South Wales, are richer for your time in the Senate. Senator O'Sullivan, Bazza, mate, regional Queensland has lost a fearless champion and this place has lost a committed contributor. Thanks for being such a funny bastard. I suspect your <laughs> wicked good humour helped us all through some of our tougher times. Uh, Senator Steve Martin, our National's most recent addition, your endless capacity and enthusiasm uh, for your beloved Tasmanians will, I'm sure, see you return as a much-needed champion for regional Tasmania. You should also acknowledge your recently acquired ability to put more fit in the, fish in the boat than myself, a record I will correct on my next visit. To Senator Matty uh, Canavan, well, mate, you're just so hard to keep up with. You're a walking walk encyclopedia, a man who seemingly overnight can, observe, can absorb, evaluate and then respond to the most complex of documents. You have uh, constantly demonstrates innate ability to engage so quickly with everyone he meets. And on behalf of North Australia, thanks, mate, for all the positive change you have created. To my wonderful mate, uh, Senator Mackenzie, Cyclone Bridget. It's a rare to meet a hard-working, effective senator. Uh, Regional Victoria is just so lucky to have you. You'll continue to be my close personal friend. I can tell you, sitting next to you is about the only thing I'm going to miss about bloody question time. <laughs> can I also recognise the support of Bozzy, Sandy and Nashi before they left this place? Uh, Bozzy, in particular, is that rare breed of parliamentarian who nearly, never really retires once they leave this place. He is always on the phone. There was, never, there was no fight, big or small, that Bozzy was ever too afraid to take on, and he usually won too. You're a class act, mate. I only hope my retirement doesn't look anything like yours. 
But it is people like Bozzi and parties like the Nationals that make Australia such a great nation, the truly remarkable democracy that it is. The Nats are the party for the regions, for remote Australia, whether it's on the coast, the bush or in the desert, in our major regional centres. We never, ever take our regions for granted because there are threats. We have this perverse situation where we have small but vocal groups of activists, primarily in southern and eastern Australia, dictating to rural Australians what industries they're allowed to have, what industries they can't work and what industries they're not allowed to work in, what jobs they can and cannot have. Well, we in the Nationals fight for rural industries, shamelessly and proudly. We fight for industries like farming, like mining, like forestry, like fisheries. There is no shame in being a diesel mechanic working on a bauxite or an iron ore mine, or heaven forbid, in a thermal coal mine. Nor is there any shame in being a beef producer, dairy farmer or cotton grower, which grows the best food and fibre anywhere in the world. Yeah. We are on this side, and certainly I am not afraid to support the proposed Adani Carmichael mine or the development of the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. Yeah. Not only will these projects meet all of the state and territory environmental approvals, as they must do, but they also have the overwhelming support of traditional owners and the communities in those regions. Oh, that's right. The traditional owners support these projects, so do the communities. They want the jobs, they want the opportunities and they want the economic development that they will deliver. <laughs> Mr President, as you know, I'm a very keen hunter, sporting shooter myself, so I was very pleased that we all supported a motion reaffirming my, our commitment to the National Firearms Agreement. We all proudly support the legal rights of law-abiding firearm owners. The National Firearms Agree Agreement hailed the most significant gun reforms in our nation. I believe these laws have achieved the right balance between keeping the community safe and giving firearm owners, whether sports shooters or farmers, a well-regulated and licensed framework to own and use their firearms. Mr President, I should make special mention of that excellent class of 2001. It's amazing how few of us remain. Uh, as a member of that class, Senator Penny Wong, thank you for your leadership uh, and your guidance of those opposite for many years. And a few of them needed a bit of guidance too. <laughs> You've made an articulate and dignified and often courageous contribution to this chamber. Congratulations. There are still a few who predated my arrival. Uh, Senator Maurice Payne, Maurice, thank you for your friendship and leadership in a variety of portfolios, and I know from my garrison town of Darwin how much you are respected in the role of Minister of Defence and what an incredible job you are doing as Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well done, mate. Yeah. To Senator Mitch Fifield, Mitchy boy, again a great mate and supporter. You've done a remarkable job of leading government business in the Senate. To Matthias, the machine. I thank you for your leadership in the Senate. You're doing a fantastic job and I trust that you'll excel in that role for many years to come. To the remainder of our coalition team, to Linda Burmo, Cashy, David Rusty, Richard and Zed, what a remarkable bunch of Australians you are. What a cracker front bench. You are completely deserved of the prize we have in you. To the remainder of those opposite and to all my um, coalition uh, colleagues, um, Thank you for the contributions you've made to the Senate and to that other place. To the Prime Ministers I have served, Mr Howard, Mr Abbott, Mr Turnbull and now that excellent Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, thank you for your advice, your leadership and, most importantly, your seamless, endless patience. So to the Territory Senators I've served with, Trish Crossan, Nova Perris and Malandiri McCarthy, uh, the collegiate relationship I have enjoyed most of the time had ensured that in this place the Territory's interests have come first. To the Greens, while there's not a lot of policies and philosophies I necessarily support, you have clearly stood by your belief and rarely vacillated from them, so you have my every respect. Since I've worked so closely uh, with Senator Seawitt, could I make a special mention of Rachel and her passion for Indigenous affairs and support for Indigenous communities? Thanks, Rach, for your support and assistance in dealing with my portfolio matters. To One Nation, uh, without a doubt, and I'm sorry Pauline's not to hear, uh, to hear me, but you are the most controversial politician I've ever worked with. Whilst I mightn't agree with you on all of your policies, I thank you for supporting a number of reforms in my portfolio that have made lives better for Indigenous Australians. With controversy comes division, and I think the challenge, as all of us in this place and as leaders in this place, is to always strive 
to appeal to Australians' better nature rather than our worst. I do hope all of us can provide that leadership not only at the next election but in the years that follow. Yeah. To the crossbenchers, Senator Bernardi, Jesty, we've had some great times together uh, and I'm sure we'll catch up for some more. To uh, Senator Hinch, Darren, I don't know anyone else who'd spend time behind bars for their beliefs. Your continued principles crusade for the most vulnerable Australians since you've arrived in this place. All the best for your continued efforts. So, Nick sort of snuck out a bit, and I know obviously he's no longer here, but he remains a good friend of mine, and I thank him for all the laughs. To Central Alliance, to Pat Senator Patrick and Senator Griffiths, I've enjoyed a great working relationship. Thank you. I also acknowledge uh, 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 Tim Storer and uh, the, the very recent uh, and uh, perhaps a, a, a dash of sunshine for a very short moment, uh, Duncan Spender. Uh, although I didn't get a, spend a lot of time with either of you really in this place, I wish you both the best of luck. To Brian Burston, now with Clive Palmer's United Party, it's been great to work with you. Clive's a very uh, colourful character whom I know well. And Mr President, we should never pretend that as senators we can achieve anything in this space without the support of our incredibly hard-working staff. And I've been you can see them up there in the President's Gallery. Very special. So ably led by Bev Cabello. Bev's been with me for the best part of 17 years, and she reckons you get a shorter sentence for murder. <laughs> a big thanks for your fantastic work, and also to Goosey, Justine, Billow and Adam, who do just such a fantastic job in my electorate's office of Darwin and Alice Springs. To my ministerial su staff, supported by my dedicated and ever th enthusiastic Chief of Staff, Ben Peoples. Benno, you've done a tremendous job leading the team of Butter, Jacob, Catherine, Ali, Rick, Trilby, Breddy, Rachel, Hannah and Coops. Thanks so much to you all for your dedication, hard work and support, and for sharing the multitude of adventures with me over the last five and a half years. I'd like to, I'd like to also take this opportunity, Mr President, to acknowledge my previous staff, including my previous Chiefs of Staff, Russell Patterson. Fantastic job, mate. Good to see you. Kevin Dolan, thanks for your work, mate. Kerry Timms, uh, the first Indigenous Chief of Staff. What a great legacy, Kerry. And to Sakur Clayton, who looked after me for so many years that I promised I'd get you in Hansard one day. <laughs> so to all the parliamentary staff who seem to magically run this place, Mr President, our cleaning staff, our security staff, our wonderful Comcar crew, Hansard, all those other staff, you really are the engine room of the Australian Parliament. Could I also acknowledge the committed staff of my departments that I've worked with, who have worked with me over my time as Minister for both Community Services and the Indigenous Affairs Portfolio, and acknowledge those who are in the chamber tonight. I thank the many departmental liaison and officers who have worked in my office, the regional network staff who do a fantastic job of supporting all my frontline del service delivery, and I thank the leadership of the department, particularly Ray Griggs and Professor Ian Anderson, who is the most senior Indigenous public service who is in the gallery today. Uh, Mr President, in 2007 I was lucky to have been asked to serve as Minister for Community Services under the Howard Vale government. Whilst all elements of this portfolio were fascinating, I'd particularly like to thank the disability sector for helping me understand the detail of the challenges that they faced us and to share with me the better policy approaches that would assure that all Australians irrespective of their circumstances, were treated fairly and equally. And I'm confident that the NDIS is making a real difference and will continue to do so. My current portfolio of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs is one I held in opposition for some time, uh, and in my now informed view is without doubt the most challenging and important of all cabinet responsibilities. Now, those who will undoubtedly quietly disagree clearly have never held the portfolio. But despite the challenges we inherited, and I know that we have made significant progress. When I say we, I mean Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in genuine partnership with government. It would be disingenuous in the extreme for myself or our government or indeed our parliament to take credit for the success in these endeavours without recognising and acknowledging that without our, our now long and enduring partnership with our first Australians, we would never have achieved the changes in the landscape we see today. And I'd particularly like to thank Senator Pat Dodson for his friendship and assistance with my portfolio. I value them both. Could I acknowledge and thank the Prime Minister's Advisory Council, so ably chaired by Roy R. C. and Andrea Mason? 
I also thank the past co-chairs, Chris Sara, and the current members, Fraser Nye, Dr Nye Brown, Jumbawa Mulawiri and Susan Murphy. The Indigenous Advisory Council, Mr President, was never just advisory. Uh, that was made abundantly clear in, I think, the first two or three minutes of the first meeting. Uh, they have assisted in every element of policy development across such a wide range of issues. And on behalf of our shared constituency, thank you. With the able assistance, Mr President, of then Prime Minister Tony Abbott, uh, we made significant structural reform, the first of which was to bring the primacy of a standalone portfolio of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs for the first time into Cabinet. The past hodgepodge approach of each portfolio having separate programs and funding arrangements was replaced by a new regime which brought all the funds supporting our first Australians together under the IAS, the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. Whilst at the outset there were a few detractors, this reform brought demonstrably more rational oversight and a far more coordinated approach, with an unashamed focus on education, employment and community safety and wellbeing. It was this structural reform that allowed government to seek advice from our first Australians on who who were receiving services as to their community priorities rather than governments. A principal legacy of these reforms is a move from 30 per cent of the services being delivered by Indigenous businesses when we started to 60 per cent Indigenous, business, uh, Indigenous delivery today. So I'd particularly like to acknowledge the Empowered Community Program, which now provides community advice on which programs continue to be funded and assist with timely adjustments to program delivery. I thank the hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders throughout Australia for their robust efforts in moving our parliament to deliver the programs their communities need and support, a huge reform from the convention that government knows best. Could I also acknowledge Gallery Unipingu and thank him uh, for the great assistance he provided me in redesigning township leases that kept, in the case of Maningara, the new township lease completely in Aboriginal control. This process has become the new standard for township leasing. Bapaji, thank you. Just last week I was delighted to chair the first ministerial council meeting that included our first Australians. This is a significant move from the convention of only the state, territory and commonwealth ministers meeting to the long overdue inclusion of the coalition of peak Indigenous organisations. For the first time, Mr President, our First Nations people are at the centre of Australia's endeavours to close the gap of opportunity and equity. And I'd like to thank Pat Turner for co-chairing this historic meeting with me, probably the most significant policy introduced by this new partnership that has been the Indigenous procurement policy so successful is not only the quantum of the Commonwealth procurement of the First Nations businesses moving, as I've said in this place, ad nauseum from 6.2 million to now over 1.83 billion dollars but most importantly mr president the change in the lives and circumstances of around 40,000 indigenous families in that they gained the principal breadwinner through full-time employment as a co consequence of this initiative could i also acknowledge and thank the leadership of the premiers and the and the uh, chief ministers of all the state and territory and the mayors of local governments that have adopted this initiative of their own. I hold every confidence this will have a positive and enduring impact on the circumstances of First Nation businesses and their swiftly growing number of employees. So, Mr President, to all those who seek the Treasury benches, a word of advice. This new way of doing business in equal partnership with our First Australians is the way of the future, a hard-fought and deserved future and a partnership that must forever be. Finally, and most importantly of all, my family, to my children, now adults, to Sarah, Daniel, Luke and their partners, Jacob, Susie, Jamie Lee and little Kiki. Good to see you, Biddle, um, in including my, uh, my nephew, Luke. You've given me incredible support throughout my time here. Thank you for always being there for me. To my lovely Carol, I couldn't have done much of this without you, mate. I thank you for your support and your sacrifices over the years. I love you very much. Good 
Uh, Mr. President, I hope that uh, <clears throat> my modest achievements in this place validate the responsibilities and the trust the Territorians have placed in me. I thank them for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. Senators, I will now call Senator Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I just want to put on record that every time I've been called to speak in this place by any president or deputy president, I've always had a special shiver, and that shiver is with me tonight. Uh, as I did with my first speech, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and paying my respects to elders of all cultures. Mr President, the Labor senators who came here in 2001, Ruth Webber, Linda Kirk, Ursula Stevens, Gavin Marshall and Penny Wong, had the special privilege of having an introduction session with the inimitable John Faulkner and Robert Ray. During that session, they were advised, and I remember this so clearly, that probably the speeches that would be most remembered about most of us in this place was going to be the first one and those made about us after we're dead. And that was possibly not particularly comforting for those who were terrified about our looming first speeches, but it makes me a little bit more confident about this one tonight. Uh, Mr President, I was um, not particularly keen to make this speech this evening, um, but I decided after some thought that what I wanted to do was put on record my thank yous to so many people who have meant so much to me and who have made this experience great. Um, in terms of that initial grouping when we got together, that was the chance that we had to have the first opportunity to meet the amazing range of people who care so much about this place, about our system, about this marvellous building, and who actually wrap around us with services so to ensure that we can do our job as well as we can and be part of this continuing legacy of the Senate, of the Parliament and in our history. Uh, in that time, what they did was make me aware that probably Nothing that I was going to do was going to personally bring down this Senate. Uh, that was a comfort, and as the Senate's continued since um, 1901, so far so good. In terms of the many people, I want to start by thanking Richard, you and the Clark team. And you follow on from the most amazing people. When we were first here, I was given so much support and encouragement by people like Harry Evans, uh, wonderful, Anne Lynch, Rosemary Lang. Um, I recently was talking with Rosemary and I said, I lived in this place to ensure that she never frowned at something that I did or said. And um, she, as always, was inscrutable and gave me the belief that I'd not done so. I hope that was genuine. I also want to remember the remarkable Cleaver Elliott. I think that certainly in my time his passion, commitment, knowledge and humour gave me and so many other people such a great understanding of the importance of what we do, how we can do it better and also the way that he took this knowledge not just to our parliament, to parliaments across the Pacific and there are still people who talk about the training sessions that Cleaver did in other parliaments that make me proud of not just him but our whole system. The attendants who look after us so well in this place, I actually pressed twice to get more water tonight just so I could see them again. And John, thank you so much. John, Brian, Adrienne, Rosemary and Fiona and all those who've gone before you. Uh, thank you for your unstinting help, um, greetings and positive nature, whether it's 9am in the morning or 2.30am in the morning. They never fail to make us feel welcome and to we know that they're around here looking after us. So thank you so much to all of you. Uh, to Hansard, all of you, everyone in Hansard. 
I apologise for my appalling notes. I know they're quite well known in the Hansard area, and they won't be any better this evening either. Um, I also thank you for giving to me, exposing my overuse of the meaningless, meaningless adverb actually. You know, when I put things out, just scrub out every time I say actually. And that's worked so far so good. Uh, to broadcast, um, I apologise for my noisy jewellery. I know it's caused trouble in the past, and people know when I'm speaking it's a bit like having a cat with a bell on it. They know when I'm about to speak. Um, and I do apologise because I realise over the years that I tend to talk to you. Um, and when I'm actually talking in this place, I know you're supposed to speak to the president, Mr. President, uh, but I find when I'm speaking that I'm inevitably talking to broadcast. I apologise. Um, I hope you haven't found it too threatening. <laughs> Uh, to the, all the people in parliamentary services, you have here and in Brisbane. Thank you so much. Our team has been served so well by you. Your patience, your consideration, and all, also that effort that you really cared about the services you were providing to us. Um, uh, the people who have helped us in Brisbane, particularly, thank you so much. There have been some you know, moves and so on, but you have always, always been great. So I wanted to say thank you, and I will be seeing you before I leave. Uh, to 2020, patience, understanding and inevitable non-judgment when I deal with you. Um, it has been fantastic. To the com car drivers, wherever you are, um, I'm not sure whether people truly understand the value of your service until you no longer have that service. That's what I've heard from other people. Um, the courtesy, the absolute certainty that you're going to be looked after, the knowledge that, again, people care. And particularly for the, uh, the team in Brisbane, we can stop having that contest about whether you'll get there before I'm waiting for you. Um, it's been going on for years, and it, I know it's been looked at. but. I like to be early, uh, at least to start with, so that's important. Uh, to the security people, um, always helpful, always smiling, um, making everyone again feel welcome. To Colin and Onu in the international branch, I know those of us who have had the, um, the wonderful opportunities to travel, the fact that they're there for us and also work miracles when there's been some very tight times. Thank you so much. And uh, Colin, you'll have to find more people to come to those lunches now at the last moment. Um, but thank you for the opportunities. Um, to the people in the gym, there are some people here that know um, the wonderful services of the gym. I also know there are people who've never even seen where it is. And um, um, if you do get the opportunity, pop down and see them. It's usually not fatal. But the, um, also for um, to uh, Dom and Bridget and the whole team at Aussies. I think if there's one thing that brings absolute unity to this parliament, it is Aussies. And uh, they're, they're, again, uh, their absolute care for us, the, the place that, that offers us welcome all the time. Thank you so much. Um, we will miss you. Also for the dining room staff and all the people that serve so many of our functions. It, often strikes me in this place that you'll see people at breakfast um, early in the morning at the various breakfasts we had the chance to do, and you often see the same people at late night functions on the same day. So the extent of their service, the extent of their work and their, their professionalism, I think that we all benefit from it, and I really wanted to put it on record how much I cared for them, and the cleaners in this place. Absolutely. Um, we see them, we smile at them, um, but their work is exceptionally caring and professional, and they're part of this building, they're part of the team that lives here. So thank you so much. I've probably forgotten people, but just put on record that we all know that you care for this place and that you've extended that care to each of us. So thank you very much. I particularly want to thank all the people who have made submissions and provided evidence to Senate and parliamentary committees. For me, our committee system is the heart of our Senate. We have extraordinary opportunities to hear from people who, are, who care deeply about issues which affect them. I have been shocked, angered, inspired, challenged and brought to tears sometimes by the contributions to our committees. Each of those red and white books that we all have in our libraries, sometimes way too many, reflect important issues that people have felt they had the confidence and the trust to bring to us 
because they wanted their parliament, their Senate, to hear what was important and how they can make change to policy. And, Mr. President, they work because so many ma amazing policies, so many programs, so many royal commissions have come from the work of committees in our Senate. And I think it's important that we know that that system is there, that we value it, we value it as it should be, and we use it to its best extent. And I think that is what I always say is what makes our Senate special. Um, it also provides the opportunity for us to work together as a Senate, regardless of which party we come from, regardless of what we think we know about an issue. The chance we have to work together in a committee, to travel together, to get to know more about each other, which is sometimes a little difficult, but it provides real friendships. And I have to say that my work on a number of committees, I've established friendships with senators from across this place, which remain very true and very special for me. Uh, I also think that our committee process gives us the opportunity to make friendships and connections with people who've come to talk with us. And I know that through many of the committees with which I, in which I've worked, I now have people that I consider friends that have come to me with their purposes and with their causes and to stay in contact. So um, I can't name them all. It would be inappropriate. But um, I think that I do have to mention at least um, Leonie Sheedy and the Amazing Clan Group that we got to know through important committees around forgotten Australians, those forgotten Australians who will never be forgotten anymore. We made that promise to them. Um, also people in the mental health area. We had an extraordinary committee process around Australia's mental health many years ago, and those connections are still there, the advocates, the professionals, the people who care. Um, it's hard to pick out particular ones, but I do want to put on record this evening that the experience that many of us had working on issues around women's gynaecological cancer in this place changed lives. And when you have the opportunity to work with people who are looking at their own condition and looking at their own death in many ways, but are still prepared to come and share and to ask and to express needs that we could actually then give back in policy. The increased focus on ovarian cancer and other forms of gynaecological cancer, which are now active in Cancer Australia, came directly from that committee. And the unity that we had in the parliament in supporting that will always be a very special moment for me. Uh, in terms of, and also in terms of the Royal Commissions that came out there, in talking about the committees, we all know, this is something we all know, we could not operate, operate without the secretariats. Those men and women who give so much to keep these committees operating are really the backbone. And I have relied on so many over the years and worked with them, sometimes with extraordinary expectations and deadlines from ministers and main, no, I'll just say from ministers in terms of the deadlines that are put on committee work. We need to treasure those people and to remind them constantly of the good work they do. Um, and I think that's something that we all can share. I also want to thank the governments who have been strong enough to say sorry. When my friend Kevin Rudd said sorry to Indigenous Australians in this place, I felt that this building actually throbbed. I felt, I felt the earth move when that expression was made, and across not just this place but across the whole of our nation, that apology, that identification that we had people in our nation who had been wronged, Indigenous people had been wronged, and the government, our government on behalf of each of us, was prepared, our Prime Minister, to stand up and say sorry. That was extraordinarily special and continues to be important. That experience has been, said, has been had three more times, and I hope it will continue to happen. But for the people who were an institutional pair, Kevin again was the Prime Minister of the day, and it took a bit of encouragement because people were, he was concerned and other people about whether it would just be a matter would he be known for saying sorry. But I think the importance was known by the whole of the parliament that when you have a wrong, you need to apologise. And from the experiences that we heard again through the committee system, we have now to the people who are in institutional care an apology to them which continues to remain so important to them. And then again, a few years later, we had the forced adoptions inquiry, and we met women 
and their children and their families who were damaged by governments in Australia, some of them who thought they were doing the right thing, but nonetheless lives were damaged. And again, our parliament, our government decided that this was such a great wrong that we needed to say sorry. And again, I know and people who've met those people continue to understand how important that experience was. So I want to thank governments that are strong enough to say sorry. We've had very recently um, Prime Minister Morrison um, actually took the apology statement to people who had been identified through the Royal Commission process of suffering sexual abuse in institutions. Again, you could feel the way that the parliament was connecting with people, with our community, and I think that's what makes us strong. So thank you to those governments who thought they could, who knew that they could say they were sorry. Mr. President, I want to say thank you to my party, the Australian Labor Party, and particularly the members of the Queensland branch who have given me the opportunity to serve as a Queensland senator in this place. When you actually make that oath and sign those amazingly large and important historical documents that sit there when new senators come on, it is a contract. It is a position of trust, and I really want to acknowledge. I want to thank the people in the Queensland Party who gave me this chance and who felt that I was serving them well. Um, I know I love my state, and I've had the uh, great opportunity, basically through this job, of meeting many people from all parts of Queensland. In fact, that extends to all parts of the nation. I would like to acknowledge the school hall program, which meant many of us got a chance to go to a lot of places that we may not have known existed before. I went to a school that had five pupils who had not had a, a, um, a library, had not had a hall. I went to very large schools. It was a, a wonderful experience to be there and be part of that, that whole process. So thank you to the party. I also want to particularly thank the party for a special joy that I've had in this parliament, which is representing the party on two national institutions. The National Archives, Archives which has an advisory council by legislation including members of parliament. The National Archives provide the memory of our nation, collecting and preserving Australian government records that reflect our history and identity. So to David Fricker, who is the Director General, and Denver Beanmand, my mate from Queensland, who's the Chair of the Council, thank you so much for having the opportunity to stand to serve on that Council. It is important, and I really think, it's, again, it's the history of our nation. And another special joy, I must have been standing in the right place that day, um, because I got also to be appointed to the National Library, um, Library Council. This is an absolute treasure, our National Library. It's so close, and yet I know people in this place may not have got there. So please take the opportunity to visit the library and the archives. The library, by its legislation, is responsible under the Act for maintaining and developing a national library collection of material, including a comprehensive collection of material relating to Australia and its people. That's us. That's us. So take the opportunity to go to the library and learn more about the wonderful services that they have. So to Mar Dr. Mary Louise Ayres, who's the current um, national librarian, and Dr. Brett Mason, who is now the, um, the CEO of the advisory council, thank you as well for that chance to serve with them. Uh, Mr. President, um, I want to actually also thank the party for the wonderful chance in the last two parliaments to serve as a shadow minister. It wasn't my goal. It was not something that I had planned to do, but it was a wonderful chance in the, to look after two particular portfolios that meant so much to me. One was um, minister, shadow minister for women and also disability and carers and my friend Carol Brown now works in the disability and carers area. And the other one, the one that I'm doing in this parliament, is international development in the Pacific. Mr President, I cherish the opportunities I've had to work in this space and the people I've had the chance to meet. There are so many advocates and NGOs and people who care about all these areas. But I want to particularly mention the group, the parliamentary group on population and development, which I've mentioned many times in speeches in this place. That group, and I can see people who've been on the group nodding, uh, that group actually encapsulates 
the issues of international development, the Pacific, and women and disabilities, and our whole focus as parliamentarians working on developing policy in this area. I really encourage parliamentarians in the next parliament to work on this cross-party committee, which is so important to our area. Um, and I couldn't uh, leave this area without doing a little nudge to Penny and to um, her office who've done work in this space and provided opportunities, and also to mention the Sustainable Development Goals. I will not, I will not go into a long rant on that. I've done that many times before, and I can assure you I will continue to do it. But in terms of, if you look at what the SDGs talk about, it's what we need. We need to work together. Uh, Mr President, I, I haven't got too much more. I did have a time limit, but I've noticed with interest that there's no clock moving, so um, that's terrifying for everybody. Um, I'd like to actually um, acknowledge my union, the CPSU, the union that serves people who work in the public sector. Um, I, I am a public servant. I have been a public servant my whole working life in just different ways. Um, particularly to Bill Mark Clue, my good friend in Brisbane and his team, you have been behind me. You've been my friend. You've been, me, been my support. Um, I am a life member of that union and will always be active. They mean a lot to me. And that leads on to my, my absolute support and advocacy for the public sector. Um, that's where I worked. I see public servants doing the jobs that we require of them all the time, and I look on them with respect. Uh, we, through the Senate estimates process, which we all love and adore, I know. In fact, I actually do enjoy Senate estimates. I don't believe it's a gladiatorial conquest. I believe it's somewhere where you exchange information. But when you see the work and commitment and genuine care for our society that public, the public service should be, I want to genuinely put on my mind again, as I did in my first speech, my absolute commitment to being part of the public sector. Mr President, I'll, I'll talk about my team. Um, I can't name them all. Over the years, uh, we've built up a bit of an alumni group of people who've survived working in my office. There's a few of them up there uh, in terms of Meredith and Monique, who are actually walking. It's fantastic. <laughs> but in terms that they actually have been great to me. I can't name them all, but they have shared the passion and they've shared the journey. I particularly want to mention Anne, who was with me from the start, from the Sunshine Coast. I actually was blessed by having two Merediths. One is with me here tonight. The other, Meredith, is um, the backbone of my office and my friend and someone with whom I work so closely, and we couldn't do it without her. Um, it has been a great privilege to work, to work with her and also Claire. Uh, we know Claire from the Labor Party. When I was um, actually working in another part, position in this job, she actually helped me through the intricacies of the operations of the Senate and was there when I returned in shock after a heavy question time of taking points of order. Um, and she was always there ready to support me when I returned quite exhausted and deeply concerned about whether I'd done the right thing in the place. So thank you very much. Um, Mr President, what we do, and I did mention um, my long-term commitment to having women in parliament, and I wanted to put on record my thanks to Emily's List, an organisation with which I've worked for many years. Um, they have been strong. They've been supportive. Um, they actually work to have women in Parliament, which is something we hear so much about. But more than that, they work at inclusion in Parliament so that we have people who represent their community in this place. My goal is that our Parliament reflects our community so that everybody who um, is an Australian citizen should feel as though they can serve in Parliament really whether they want to or not, but they can feel as though that option is here. And we're getting better on that, but I think as a parliament we're seeing that we need to do that. I want to thank um, the wonderful people who've supported us uh, <laughs> in the um, WHIP's office. They do a great job, and you and your team are exceptional. I particularly want to thank Maria, Kay and Lenny that um, provide so much support to us and are always there and always should be thanked and acknowledged. Uh, to Penny, for you and your office, um, it's a tough gig and um, the office do amazing work and are there to provide leadership and support. 
I want to thank the, my friends who are always there. You should always have people around you who are, who are your friends who tell you the truth when you're failing as well as when you're doing well. Um, I can't mention you all, but I particularly want to put on record Janice Mays, my good mate, who actually told me I could do this job. Um, I wasn't sure at the time, but she felt that was something she could tell me in faith that I could do. So thank you so much, Janice, and to Virginia, who's always there and just makes life easier for many people by bringing her joy into their lives. My family, Mr. President, um, when we, I was first, um, my first speech, they sat up there and I had nieces and nephews who were very young who are now adults with their own family. Uh, thank you to my two sisters and their families. They have been so supportive. I'm not sure whether they always understood uh, this process, but they have become committed and I always knew that they were right behind me. And I just want to add and for an end, I want to thank everyone who, um, with, um, with whom I've worked. It has been a deep joy, a pleasure and an honour. There's unfinished business and I won't be going away. I wish to put that clearly on record. Um, however, I want to put, end with just one, one regret. When I was sworn in and I had the kids with me, um, they got immense pleasure out of being in this place. And one of the things they enjoyed most was running over Parliament House throwing themselves down that wonderful green space, and I have to admit, Mr President, I did as well. There will be many people who will never actually know that experience because things have moved on so much in this place that we don't have that. And that is a regret. That is a regret to me, um, and I'm sorry. I know the world has changed, but there was something particularly special about the openness and the welcome of the Senate that I joined, the Parliament that I joined, and I hope that we will always keep the spirit alive, if not the ability to run over the hill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senators. I will now call Senator Cameron. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, could I also acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri people and acknowledge their leaders, past and present? I rise tonight to make my final contribution to the Senate, in which I have had the honour of serving since 2008 while representing the citizens of New South Wales and the great Australian Labour Party. My work as a trade union official and a senator has given me the opportunity to meet wonderful and interesting people the length and breadth of this huge country. The overwhelming majority of Australians that I've met have been working people, and they would probably describe themselves as ordinary Australians. However, the working men and women of this country are anything but ordinary. In the main, the Australian working class are industrious, loyal, intelligent, politically engaged and big-hearted. They are not xenophobic, ultra-nationalistic or racist, as some on the cross benches would have people think. The men and women who work in factories, hospitals, on building sites, and in classrooms are the people who make this country great. These workers, many of them union members, build and maintain our great nation. Knowing that I had to make this final speech got me thinking about why I'm here, what brought me to this place and what I've tried to achieve while I was here. And in reality, it comes down to one thing, socialism. I know they've just about fainted. <laughs> the first well done, don't I'm a proud socialist. <laughs> the first leader of the British Labour Party, Keir Hardy, was born in Hollytown, a stone's throw from my birthplace of Bell Sill. And Keir Hardy said this, socialism is at bottom a question of ethics and morals. It has mainly to do with the relationship 
which should exist between man and his fellows. Therefore, it is the equaliser in the position of the rich man's too much and the poor man's too little. Now, the former member for Parks, who I never met, uh, Les Halen, provided another take on socialism, and it's also one to which I subscribe. In 1961, Les Halen described socialism as being anti-war, anti-poverty, anti-monopoly, anti-greed, and anti-race discrimination, and forever opposed to the savageness of capitalism, which has kept the world in fear and misery for centuries. Socialism is a standard of shared goods, jobs, and opportunities. It's another word for equality, fair shares. To this day, those opposite view this alternative economic programme, one that has served so many of our allies so well, as inferior to capitalism and neoliberalism. Well, I'll let those opposite in on a little secret. You've got socialists in your rank too. They just won't admit it. True. My old mate, Waka Williams, <laughs> is an agrarian socialist, <laughs> if I've ever seen one. Nobody that's been kicked in the guts by capitalism in the banks like Waka has been could be anything else. What other reason could there be for a farmer and a trade unionist to get along so well? But it was the late, great Leonard Cohen who provided probably the most poetic metaphor for inequality, unfairness and corruption in his song, Everybody Knows. While I'm not going to test the standing orders or your <laughs> sensibilities and sing, I'll read the first verse. Everybody knows that the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows that the war is over. Everybody knows the good guys lost. Everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. Well, I grew up in Belsill, where there was a lot of poor people. A small, working-class town a few miles southeast of Glasgow, in North Lanarkshire. Belsa was a steel town, an engineering and mining town, a tough town. It was home <coughs> to a large Lithuanian migrant population, which included my mother's family. I grew up in social housing, colloquially known as the Schemes, with my brother Andy, sisters Marilyn and Sandra, my mother Anne, and my father was Dougie in Scotland. My father was a sergeant major in the British Army. <clears throat> he served behind Japanese lines in Burma with the British Expeditionary Forces, and then in India. He was a man stricken by the ravages of malaria and war. Like many returned soldiers, he ended up abusing alcohol and dying young. He was a strict disciplinarian, as sergeant majors are, and he was an authoritarian, which I think engendered in me a keen sense of civil disobedience. <laughs> I'm not a pacifist, but I hate war. We never had much money, and my mum had a tough time making ends meet. I entered the workforce at 12, at delivering newspapers. I left school at 15 to take up an apprenticeship as a fitter. I joined the union on my first day at work, and apart from marrying Elaine, it was the best call I've ever made. <laughs> In 1973, aged 22, Elaine and I left Belsill with our 14 month old daughter Lynn and migrated to Australia in search of a better life, one free from sectarian conflict and hardship. Because I had a trade certificate as a fitter and machinist, we had a choice of countries, including the United States, Canada and New Zealand. 
However, Australia had a reputation as an egalitarian, multicultural country where a worker would get a fair go and a fair day's pay as a result of large, effective trade unions. Upon our arrival, we stayed at the Endeavour Migrant Hostel in South Coogee. I was, in reality, an economic refugee, the sort loathed by some of the crossbenchers. As I have looked across this chamber in recent times, I have done so in the knowledge that there are some people in here who would have denied my family and I the opportunity to make a life in Australia if the de decision had been theirs. Fortunately, those with xenophobic and racist views are in the minority, and their bigotry will never be accepted by mainstream Australians in this proudly multicultural country where about 30 per cent of residents were born overseas. As a fitter, I was able to secure employment at General Motors Holden in Pagewood, at Garden Island Dockyard and at National Springs. And Elaine was one of the first women to work on the production line at General Mo Motors Holden as a spot welder because we had $80 when we arrived in Australia, the equivalent of a week's wages. So I had to work, Elaine had to work, and we had to make a life in this country. I worked with other migrants, many from non-English speaking backgrounds, who shared my dream of living in a bountiful, peaceful country, free of the poverty and device of politics that had afflicted Europe. In 1975, I accepted a job as a maintenance fitter at the Liddell power station near Musselbrook. It was a heap of rubbish then, I don't know what it's like now. <laughs> this lot want to keep it going. Uh, <laughs> It was at Liddell that I became a union activist and convener. On arrival in Musselbrook with Elaine, Lynn and our newborn daughter Fiona, we discovered that the house provided as part of the job had been vandalised. When I raised this issue with the bosses, they just shrugged their shoulders. So here I am with my wife, two young children and nowhere to live but a dilapidated, dirty, unsafe workers cottage. Fiona was only a few months old. Luckily for me, I was a member of the union. And as soon as I spoke to the shop steward, he took it up with the bosses and we were given a different house, one fit for a family with a new child. I have never forgotten that act of support, strength and solidarity, and I never will. In 1982, after seven years on the tools at Liddell, and after many industrial disputes, I was elected as a state organiser for the Amalgamated Metal Workers and Shipwrights Union. In 1986, I became the New South Wales Assistant State Secretary of the Union before becoming the Assistant National Secretary. From 1996 until I commenced my first term in the Senate in 2008, I was National Secretary of the Union and the Vice President of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. A union is only as strong as its weakest shop, and we would use the strength of our hot shops, the well-organised sites, to raise standards across the industry. Pattern bargaining, as it was known, is the most effective way of working people to get decent pay and conditions. Work choices essentially outlawed pattern bargaining, and as a result, workers' pay and conditions have stagnated while company profits have soared. Under the current industrial system, workers would have been unable to achieve shorter hours, career paths, superannuation, and industrial democracy, free from complete managerial prerogative. John Howard's war on workers and their unions culminated in the waterfront dispute, the introduction of work choices, the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisation Commission. In 2007, when work, the workers of this country rose up and countered these unprecedented attacks on their rights at work, I was very fortunate to be elected to the Australian Senate. 
I was, con I was encouraged to seek pre-selection by my friend and comrade, Greg Combe. So you can all blame Greg. I was strongly supported by Sally McManus, a great trade unionist and a fantastic leader. We often hear about the shortcomings of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years, more often than not from the Murdoch press. We hear about the internal fighting, the removal of a sitting Prime Minister and the endless cycle of payback. And yes, that all happened. I opposed the removal of Prime Minister Rudd and I think my position has been vindicated. The only thing worse than engaging in that sort of nonsense would be to witness it, ruthlessly exploit it, and then immediately repeat it as soon as you get into power. And that's exactly what the Liberal Party has done. Less spoken about are some of the great achievements of the Rudd-Gillard years, starting with the long overdue apology to our First Nations people. Indigenous Australians continue to pay a heavy price for having their country stolen and their culture attacked. Rudd's apology started a healing process and I firmly believe this important work must continue if Australia is ever to reach its full potential. Another enormous achievement of the previous Labour government was guiding Australia through the economic tur turmoil of the global financial crisis. Without the widespread job losses and foreclosures experienced around the world. Some of this law over there was saying there was no, no global financial crisis. It was an American, a European crisis. I don't get it. How these people were ever seen to be good economic managers, <laughs> beggars belief. It should not, and it will not ever be forgotten, that it was a Labour government that shielded the people of this country from the excesses of capitalism. This was the real economic leadership by Prime Minister Rudd and Treasurer Swan. It stands out compared to the economic vandalism of the Howard and Costello years. While this Senate has faced some serious headwinds through my time here, it's the recent contributions by neo-fascists masquerading as patriots that have caused me the most concern. I'll make this point very clearly. It's not, the Austra it's not Australians' Muslim community that is a menace and danger to our society and to what we collectively hold dear. It's not Australia's Muslim community who invited a toxic foreign entity like the, the NRA to buy our democracy and expose our community to semi-automatic weapons. It's the extreme right they are the incubators of hate and intolerance. It's one nation. People like Fraser Anning and the extremists on the far right of the coalition that would destroy this great country if given half a chance. The very wealthy, self-serving, anti-union, formal Liberal Party candidate Pauline Hanson pretends to be a voice for those without financial or political power. One Nation does this while voting with the Liberals on key legislation, including the ABCC, penalty rates, free trade agreements and tax cuts for the wealthy. They pretend to love this country while dispatching their idiotic minions to sell us out to the NRA. They pretend to care about everyday Australians while subscribing to imbecilic conspiracies about the Port Arthur massacre. And now they want us to believe they were all taken out of context with their half-baked plan to hijack this parliament with US gun money. I strongly urge working class Queenslanders, working class Australians, to give this treacherous, treasonous rabble the boot at the upcoming election. And I say to the Australian Muslim community, you are welcome here. You are an important part of our multicultural society. You contribute far more than Senator Hanson and her poisonous policies. You belong here as much as anyone else, 
and don't let anyone tell you any different. One of the most important trips I made as a senator was to the Wilkins Aerodrome in Antarctica with the Environment and Communications Committee where scientists explained to me the impact climate change is having on our planet. How our opponents became so wedged on this important issue is beyond me. I do take comfort, however, in the knowledge that a shortened Labour government, if elected, will take meaningful action on climate change to safeguard future generations. Over the past six years, I've been honoured to serve in Bill Shorten's shadow ministry as a Labour as Labour spokesman on firstly human services, housing and homelessness, as well as skills, TAFE and apprenticeships. Unfortunately, Australia's housing market is failing. Home ownership is at, re is at record lows. Rental stress is preventing young people from saving for a home deposit and homelessness is skyrocketing. There are very few social outcomes that so unambiguously and shamefully expose our failure to live up to the promise of being a fair and decent society than the persistently high number of young Australians and older women either at risk of or experiencing homelessness. We must stop viewing housing policy as a source of investment and wealth creation and recognise that a society as wealthy as ours should view having a roof over your head as a human right. I also believe that given the social and economic importance of housing, it should be part of the infrastructure portfolio. I am deeply concerned that too many politicians argue that equality of opportunity is the key to resolving social and economic disadvantage. This rhetoric belies the massive difference in opportunity available to the children of the wealthy compared to the children of the working class and disadvantaged Australians. Young people under the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government have faced high rates of unemployment and underemployment, wage stagnation and penalty rate cuts, underinvestment in vocational education and increases in the proportion of young workers relying on the minimum wage. This hopeless and dysfunctional coalition government has also decimated our TAFE and apprenticeship systems by cu cutting more than $3 billion from the sector. There are 140,000 fewer apprentices since they were elected and TAFE enrolments have plummeted by 24.5%. Last night's budget did nothing to address this terrible decline. Rather, it was a pee and thimble trick designed to fool voters into thinking they are investing more money when clearly they are not. Among the highlights of my time in the Senate was the delivery of my proposal to establish the National Workers' Memorial in Canberra. The memorial serves the dual purpose of honouring those killed at work and reminding us all of the need for occupational health and safety in the workplace. And Waka, thanks for your support on that committee. If there is one small thing I hope I'm remembered for when I leave this place, it's consistency. I've consistently backed progressive causes, even when they have been unpopular. Sorry, Penny, but I've never voted for a free trade agreement in the caucus. <laughs> I've never believed in the magical power of the markets. And I've remained extremely sceptical about the virtues of privatisation and competition policy. Privatisation has not worked in health, in education, in the electricity market or in the vocational education sector. We've seen countless big government instrumentalities handed over to the private sector who more often than not have profiteered while reducing services. One of the most consistent criticisms levelled at me by the murder press and others is that I engage in class warfare. Apparently, defunding public schools and hospitals cutting legal aid, closing TAFE campuses, wage, allowing wage theft, 
in cutting penalty rates is not class warfare. If protecting the working class from the excesses of the wealthy elite and the coalition, I plead guilty to class war. When I was first elected to the Senate, a colleague told me that I was no longer a trade unionist, but a senator in the Australian Parliament. Like any, many other pieces of unsolicited advice, I ignored this. I have always been and always be, will be a proud trade unionist. Many great women and men have served the Labour Party over the years. People like Senator Bruce Childs, a fantastic individual, a fantastic senator. But there is one New South Wales senator that I'd like to single out as having left an indelible mark on democracy, society and the law. That's Lionel Murphy. The former Attorney General's many reforms were driven by a visceral sense of social justice and a fierce determination to pursue equality for all. Lionel sought justice for women in the mid-1970s through his abolition of the Matrimonial Causes Act and the introduction of no-fault divorce. His establishment of the Commonwealth Legal Aid provided many Australians previously shut out of the legal system with rights and access to legal support. Lionel's well-placed concern about the accountability and transparency of our national security agencies remains of fundamental relevance to Australian democracy today. This parliament needs more oversight, such as the UK parliament, the Canadian parliament, and the US Parliament over our security services. If you want to give them more power, they must be more accountable. Lionel is credited with establishing the Senate committee system, an innovation that has provided so much to the democratic accountability in this country. There are far too many good comrades in the Labour Party for me to mention today. But I'll single out my Senate colleagues for special mention. Thanks, comrades. You've been great. <laughs> they have been an inspiration and tremendous support for me over the years, and I thank each and every one of them for this. In the other place, I want to make special mention of Deputy Labour Leader Tanya Plibersek. I believe Tanya will make a truly great Deputy Prime Minister and I hope she gets that opportunity very soon. I want to acknowledge Jenny Macklin, one of the most talented, hard-working, intellectually precise people I've ever met, a fantastic contributor to this nation. I want to just say my Queensland, Queensland colleague, Murray Watt, has been a forensic interrogator in Senate estimates and I know for certain he'll make a significant contribution to Australian public life over the coming years. The same goes for my New South Wales comrades, Deb O'Neill, Christina Keneally and Jenny McAllister, three remarkable women who will continue to serve this nation very well. And Claire, you and I are going out at the same time, but you have made a remarkable contribution to the Senate and to the Parliament. Now, one of the most formidable and intelligent politicians I've ever met is my leader in the Senate, Penny Wong. Penny, you and I have had our differences on a range of policy issues. You have always argued your position with strength and integrity, even though your remarkable powers of persuasion failed to change my mind on trade and competition policy. I couldn't leave this place without special mention of my mate Albo. What can you say about Al Albo? Self-made, raconteur, DJ, my goodness. <laughs> numbers man, not a bad numbers man. He is the ultimate political warrior. He dominated the House of Representatives as leader of the government and his contribution to Labour has now, uh, is now allowing us to be a genuine alternative government and Albo's contribution should never be underestimated. And finally, to my successor 
and AMWU brother Tim Ayers, I wish you all the best for the future. I know you'll serve the people of New South Wales. Good luck, comrade, in, in the future. I leave this place in the knowledge that the Labour movement and the Labour Party are in great shape. Sally McManus and Michelle O'Neill have reinvigorated the union movement with their uncompromising leadership style. I've been extremely impressed by the way Bill and Tanya have united the Labour Party, leading us out of the wilderness and into contention to form the next Australian government. Under Bill's leadership, the Labour Party again feels like the Labour Party I joined many years ago. It is unashamedly progressive, pro-worker, pro-women, outward-looking and confident. I am quietly confident myself that Australians will give Bill the opportunity to lead this great country. He will make a great Labour Prime Minister who will govern for all Australians, particularly with, for those without access to wealth and power. In closing, I want to thank the Parliament House staff who do a tremendous job in keeping this place running. I'll just adopt all the thank yous that Claire <laughs> gave, and I think that will save a bit of time. The cleaners, I just want to mention the cleaners. The cleaners in Parliament House have been subjected to wage theft. And if the cleaners in Parliament House are subjected to wage theft, how can workers out in the general community be confident that their wages will be looked after? The cleaners do a tough job. The cleaners do a great job. And yet, this rabble of a government <laughs> allowed their wages to be cut. It defies belief. In closing, I want to say that my personal staff, both past and present, have been absolutely fabulous. They have provided me with the resources, support and advice that I have needed to do my job properly. Helen, Siobhan, Rebecca, Jason, Justine and Michael, a talented team. Thank you. I must mention Phil Morgans, who worked with me for about near on 20 years as my chief of staff in the union and a friend an advisor without peer. Phil will be shaking his head, because I think this is the first time for a long time I've actually written a speech and stuck to the speech. <laughs> Probably because Wacker Williams and the Nationals have behaved themselves. <laughs> I want to thank my wonderful wife, Elaine, who's given me the love and support I've needed throughout our time together. We've been married for 48 years. <laughs> yeah. Shit. <laughs> I was going to say she's a lucky woman, but she'll, she'll shake her head. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Elaine saved my life. You know, I, Elaine supported me as I recovered uh, from alcohol addiction. To my uh, beautiful daughters, Lynn and Fiona, their partners, Rick and Perry, and my beautiful grandchildren, Amy and Scott, thanks for being so great. Thank you for turning your mum and my hopes when we emigrated to Australia to have a great life, not only for ourselves, but for you in our adopted country. You have been a credit to us. We love you and we thank you for being so good. Thanks everyone. This is the last time you'll hear from me. But I like the battle. Thank you.
Un succès. Merci. Senators, I now call on Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, uh, I rise on behalf of the government to pay tribute to Senators Scullion, Moore, and Cameron for their service in the Australian Senate and to the Australian people. You know, you hear sometimes when people reflect upon politics that they believe that politics and service in this place changes people, and of course, in some ways, it has to. It has to change us in terms of enhancing our outlook expanding our knowledge, broadening and enriching our experience. But equally, this evening, the Australian Senate farewells three characters, three genuine individuals who I think each leave with their core essential characteristics firmly in place, just as they entered this place with. To Nigel, your grounded authenticity is something that we all love so deeply. The bloke from the bush who is as much the bloke from the bush here in Canberra, up in the Territory or anywhere else around the country. The fisher from the north, who I think in your approach has always brought to bear that old proverb that it's better to teach someone how to fish than just to give them the fish. Mate, we will miss you so much. You have much to be proud of and just by being here to start with. Your background indeed, not unlike many in this place and those other we farewell tonight, is a background that we would not necessarily have expected to see come to this Australian Senate. A nomadic childhood in many ways in terms of the places you lived and found yourself, making the territory your home and then working across mining, maritime salvage, security, engineering and, of course, most notably as a fisherman, establishing your own fishing business serving as chairman of the Australian Seafood Industry Council and from there, of course, coming to represent the territory but also the fishers of Australia most fiercely. You've been a fierce advocate for the territory, for those from your background, but also, of course, for first Australians. First Australians, first and foremost, right throughout. If anyone had any doubt about Nigel's affection, for his home, home territory, you need only read his first speech, speaking of its natural beauty, 
but also of the depth of its ancient heritage and the calling of its people. Now, as you reflected on your service as a minister in the Howard government, the range of shadow portfolios, but of course it's been in the period since 2013, where we and many across the nation have been able to see the full force of your energy and conviction on display as the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. It's notable, and it's to your credit, you are one of the few people in our government who has carried the same singular portfolio right throughout the time of our government and of your service within it. It's a testament to your deep understanding of the complexities, opportunities and moral significance. And as you rightly said, being a standalone Minister for Indigenous Affairs in the Cabinet afforded the issues the attention they rightly deserve. Your relationship with our First Peoples predates this time in the Senate well and truly. As well as being with his fellow Territorians, the neighbours who spent years living off the sprawling coast of the Arnhem Land, you know their work and they know your work and the connections that are there. You have matched that personal concern with the practicality for tangible improvements over the last nearly six years. In particular, our government is so proud of the Indigenous procurement policy, which you have driven and championed and which has seen Indigenous businesses win Commonwealth contracts, creating jobs and opportunities across the nation, but ensuring those jobs and opportunities are generating ownership, opportunities and greater prosperity for their Indigenous owners. Your personal experience has driven you to ensure that you focus on other priorities, such as the Community Development Program, which under you has seen remote Australian communities at the heart and has helped some remote job seekers find over 27,000 opportunities for employment, many of which have translated into long-term gainful employment opportunities. You've been instrumental in driving the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, used so effectively to deliver support programs to the areas of greatest need and, of course, have been a constant champion for the Indigenous Rangers Initiative, empowering Indigenous communities, protecting the natural wonders of our nation and of their culture and heritage. In recent times, your work to secure the historic Closing the Gap Partnership, a landmark agreement that will revolutionise the practical working relationships that exist between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and governments at both the state and federal level taking the Closing the Gap agenda rightly to the next level and its next place. Upon entering this place, you are one of the first to admit that many of the issues our nation faces in Closing the Gap are complex. They have been there, of course, throughout our modern history, and they will be there long into the future. But you can be proud of the fact that you have made a focused, determined and, in many ways, successful effort to make crucial progress in terms of the lives of the first Australians. Away from the ministry, we commend Nige for having served in the National Party leadership roles in this Senate chamber for many years, including as its Senate leader since October 2015. Few can truly appreciate just what a challenge it can be to lead the National Party, particularly the National Party in the Senate. Those of us who sit amongst the leadership group with you and have had that honour get rare glimpses and insights but, of course, to be able to bring together the different perspectives of the Nats uh, is one of life's great tests, and you have always been there, rising to that occasion. As a dedicated country Liberal, you have always fought hard for your party's cause in the Territory, uh, and whilst here you stand proudly as a Nat, we know that you stand uniquely as a country Liberal. And many of, for many of us Libs, for many of us Libs, you are a Nat who we always wanted. We would have happily traded you into the Liberal Party room at any time and place. Who, happily who, had you and seized you. <laughs> that is too rich an invitation, Senator Fifield. Far too rich an invitation for me. And particularly because I was going to observe that uh, uh, on those rare occasions of certain uh, free votes and deliberations on issues of values in this place, where sometimes I find myself voting against quite a number of my colleagues uh, on some of those issues. Nige, you were always uh, or frequently one of the ones I'd find sitting close to me, 
making sure that, uh, that though we might have been small in number, uh, we made sure that the views and values were held dear and clear, made clear. I know that all on our side, particularly all coalition staff, will be looking upon your departure with one clear question. Mango daiquiris. Who's going to make the mango daiquiris in future? Who's going to be responsible for ensuring that key tradition that ensures the coalition staff Christmas party can, to some extent, live up to the, uh, live up to the wonders of the National Party Christmas party uh, is well known. So, Obviously, we expect you back with mango daiquiris. Mate, your contribution over 17 years has been something that we have enjoyed uh, and that you should be proud of. You've previously noted, and I quote, that the hopes and dreams of first Australians reflect those of all Australians. And how right you are. You can retire knowing that, through your dedication and work, those hopes and dreams are somewhat closer. And the work for all of us in this place is to continue to make sure that we deliver on that passion and vision that you've demonstrated. We're going to miss your good nature, your good humour, the knowledge that you're somebody who any of us, I think, would feel comfortable reaching out to at any time in terms of our lives and in any circumstances. And the fact you've been so successful at befriending people right across this chamber, and especially some of those on the crossbench from time to time, uh, the orphans of the chamber who come in here as independents is a testament to the way in which you reach out. As you leave this place, we wish you, your wife Carol, three children, all of your loved ones, the very best for the future. In your first speech in this place, you invited all of your colleagues to visit the Territory and take home a slice of paradise. Well, you're getting to go back to paradise. I can assure you that many of us are going to come and make sure that we haunt you in your paradise. Uh, that we visit you there, uh, that we make sure that whether it is the barramundi or the wild pigs at the top end who need to watch out once Nigel is back, uh, we'll also be there to make sure we get one of those rich Nigel experiences. Mate, thank you for your service. Can I turn to, uh, to Senator Moore, to Claire? Thank you also for the service you've brought, a real true Queenslander to this place. But I think most importantly, a care, a compassion and a considered approach that stands out. Many who dislike the combat of politics would, if they had the chance to look around here, look at Claire Moore and think that you are the type of politician they want to see. Because I can't think of a time that I've served in this place with you where I've heard you say an ill word of anybody. You've always been thoughtful, careful and considered in the approach that you have brought to bear. Of course you spoke of your background, a lifelong time in public service. But over 17 years here, that public service has allowed you to contribute in so many different ways. Your service on Senate committees is, I think, something that all will remember. And I have to say, if I think of things I might regret at moments like this, it's that uh, I never had a lot of time serving in Senate committees with you, Claire, but I did, in your contribution when you spoke about the committee work of gynaecological cancer, reflect, of course, that I filled Jeannie Ferris's vacancy in this place. And just a couple of months ago, I held, as I do each year, a large morning teal in Adelaide, uh, acknowledging Jeannie and, uh, and her work. But at that time, uh, we were talking about the work of that Senate committee on gynaecological cancers uh, and I know the integral role you played, not just in the thought leadership there and in the fact that through senators like you, people feel able to open up and share more of their soul and their problems than they necessarily always can. But I also know that you were uh, a great rock of support for Jeannie during that time, as you have been towards many. Uh, I think, of course, of greatest note in terms of your service here uh, is your time as Chair of the Community Affairs uh, Committee. Uh, many would see your time, as, uh, your, your time in the Senate as being synonymous with the work of the Community Affairs Committee, uh, but also importantly, as you highlighted, the Parliamentary Group on Population and Development, as well as your consistent work uh, in the aid space. You reflected upon the jingle jangle that comes to the Chamber at times, 
uh, and indeed uh, I think the Senate will miss your decorative flair. There's, uh, uh, you, you raised it. I feel that I can go there in that sense, which is so well displayed, not only in the chamber, uh, but also importantly or notably uh, in your senatorial offices uh, as well. Uh, and uh, packing up will be quite a task, I imagine. On behalf of the government, I want to commend you uh, for the clarity of your convictions. You'll leave here, I know, uh, going off to a life pursuit of many of your different passions and hobbies, from cricket to Irish folk music and beyond, uh, and indeed the opportunity uh, to find many a quality detective fiction novel, I'm sure. Uh, but you leave here also uh, a place and a chamber uh, that will miss the way in which you approach debates, uh, but for which you can be proud of having approached them all with a sense of purpose and decency to be very, very proud. To Senator Cameron, to Doug, as I said, each leaves in many ways as they came. The, uh, the grounded authenticity of Nige, the care and compassion of Claire, and the warrior instincts of Doug Cameron. Uh, a warrior for his union, for his party, for his causes, particularly the cause of socialism, for the people that he represents, and even often for the people who may not even want Doug to represent them. Doug would stand there and argue the toss to represent them. He'll leave this place, uh, uh, but I am sure it won't be the last that we hear of his, uh, his wicked tongue with its sometimes cutting insults, uh, but also a very rich sense of humour. Uh, Doug, you spoke uh, of your background as you did in your valedictory speech. You also spoke about a range of issues. And as always when you've spoken in this place, it's incredibly tempting for anybody on this side to respond to highlight what we think are the inaccuracies or the differences, but tonight I resist that temptation. Uh, your career lends credence to the old saying that while you may not always agree with another person's beliefs, you can certainly still respect the strength with which they held, hold them and the conviction with which they advocate for their cause. Uh, and there are few who advocate with as much conviction and determination as you have in your life prior to being in this place, throughout your time in this place and, of course, I am sure, in the time thereafter. Yours, as you acknowledge, was a remarkable journey to this place, uh, and I acknowledge that I think it was just yesterday uh, in condolence motions where I reflected upon a Labor senator from the West who had a very similar history uh, and also had some similar lines about Scottish accents uh, through that. I particularly recall time spent uh, with you, Doug, on the Senate's uh, Environment and Communications Committee uh, and, uh, and seeing your chairmanship of, uh, of that committee, uh, where you brought uh, the work-to-rule instincts of, uh, of your union background. We would always finish at the precise time, and if we didn't finish at the precise time, the lunch break would still be 60 minutes long to make sure that everybody had appropriate downtime. But I also know that there was a little bit of workplace flexibility that you brought to bear too. I can remember conspiring with you one day to make sure that we ordered the proceedings of the committee uh, in a way so that I could catch a plane to get home and see my kids. Uh, and, uh, and it was that human touch that many wouldn't see in, uh, in the way in which you fiercely advocate uh, for your issues and causes. Uh, but I know that it's there and we see that in the reflection uh, of your comments about your family uh, and indeed the care that your conviction is driven by for the lives of other people. Politics can be fierce and tough, and it's fair to say that Doug's never shied away from a political scrum, from speaking his mind, uh, and we heard that tonight. Uh, and this place, of course, will miss his very distinguishable voice. Uh, whilst Claire's uh, jingles and rattles uh, uh, may have uh, caught Hansard's attention occasionally, everybody knew who was speaking the moment Doug Cameron started and rose to speak. Whatever the difference that exists across the political divide, our democracy is stronger thanks to the robust advocacy we see from Doug and from all of those who depart this chamber tonight. I want to commend each and every one for their service, wish each and every one's families, Elaine, in your case Doug, and your children, your grandchildren, everybody every success. May you enjoy getting your loved ones back uh, from the service. Thank you for lending those loved ones to our nation. Congratulations to each and every one of you on your service. We wish you well and thank you.
Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, De Acting Deputy President. Um, and I rise to make some brief remarks uh, on the valedictory, valedictory marks for Senators Scully and Moore and Cameron. And I just note at the outset that a couple of the senators leaving, uh, for, as they indicated in their speeches, from the class of 2001 in which I entered the parliament. So I don't know if that's just a reminder or whether somebody might be saying something in any way. Uh, first to Senator Scullion. Well, it's a certain type of personality that goes from professional fisherman to Australian senator, but uh, Nigel is quite a unique individual. Uh, some might be surprised we have a few things in common. We both spent our early years in Malaysia. We were both on early episodes of Kitchen Cabinet. But I reckon whilst my lunch with Anne Crabbe was pretty sedate, Senator Scullion took her out on a boat and told her a tale of how he once shot a mud crab off his thumb with a, cut, with a gun. So I think his was a much more interesting episode. Uh, Senator Scullion brings his own larrikin uh, style, his uh, somewhat laconic style at times uh, to the Senate. Uh, he's also uh, a survivor. He, he's managed to be a minister, I think, as he mentioned today, in both, he was a minister in the Howard government and you served in the, both the, in the Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison government since day one in the same portfolio. So I think you're probably the only one. Um, Senator, McC Senator Cormann too, that's right. Um, Senators and Scullion and Labor may have disagreed uh, uh, sometimes quite vehemently at times with this government's policy approach in his portfolio. And sometimes those debates have been strident. Uh, but I do say this. I, I, um, recognise, and I think we all on this side recognise that Senator Scullion cares passionately about this policy area. Um, his pride at being the first minister responsible for Indigenous affairs in the standalone portfolio, I think, was manifest today in his remarks. And whatever differing opinions we may have about go go government initiatives, Labor recognises uh, Senator Scullion's determination to work with our first Australians uh, and to further his personal knowledge of country and culture. Uh, um, uh, and we respect that. Um, in announcing he wouldn't recontest his seat in the Senate, Senator Scullion had some words of warning for the game animals of the top end. If I were a wild pig, a duck or a mud crab, I'd be starting to get nervous, he said. Well, I hope so. I hope he's right. Uh, I also turn tonight to two of my colleagues, two Labor senators who I think uh, demonstrate the richness of the Labor tradition and the breadth of progressive politics. I'll start first with Senator Moore. Uh, as Senator Moore indicated, uh, we came to the Senate on the same day, elected in 2001, commencing on 1st July 2002. And Claire has always shown great empathy for and solidarity with the vulnerable and the marginalised. In her first speech, Senator Moore said, any choice to be involved in a political system must be based on a personal commitment as well as a real sense of support and purpose. Well, some people do not always succeed and they're keeping their principles and personal integrity intact in politics, but that is a challenge that Claire Moore has well and truly met. Her personal commitment has never wavered, especially in areas including the advancement of women and the protection of human rights, as well as the importance of community services. Senator Moore's list of committee appointments and inquiries is quite a rap sheet. Actually, it's not because she would never do anything wrong, so it's probably more a very lengthy CV. Uh, it demonstrates the depth of her care and commitment to those Australians and others beyond our shores who would otherwise be pushed to the margins and have not had a voice at the table of national decision making. Her service on committees also underlies her belief, underlines her belief, as she reiterated today, of the merit and power of the Senate committee system as a valued aspect of the Australian democracy. Uh, she, I note a membership of uh, landmark Senate, the Senate Select Committee on Mental Health, um, the Joint Statutory Committee on Human Rights, Joint Committees on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, uh, the Parliamentary Library, as she spoke about tonight, and of course as the member on the councils of the National Library and Australian Archives. Claire has a keen sense of history and on the importance of history and knowing who we are and where we've come from. Senator Moore's many years of service on the Community Affairs Committee has included some nationally significant inquiries, children and institutional care, which comprised the Forgotten Australians and Protecting Vulnerable Children reports, which led to the National Apology and to the Royal Commission. Senator Moore has also been a leader on many issues in relation to women's rights, 
Uh, one particularly uh, important contribution was Senator Moore's role in the debate on the TGA repeal of ministerial responsibility for, for the approval of IU486 bill in 2005. As Claire said at the time, and this was not a national referendum on the rights or wrongs, legality or morality of a woman's right to choose, but an attempt to clearly identify for all our community where the appropriate assessment process for the safety, efficiency and quality of a medication should be. I think we all know the contentious nature of this topic and how difficult at times it is for parliaments to deal with them with it. Senator Moore was key to the discussions which brought this bill forward and achieved its passage in the Senate, an extraordinary cross-party effort uh, led by women for women. In the debate, Senator Moore noted, and I quote, it showed that people can work together if they have a common aim, aim and can share their knowledge and experience to ensure we can work to achieve results for the community. And this has been the approach that Senator Claire Moore has taken across her career, building partnerships for positive change. I have valued her partnership in the Foreign Affairs portfolio, and we've done a couple of tours of the Pacific together. Senator Claremore has always remained true to her social justice conscience and has put her beliefs into practice. In her first speech, she told the story of suffragette Emma Miller and her sisters and finished with this quote, the world will be what we make it, and a fuller, happier and more abundant world is possible for all of us if we are united in efforts. Uh, Senator Moore, Labor feminist, internationalist, who has brought her principles to this Senate, and I honour her contribution and thank her. I turn now to Senator Doug Cameron. Well, uh, Senator Cameron came to us after an extraordinarily distinguished career fighting for the rights of workers in the trade union movement. Uh, working class, Scotsman, Glaswegian. Uh, he's a bloke who never, never forgets who he is, where he came from, and who he fights for. There is nobody better at calling out the rabble on the other side, and he has a capacity for the pithy takedown. For example, today he said the government's budget didn't last from late line to lunch. There you go. He's led the fight over five and a half years in opposition on many fronts. He's been relentless in his pursuit of the Liberals and Nationals, and some ministers have earned a special place in his heart. I know that Senator Cash will miss him. <laughs> Dougie understands discipline, solidarity and loyalty, all attributes of our movement. He exemplifies them, and I want to personally thank him uh, for uh, that contribution. He eventually does what I say. It usually takes some work. But more importantly, and what I value most, is that whenever he is asked uh, to step up for the group, for the team, uh, his courage is second to none. And I respect that, and I value that, and I thank him for it. Doug Cameron has weathered many personal partisan attacks in this place for his role as a trade union leader, for his relentless pursuit of the interests of workers, and for asking legitimate questions about this. He has been accused in this chamber of aiding and abetting criminal behaviour, and I do want in this final valedictory to make this point. There is nobody in this Senate who has done more to stamp out corruption and criminal elements in the trade union movement than Doug Cameron. His efforts, both as a, union, as a union leader, have come at times at personal cost. And I want to record that, not only because it is a significant le legacy, but because it has been so contrary, his position and his career and his uh, contribution has been so contrary to some of the personal insults that have been held by those opposite. We, some of those opposite, not you, Acker. We often focus uh, on Senator Cameron's passion uh, in the and courage in the chamber or committee hearings, but it is important to underline that he pairs this passion with diligence and hard work. Having served briefly as Parliamentary Secretary for Housing and Homelessness in 2013, in opposition he has made substantial inroads in areas of policy too often neglected by the coalition. His contributions in the areas of vocational education, housing and homelessness not only speak to his commitment to opportunity and fairness, but will also stand a future Labor government in good stead. Senator Cameron is, like many of his comrades, living proof that being part of the Labor movement is, is about wages and conditions, but it is about much more. 
It is membership of a movement that stands for the most vulnerable, stands with the most vulnerable in society, reaches out to lift people up, and that looks to a more just and more equal Australia. We will miss him in the Senate, uh, but we wish him well. We wish his family well. I hope he and Elaine have a wonderful time in this, this next phase in their life. And I say to Tasmania, look out. <laughs> you, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm proud to call Senator Nigel Scullion a colleague, our leader and a great friend. He is one, a kind, one of a kind of person, not someone you'd usually find around Parliament House. He's the sort of bloke you'd more likely find at Shady Camp Boat Ramp or at the bar at the Burulara Hotel. But that is why he's been so successful in this place and as Senator for the Northern Territory. He understands the pressures, the challenges, the real desires and motives of the average, uh, normal or, as Dougie said, ordinary Australian. He listens to people. Uh, he has his own code. He genuinely cares about what he can do to make their life a little better and give them more opportunity and take advantage of this wonderful nation. If you had undertake an examination of the background of the representatives here in the Senate, you would not find one that had a similar one tonight. And no doubt there will be many stories uh, tonight and ongoing about his, his role here. But I think that is why he's been able to make such a unique contribution to this place. It's because of his character, it's because of where he's come from and what he's been through. He was born in London and raised in Malaysia and Malawi. And a varied background by anyone's standards, I suggest that has played a part in the political career that followed. And I certainly recall, way before the recent foreign citizenship challenges faced by politicians, that he undertook what might be called the midnight dash back from London to renounce his British citizenship just hours before the close of nominations. He flew across the world to ensure that he was eligible to sit in the Australian Senate. And that's an example of his true dedication to the Australian parliamentary uh, democracy. It's well known that Senator Scullion was a keen fisherman, is a keen fisherman, and in 1985 he moved to the Territory to pursue his professional piscatorial interests. And for over six years he and his family lived on a boat off the coast of Arnhem Land in the NT as a professional um, fisherman. And his love of the land and the Territory uh, is, is renowned. He represents the true values of the country Liberal Party. He mentioned in his maiden speech, but he's always a bit of a conundrum, Nigel, to try and work out, and I think we saw some of that uh, tonight in his uh, valedictory remark. In his maiden speech, he speaks of being both a conservationist and a fisherman, a proud, uh, a proud professional fisherman. And this demonstrates, I think, that it's not incompatible for those two seemingly sometimes opposing views to exist in the same human. But he has always been proudly uh, using science and reasons to determine and argue his position from. And I think that is a great example for all of us. He's experienced some of the toughest country in the territory and I believe truly represents the frontier concept that many Australians understand so well. He's an enthusiastic natural history observer and collector and would always regale us of uh, some very special insect or uh, grass uh, specimen that he'd found somewhere that was quite incredible. And he was always astounded and curious and respectful of nature and its wonders. His effort and work as a skipper on the vessel of Calderas and Reliance in the Northern Territory, who transported herbarium staff into many isolated coastal localities have seen him have a plant named after him, the Aerocolian scaloni. True story. This example to me sums up just what a, yeah, thank you. Uh, another scientist in the, in the Senate, Senator Seawart's nodding profusely. Uh, that is just what a unique character Senator Scullion is. As a professional fisherman, we can all you know, imagine him swearing and cursing at the weather or complaining about not catching the fish on any given day, uh, but he's also a very proud, passionate and practical conservationist. Uh, not just wanting to combine himself to the life of a fisherman, Senator Scullion was previously a mango farmer. And in support of the mango farming industry, he proudly brings them all down and we end up with Mango Daiquiri Night at Parliament House, which really then ended up morphing into uh, the Coalition Christmas Party, 
where many unsuspecting uh, rookie coalition staffers on a Christmas party uh, were subjected to the delicious flavour of these mango daiquiris, only to find it a bit hard to get up the next morning. Um, so it'll be a huge loss to the Christmas party this year. And we also, I know Senator Wong mentioned his chili, chili crabs, uh, made famous on Annabelle uh, Crab's show, but recently he has initiated the National Party uh, seafood barbecue in support of our seafood industry. And the chili crab dish is served proudly and loudly to uh, all that come along. And he did that in partnership with Senator Ron Boswell uh, to promote our, our seafood industry. And it's so popular that we now have to limit uh, who gets tickets to it. But really, that's, that's I think, testament to Niger's passion for that industry and the success of his advocacy. Uh, he also had a long and proud career in representing the seafood industry, uh, going on to chair the International Coalition of Fisheries Association in 1999. Senator Scullion was elected to the Senate in 2001, 2004, 2007, 2010, 2013, 2016. And that is a lot of elections for a senator. But the two NT senators uh, face the voters every single election. Not, uh, they don't have the luxury of six years. And I might be as bold to say he's probably one of the most successfully elected senators, especially when senators are unfairly, I think, sometimes labelled as having a resistance to facing uh, electors. He was appointed Minister for Community Services in the Howard government and he became Minister for Indigenous Affairs in 2013 and at the same time became a member of Cabinet. He has also been the National Party Whip, and I think it's hard to, hard to find a National Party Senator who hasn't been uh, the National Party Whip, but as Senator Birmingham alluded to, it's not an easy role. It's not an easy role to be the National Party uh, Senate Whip. Tell me about it. There you go, Wacker. <laughs> but he's also been, when I came to this place, he was Deputy Leader of the Nationals, and he served uh, so magnificently in that capacity, uh, bringing people together, exercising a particular style of leadership, uh, which I think worked very, very well uh, within the National Party. And he has been leader of the Nationals in the Senate for a very, very long time. And I think his his ability to be very calm in a crisis, uh, his wisdom, uh, is is a much needed. His creative thinking is much needed in all of these roles, but for those of us in this chamber that absolutely see him ferociously fight, uh, that is something that, as a Nat, you have to have, and, and it's respected within the party, and Nige absolutely has that in spade. He's been a passionate advocate for the NT and calls a spade a spade. But it is really in that role of Indigenous Affairs Minister where his advocacy to improve the health, education, living standards of our First Australians is his greatest political legacy. He has really changed, I think, uh, the dial in a way that we've been wanting to see uh, and so many prior to him have failed to do because of his determination, his focus to fight for resources and funding, but to actually change structures and systems and to bring people uh, together. He's fearless in his determination to see our first Australians economically empowered, and uh, for him uh, he has been incredibly successful at that. He's also a fierce champion and, and outspoken on his views ar around the live cattle trade and, and particularly the Northern Ter the North Territory and cattle, cattlemen's uh, interests. He's been fearless around marine parks, law-abiding firearm owners uh, can actually be very proud of his contributions in this place, both publicly and, and privately. Uh, just on a personal note, uh, Nigel um, and I have enjoyed our question times together and he's provided me a great source of humour and advice and uh, irreverence and some lessons in life. So I just want to say thanks, Nige. Um, we'll miss you a lot. But I know you're very, very much looking forward to this next chapter of your life um, with Carol and the kids and uh, doing some cool stuff while you still can. Um, but thank you for always applying your code consistently for your common sense, for stating the truth despite its popularity, 
for always being prepared to break the glass when necessary and really to stand up and fight for what is right, not what is always expedient. To always seek to protect your family, your party, your people, the children, the community. Enjoy it. Thank you very much for your service uh, and your example to us all, and we wish you well. Senator Seward. Thank you. On behalf of the Greens, I'd like to say a few words about each of the people who gave their valedictories uh, tonight. I'll go in order. So, Nigel, I've had a Nigel um, has always been sincere in any dealings that I've had with him. Having said that, I strongly disagree and have disagreed, and he knows that, with a lot of his policy positions. But I have never doubted his sincerity. I will also add that whenever I have taken a problem to Nigel, he has responded. Not always in the way I would like, but he ha and in fact he did so today um, to, with another issue that I, I took to him um, just yesterday, and he came back and responded today. So, I, I, um, despite our political differences, which are in many ways very, very significant over policy, he has always been responsive when you raise issues and point out perhaps a mistake has been made. And um, so, I thank him very sincerely for that. I also have campaigned with him on several issues, particularly around some, um, supporting some specific individuals. And that's where I have also seen his doggedness, his determination to get an outcome, his determination to take it up to his own in terms of trying to get an outcome. And, so, and I'm also aware that he does a lot behind the scenes to support a num to uh, make sure that things get done um, and, to help specific, and to help in a specific uh, way. And I thank him and recognise him very sincerely for that. I will recount one very short anecdote. I co probably could recount quite a lot, but a number of years ago we were on committees together and the, the Senator Judith Adams, who many in this place will uh, remember, um, she and I and a number of other people were on this inquiry. I wasn't there for this particular anecdote. So I'm repeat because I was in Darwin. They were travelling up from Catherine to Darwin. Um, Senator Ad all I, and, but I heard it straight after it happened because Senator Adams retold it several times when there was an in, um, a, there was a, an assault that was fortunately uh, interrupted. And there was a report. They waved down the car um, that Senator Scullion was in and Senator Adams was in. And the way Judith recounted it was Nigel climbed up onto the top of the car and then jumped down and went. Claire remembers it, I think, as well. Um, went pursuing uh, this particular person. And the way Judith recounted it, Nigel was just up, up, off the car, out, and and chased. The, the particular person involved, and we all then had to talk to the police um, and uh, recount that. Um, but Nigel, it, for me, that sort of was when Nigel sees something wrong, he he saw something wrong, and he went after, and and he he took action. Um, I will now turn to Senator Moore, who I have spent many many hours in committee with, and thoroughly a, endorse the comments that she made about the committee system, because I think she and I share very similar thoughts on the work of the committee system. Um, her work is unparalleled, her commitment is unparalleled in terms of working particularly for the most vulnerable um, people. I've seen the friendships that she has made um, with witnesses and with community organisations. I also will clear. I've worked with her in many um, committee inquiries, and the, and Claire mentioned the forced adoption inquiry. And I so remember Senator, former Senator Sue Boyce, Claire and I sitting in Alice Springs at another Senate hearing, on another Senate hearing, and us sitting down around a table during the lunch break, 
working on the. Do you remember that, Claire, when we were working on the forced adoption inquiry, and we were re we were coming all from the same perspective. For a, we were striving for a consensus report because that's one thing the Community Affairs Committee has strived over the years to do is get a consensus report. And Claire was an amazing contributor to that uh, inquiry and many, many other inquiries. The first inquiry I think I, I participated in with Senator Moore was the petrol sniffing inquiry, Community Affairs petrol sniffing in inquiry. And, uh, that the way, again, the way that that committee operated, Claire was chairing uh, the committee, and I, again, I, I think the outcomes of that committee inquiry significant, significantly contributed to the additional resources and funding that then that then went to addressing uh, petrol sniffing in the Northern Territory. Her community, uh, Claire's over, over the. Um, Work that Claire's doing on development issues and the Pacific, I particularly uh, am, am in awe of. She has again con consistently pursued uh, those issues and made an extremely significant contribution. I was here still when Claire was called. I was here when Claire was called purple. Um, do you remember Claire? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with George, and when George was. Uh, Whip, he would just say when he was naming, um, you know, going around, and I was up there counting quite often. Uh, you know, obviously when I was up there counting and George was counting, we were on opposite sides, and I'd hear George just say purple. And when you're reading out the names, for those of you that um, are listening, um, the whips have to read out names when we're counting, and George would read out uh, purple, and and. Um, Claire, I will always, always remember you associated with Purple, and that is because of the amazing work that you have done on women's issues, in particular. You have done an amazing job there, and you, you could, you were always there at whatever was going on in terms of for women's issues, and also when uh, this place, and I've said this so many times, was at its best, I think. Um, when we were working cross-party, when we were working on RU486 and stem cell debate, when the women really took control of this place and drove those outcomes. And so thank you, Claire, for all the work you have done. Dougie, Cameron, I will always remember Rabel, <laughs> and I love yelling that word across the <laughs> chamber whenever you start talking about the Rabel. You, again, you've brought a fierceness and a commitment to this place. No one can ever doubt your commitment to socialism. <laughs> and I loved seeing um, the people on the, uh, the, op the um, government senators on the opposite side of the chamber here, when you use that term here, um, your uh, commitment to uh, socials, social issues in particular and workers' rights um, is outstanding. The contribution you have made is outstanding. I've sometimes been on the end of your uh, quite. Um, yeah, okay, I'll use that word. Your quiet diplomacy. Yes, quiet diplomacy. Um, but I've never doubted the um, commitment that you have shown to the issues, um, to um, promoting those issues for the most vulnerable members of our community. We sometimes we disagree on approaches, but I've never doubted your commitment um, to the most vulnerable members of our um, of our community, and I'm sure that you'll continue um, to work on somehow on those issues. And I hope that you have a really wonderful time. I've I've, I've seen the photos of um, your um, where you where you're going to be living in Tasmania, your house, and I really hope that you have a a very good time down there. I'm not going to say retirement, um, because I'm sure that you'll be doing and being very active in your community um, in Tasmania. Thank you for all the years of your work. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to make a short contribution uh, to two colleagues that are leaving the chamber today and two colleagues that I will miss immensely. First, I'd like to start with my friend, 
Senator Claire Moore. Her contribution today was what we would expect of Claire. It was warm, it was inclusive and it was insightful. But there's so many contributions uh, that Claire has made over the years that she's been here that have contributed to, to lasting change. Senator Seawood and uh, Senator Wong have named a few. Forced adoption, and these are emotionally exacting um, inquiries. But the outcome and the thanks and the gratitude from those people that came and gave evidence to the outcomes and the recommendations that came forward in that forced adoption inquiry. And we should remember that that inquiry enlisted an apology from every state and territory and the Commonwealth. Every state and territory and the Commonwealth. The committee system works well, and the forced adoption inquiry shows that. Also, Claire was instrumental in the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse and Neglect of People with Disability. The number one recommendation being that there should be a Royal Commission, and at last we've seen that happen. But Claire was instrumental in that inquiry as well. And another inquiry that doesn't uh, get a lot of um, uh, People don't talk to about it very often. Is the inquiry into the living standards of people on pensions, yeah. which, which delivered the biggest ever increase to pensions delivered by the Rudd government, but put forward and and advocated for by Senator Claire Moore. So when I came here in the Senate, um, it's pretty it was pretty daunting. I, I was a previous Senate staffer, so I knew my way around it best as, if anyone knows me, I really don't know North and South and East and West, but I knew, sort of knew my way around. But it was very daunting. And the very friends that I made the first day I came here, former Senators Weber, and uh, Campbell and Senators Marshall and Moore were so they were sort of the breakfast club. I was sort of the you know the brunch club. I don't do breakfast very well, <laughs> but they have always been steadfast oh, in God. their support of me. And this is the thing about Claire. She doesn't just talk about mentoring and friendship and support. That's exactly what she gives, and that's and and it, it was evident in her speech tonight, where she took the opportunity to thank all the people that actually make this parliament work, all the people that make the Senate work, all the people that put together those wonderful reports that come to parliament that enact change. But that change only happens if you push it. It's tabled, then you have to go and advocate and push for that change to be implemented by government. That is what Senator Claire Moore does. She's always been a friend and mentor. I've always been able to go to Claire in confidence and talk about the issues that um, I need advice on, but also issues like all of us. You know, we want to. We want. We we want to know we're on the right track. We we want to you know talk about it, and her work in overseas development, disability and carers, um, the RU four eight six was. If you weren't here, it was an extremely stressful time, and I think. Claire, we might have only got it up by one vote. One in the Senate. And I think Senator Stephen Conroy might have helped us with that one. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we have some 
great wins. Claire has had some great wins. She has great victories that have changed the face of our parliament, but also the, fate, the, the direction of the nation. Um, she's been so supportive of women in parliament. She's been so supportive of Emily List, Emily's list, and she's never taken a backward step in support of women into parliament. She's a Labor warrior, a quiet one. I'm a bit like that myself. I don't mind, but it, she is a Labor warrior. And on our side, we're all Labor warriors. We just do it in our own way. So I, I really don't know what I'm going to do when she goes. You know, don't want to be presumptuous, but I'm hoping that I might be returned. But you know. I don't know what I'm going to do without my friend. But there has been so many contributions that Claire has made, and they've been acknowledged across the chamber for those that are leaving. Acknowledge Claire Moore's contributions as being thoughtful and incisive. And that basically sums up Claire Moore. She has a love for the Labor Party, she has a love for this parliament and she has a love for her family and friends. I'm going to miss her and I wish her well. I also would like to take a few minutes to talk about our other colleague, a more fiery colleague, and that is the wonderful uh, Senator Doug Cameron. Now, Sen the Senate's um, loss, the Parliament's loss, is obviously Tasmania's gain. <laughs> we are looking forward to uh, welcoming uh, Doug to the Tasmanian family, whether he likes it or not, or Elaine likes it or not. But from the very first time that I met Doug, it was obvious that he was here to make a difference. He was here to put forward the, the, the word of workers, the what workers need. He was here to hold the government to account. He didn't take a backward step on that, and neither should he. And I expect he would say that as well. Uh, his contributions, his, uh, his ability to articulate an argument is second to none. He has been a stalwart in the Labor movement, but also in ensuring that working class people are at the foremost of Labor Party policy and thinking. Doug has a special way about him. He, he doesn't take that backward step, but he has an extraordinary friendship across the aisle. And we heard today in his contribution, as he talked about his, contrib uh, his friendship with uh, Senator Wacker Williams, as everyone who knows Wacker um, uh, well, John, I think his real name is. I'm not Crap sure. Politics, good guy. <laughs> um, you know, I think I actually think Wacker has um, mellowed in the years since uh, Doug has been here. You know, a couple of more years, I reckon he would have crossed over to the Labor side. I think that's the the sort of influence that you had on him. But um, Doug um, and his love for the Labor Party, his love um, for the trade union movement, and his, his ability to always be able to stand up for what he believes in, stand up for the working uh, people of Australia, has been a wonderful contribution to this Senate and to this parliament. And again, 
we really what's going to happen after the 1st of July and when there's nobody here with that beautiful voice of his that beautiful voice that could really cut that cuts through everything that's going on um, it's it's a it's a sad day here today when we're saying good, goodbye to two loved and two senators that have made such an extraordinary contribution to the Senate, to the Parliament, but more importantly to the Labor Party policy direction. I know, knowing both of them, that that's not going to stop, and heaven help Tasmania. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wish you well, Doug, and I wish Elaine well. I'm looking forward to the housewarming party, um, and I hope in the last few days um, that you still, because you do estimates, of course, we won't um, let you get out of that. Um, uh, I just hope that everything that you wish for into the future is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Brown. Senator McAllister. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Pre Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make a few brief remarks, and I hope, given the hour, I will keep them brief. And I hope that my brevity uh, isn't mistaken for a lack of interest or care, because there's actually a lot to say about the people who, uh, about whom we're having the valedictories this evening. Um, I will be very brief about Nigel because Nigel and I, of course, have had a Senator Scullion and I have had very significant political differences. But uh, he has approached that task of um, responding to the aspirations and hopes of First Nations people with integrity and sincerity, and that has always been obvious. I do want to also thank him for something very particular, which is that just recently I took to him a problem, uh, which was the problem of uh, the Charities Commissioner Gary Johns repudiating Welcome to Country as a practice in that institution. I thought that was disgraceful and unfortunately consistent with that Commissioner's other repugnant views. Nigel was straight on it, repudiated it and took him on because he wasn't willing to allow those ideas uh, to stand uncontested uh, on his watch as Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Claire Moore, Senator Moore, uh, came here. She'd been a leader in her own union and she'd been a national leader in the Labor Party. And then she served in our national parliament. And the speech that she gave this evening reflects all that she brought to this parliament. She's determined always to play the ball and not the man or the woman, and the cricket pun is intended, even though I know nothing about cricket beyond those core facts. Uh, she brought a passion, has brought a passion for justice. She has advocated always for feminism and for women's interests, and she is totally committed to the practice of democracy, deep practice, not just once every three years at election time, but through meaningful engagement between the parliament and the communities that we serve. And Claire, the women of the Labor Party in particular, observe your quiet leadership style and thank you for the example that you've provided here. I finally want to talk about my fellow New South Wales Senator, uh, Doug, as he made uh, has made no secret over time that he comes from the left tradition in the New South Wales Party, and so do I. And he mentioned some of the um, the members of that tradition here in the Senate: Senator Murphy, Senators Murphy, Childs, Geetzelt, Faulkner, and Campbell. And Doug has totally lived up to the example set by those people, those senators: a tradition of speaking truth even when it is uncomfortable, of consistency in advocating for values, and. Doug has been all of those things and more. I wanted to talk just briefly this evening about what he's meant for the progressive people in that tradition in New South Wales and nationally. Because Doug has pursued many causes, but none is dearer to Doug's heart than the cause of working people. And in his political engagement, he's been so important in articulating what that means for Labor. He has articulated at an intellectual level the political significance of solidarity 
and the working class politics and working class politics and representation. He has made the policy case for action in so many domains to support working class people. And at some deep and personal level, he has articulated and communicated the inherent dignity of every working person and, even more importantly, the significance and meaning of collective action in realising that dignity. I will really miss Doug. Uh, the branch members and trade unionists of New South Wales will really miss him. We have been so proud to have him represent us and we wish him and Elaine the very best uh, in Tasmania. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Canahan. Canahan. Uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, too will be brief, um, but wanted to place on record some comments about uh, my great mate, uh, Senator Nigel Scallion. Uh, as we've heard tonight, Nigel's um, been a fisherman, a shooter, uh, uh, industry representative, uh, uh, a, uh, a mango farmer, a senator, a family man. Um, and so, in my view, in many respects, tonight we are losing more than just a senator. We're losing uh, a number of people all at once rolled into one, uh, because he's got to bring such diversity to this place uh, that he, he 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 brings something that not one person can can replace. Uh, he has been a fantastic leader uh, of the Nationals Party in the Senate here. He is one of only three Country Liberal Party senators in the Senate's history, uh, and in fact, uh, according to my research. I must admit, down here on Wikipedia, while well, I've been sitting here, uh, he is the um, third longest serving uh, Indigenous Affairs Minister in our nation's history as well. And in fact, it's a bit of a dead heat. Jenny Macklin, uh, uh, Miss, Miss Jenny Macklin beat, beats him by about 100 days, and uh, Robert Tickner was, was uh, Indigenous Affairs Minister for a couple of hundred extra days. So he's in quite a pantheon there, uh, and he's left a large legacy. I just want to focus on two things that I've seen Nigel do and achieve. Uh, as a senator, uh, one focuses on that portfolio uh, that he has led uh, ably for the last five years with a great passion uh, to help and advance the interests of first Australians. And he will leave a legacy, in my view, after those five and a half years, a legacy uh, of the focus he has put on delivering practical results for first Australians in school attendances, uh, in employment participation, in training, and something that perhaps doesn't get focused on enough but I think is the real future task for future Indigenous Affairs Ministers in this country is to support and develop the business capability and capacity of Indigenous communities. And Nigel, in the last couple of years, has revolutionised government procurement in respect of Indigenous Affairs, taken our Commonwealth Government's procurement with the Indigenous Affairs companies from only a few million dollars a year to hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Uh, and I think that is something that future governments can ably build on. I also hope and promote in my space and the resources space is something that businesses uh, can take more seriously as well, uh, because while well, I often comment that the resources sector uh, is by far uh, the greatest employer of Indigenous Australians and certainly contributed in the last 15 years uh, to their advancement greatly, uh, uh, it could, of course, uh, always do better. And one area to do better is to engage more Indigenous businesses. Also, to help promote, I want to see more Indigenous Australians in executive positions in mining companies as well. Maybe run, maybe it would be great to have an Indigenous Australians run one of our major mining companies which operate in their communities in the future. Um, uh, and if that is achieved, a lot of what Nigel has started, I think, will be the reason for it. The other thing I want to focus on is how Nigel just stood up for the little guy. He just, you know, he, he, he is a fighter, he's a natural fighter, he doesn't walk away from a fight, uh, uh, and so it doesn't matter who it is. It uh, can be the, the I've had great fun uh, with Nigel um, fighting and defending the interests of fishermen, of, um, of uh, live cattle industry, often within our own coalition. There's some tension sometimes, and, and uh, Nigel's just always willing to be there on the front line, and it's been a pleasure to be there with him. I just want to relay one quick story, one of my favourite little battles, which is a small one. In the scheme of things, but but shows that you know we, we the Nationalist Party will take up any fight, however much of a lost cause it is, um, because it was the right cause. And Nigel was very worked up about an impending ban that was going to be placed on the importation of uh, of, of line trophies of line heads into Australia. Now again, most people would think, well, look, that shouldn't happen. Why should we do that? Uh, uh, why should we allow that? Uh, well, without going through the details, those those 
those trophies are actually incredibly important revenue source for poor African countries. Uh, Nigel cogently put the case that, in fact, they also uh, are also very important in helping uh, breed uh, lions uh, when well regulated. He only supported the well regulated uh, hunting of uh, of lions, and, and in Australia, there's only about a dozen of them coming every year. But he was fighting for them. Uh, we, we didn't win that battle, but we did uh, have some fun and, and achieve some other things through it, uh, through the battle. We, didn't, we sort of lost the war, but won a few battles along the way. And uh, it was particularly brutal. It was, it was over a small thing. You know, it, was, it wasn't a big, a big issue. It didn't hit the headlines or anything like that. But, but it was quite, I suppose, because sometimes when the stakes are smaller, you know, the passion gets higher and uh, people get more worked up. So it was quite a, an emotional couple of weeks. And uh, at the end of one of the weeks, we were having a beer down at the Kingston Hotel. And I think it was Barry, uh, Senator Sullivan, suggested that we should get uh, Minister Hunt, who was the relevant minister, some kind of peace offering uh, that um, we should, we should you know, uh, get over these last, these last fractious couple of weeks of discussions. And he suggested, I think, a stuffed lion toy. And so I thought that was a great idea, a smashing idea. And, I, and I, so I suggested, no, well, let's go one step better. Let's chop the lion's head off, the stuff, stuff, a lot of stuff, lion toy, and, and mount it and present that to, to Minister Hunt. So uh, we now have Cecil uh, in, in our office as a, as a tribute, as a trophy, uh, to those fights that Nigel has taken up. Uh, the, the, the trophy artist did a fantastic job. But I, I've, I will miss uh, having those, uh, having those uh, fights on behalf of people that otherwise wouldn't get a voice in this place. Uh, with Senator Scullion. Uh, he's been a great uh, contributor to the history of the Nationals Party in this place. Uh, he will, I'm sure, uh, have a fantastic retirement uh, with his family in pursuing his interests, uh, not being told what to do, uh, which is what he likes. And it was great to see tonight that uh, I didn't think I'd actually live to see the day I saw Senator Nigel Scullion break down in the Senate, but uh, it showed where his heart really lies and where he can now find time and solace. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Well, tonight it is a great uh, honour to pay tribute to two wonderful colleagues in Senator Claire Moore and Senator Doug Cameron. Senator Moore, the visibility you've given to so many uh, issues in this place and through the parliament and through committees is a role model not only to me but a great many other people in the labour movement and in the community. It is an enormous legacy that I and many others will never forget. I've seen the way that it has been guided by solid principles uh, that belong in our party of social inclusion, but really importantly, community empowerment and empowering the voices of those who aren't heard. Underneath all of that is a framework that's deeply embedded in feminism, and you are a great custodian of that in our party. It is a banner that is passed on intergenerationally uh, within our movement. And when I think of you, I think not only of great women in the labour movement, but when you spoke of suffragettes in your first speech, I very much think of you as a modern day suffragette, Claire. Um, you see that in your experience in navigating pro-choice uh, debates in this place as a feminist vanguard, when all the rules kind of get broken for how this place normally conducts its business, and you are sharp as a tack and eye on the ball on that every time. You've been a key part of creating a force and culture of sisterhood in the Labor Party uh, that goes through Emily's list, but also transcends right through feminist communities right around uh, Australia. So I really don't think that you know, it's impossible to do justice to your legacy in a very short uh, remarks tonight, but I really want to say thank you for that custodianship, for the values that I and so many hold dear, not only in the Labor Party, but in feminist movements right around Australia and globally. Um, it seems strange to me that Doug won't be here uh, uh, after the election. His vigour and talent has been a real driving force in this place. I noticed him in, my formative, uh, in the formation of my affiliation and attachment to the AMW 
where both Jock Ferguson and Doug Cameron had unintelligible Scottish accents. But I learnt from them a great deal uh, of what it means to show courage and solidarity uh, in the face of ad adversity. Um, it was terrific to be on the same side as Doug in debates, sometimes when you had your back against the wall. But ultimately, even though at those times, you know, whether it was the ABCC or other things where we lost internal votes, the influence and uh, reliability of the positions that Doug took always had a lasting impact on the ultimate outcomes that have been achieved in our movement. His stamp on vocational education and training, housing, the policies we're taking into the election uh, is very clear. So I want to say to both Claire and Doug, you both embody so much of what we are fighting for on this side of the chamber and fighting for at the next election, uh, and you will be a motivating force uh, in the weeks to come and always in the future. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator William, uh, Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too would like to stand to respond to the valedictory speeches by the three senators here this evening, beginning firstly with uh, my colleagues, uh, Senator Moore and Senator Cameron. I'd like to just reflect, Madam Deputy uh, President, Acting Deputy President, that uh, I first had the opportunity of meeting uh, Claire with my son, and at the time he was about three years of age. And I attended an Emily's List uh, conference in uh, Brisbane. Uh, it might have been actually out of Brisbane. I can't quite recall. Yep. And it was uh, certainly just a long way from home for me and, and my little boy. Um, I, at that time, had been introduced uh, to Claire through uh, the previous senator, uh, Senator Trish Crossan, uh, also who represented the Northern Territory uh, for 15 years here in the Senate. And I just want to uh, place on the public record um, the fine example, Claire, that you've provided to, to women coming into the parliament, but in particular into the Labor Party, uh, to women who uh, have been unsure about taking that political step, uh, asking questions as, as young mums if that's something that they can do, uh, wondering if you can make a difference uh, in, on such a large scale. And in that particular time, I was uh, standing for the Northern Territory Parliament. And my son is uh, now just about to celebrate his 21st year. So um, I would have to say that uh, I look at that time with fond memories when you reflect on someone who's, uh, who's influenced your life at different moments. And you've certainly uh, been one of those people. To then come into the Senate and work beside you uh, on Senate committees, but also to, to see the diligence in which you'd bring to the Senate uh, in the thoroughness of committee work, uh, in the examination of issues and questions, uh, is an enormous credit to the Australian Parliament. And I just want to say, in terms of First Nations people, thank you for the work that you have done even prior to my arrival, certainly here, in terms of First Nations issues, uh, bringing it always to the fore in terms of the Australian Labor Party caucus, but also here in the Senate. And whilst now we may have a First Nations caucus, I know that uh, we don't get to these places without having had people before us uh, pave that path. And I just want to say on behalf of First Nations people, thank you. Thank you for that. To Senator Doug Cameron, um, what can I say about Dougie? An absolute legend, absolute legend. Uh, to, to know that you're coming into the Senate to work beside people of Doug's calibre uh, is extraordinarily humbling, really. Uh, I've certainly uh, grown up in a different kind of place with different experiences uh, in the north, 
and value greatly learning and listening to people like Senator Doug Cameron. And that passion, and yes, I think as Senator Birmingham said, you know, the warrior in Senator Cameron has been something that uh, has inspired uh, so many of us uh, coming into political office, not just here in the Senate, but right around the country as Australian Labor Party members. Uh, his fight for workers and for fairness and for a fair go uh, in the trade unions and for ordinary Australians uh, has just been an enormous credit not only to this parliament but to the Australian families right across this country who benefited uh, from the powerful passion of this man who made Australia home. And I think we are enormously blessed to have people who travel across the seas to make this country home to then find that they stand in the highest offices in this country thinking of others and other families. So, Doug, to you and Elaine, lovely Elaine, uh, who I also had the pleasure uh, over the last couple of years to get to know, and again uh, with my son uh, one Saturday morning uh, here in Canberra to have breakfast and catch up with you guys and see, uh, see hopefully, uh, your new home in Tassie. Madam Acting Deputy President, I come now to my colleague of the Northern Territory, uh, Senator Nigel Scullion. And I was thinking that uh, you know, he came in in 2001, and at the time I was working for the ABC. And I remember being uh, one of the many reporters uh, doing the stories in relation to uh, Senator Nigel Scullion, or then Nigel Scullion, the fisherman, who'd put his hand up for the Senate. And I remember, it's interesting what you remember, isn't it, when you reflect on things? And I remember that mad dash this fisherman had to make across the seas to the UK. And I remember in the newsrooms, we all thought, oh, gee, what's going on? And that was the introduction, I guess, to, the, to understanding the importance of making sure we all know our backgrounds before we come into the Senate. And it's interesting to see that over the last few years, in particular of this term, uh, that that is, uh, has been one of the major issues of our parliament. Uh, I certainly uh, feel as though uh, my time in working with Senator Scullion here in the Senate, uh, combative as though it has been, based on ideology, has always, in my view, uh, largely remained respectful. And I just want to point out that it is tough. It is tough in this country uh, to try to think you have the answers to dealing with the issues of First Nations people. And listening to uh, Nigel tonight, uh, and certainly to others, but knowing him through the different processes that we've had to, in particular the estimates process, there is no doubting whatsoever the passion of this man in wanting to stand up for First Nations people in this country. And there is no doubting the commitment of this man to the people of the Northern Territory. And it is the people of the Northern Territory that we stand here together for over these three years, and it's only my three years in the Senate. And I recall a time when we sat, I think it was on that side of the House, where Nigel sat with me and he looked across over here and he saw most of uh, his colleagues sitting on this side. And what was that vote that he sat with me on? It was on territory rights. It was on territory rights. And I said to him, how are you feeling? He goes, oh, this, is a, this wasn't a tough one to do in terms of knowing where he had to sit. But it obviously had other ramifications as well. But again, that's the testament of the man. And he knew that he had to stand or sit on that side in terms of supporting territory rights for the people of the Northern Territory. And we do battle it out, and we are combative, but they are over policies and ideology on how we get there. But I never doubt, and still have never doubted, uh, the passionate commitment that he has towards the people of the Northern Territory. You only have to look at a person's maiden speech, and I have looked at Niger's speech, 
and you can see the journey that he's come and his views and interpretations of First Nations people and what has moulded and shaped him. They're not my views, but I respect the fact, and I can see from where he has tried to come from, to make a difference for First Nations people. There are major policy separations and differences that we have. And no doubt, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to go out there and be combative again. But I just want to say to, to Nigel and to Carol in particular, Carol, who actually worked for me when I was a minister in the Northern Territory government, his wife Carol actually worked as my legal adviser on different moments when I was a minister in the Northern Territory. So I think we go back a, a long way, Nigel. And to you and Carol, I sincerely wish you every, every happiness beyond the election and every blessings to you and your family. Um, and I guess on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory, it's a real commitment to travel on that plane <laughs> and get down here, travel the thousands of kilometres, not just from the Northern Territory here to Canberra, but obviously in your role as Minister right across the country, and you have been right across the country. I guess you won't have to make those trips anymore. This Senate doesn't understand that two senators have to cover such a vast area of coastline, of country. And hopefully one day we can become the seventh state in the Federation. And Nigel, I hope you can come back from your piggy hunting and your shooting out there and your fishing and maybe join us to make sure that there's still unfinished business for the Territory, that we do become the seventh state in the Federation, that we do have more senators who can represent the people of the Northern Territory so that we have the numbers in here to make the very real democratic difference that we know we need to make for equality for the people of the North. So, Carol and Nigel, all the best to you and your families. And Nigel, I'll see you out on the hustings. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Williams. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I just rise. I'll be brief to just say a few words to, of thanks in order of the speeches tonight. Senator Nigel Scullion, my leader in the Senate, my mate, my good friend, Senator McCarthy said it well when you can never question his commitment, his passion, his loyalty to our first Australians, and that's been a, probably the, the greatest legacy you'll leave here. I'll tell you a little story, Madam Acting Deputy President. About six years ago, we had a National Party function in, in Tamworth. Nigel was guest speaker, and he flew into Tamworth, and a taxi picked him up at the uh, Tamworth airport. Now, driving off, and typical Nigel, how are you, mate? The taxi driver says, oh, good, thanks. Where are you from? He said, Darwin, mate. The taxi driver said, Darwin? Oh, Darwin, he said, about 15 years ago, up there fishing in the Gulf in our boat. And he said, we ran out of petrol and the sun's going down and we're drifting towards the rocks. We're in real trouble. And I got on the radio and I said, does anyone hear me? And this bloke's come back and said, yeah, I can hear you. He said, we're in trouble. We're, we're in a spot here and we've run out of petrol. We're running, drifting towards the rocks. The driver said, and I was just Mad young fella come out in this 12 foot tinny going flat out with a drum of petrol. Poor Din got us going. We were so grateful. And Nigel said, Yeah, and I only had a pair of shorts on. I was freezing cold too, watch more. So here they were 20 years later, the blokes that Nigel saved when he got the radio message and took the petrol out and got them going it was a taxi driver in Tamworth and they met again. How coincidental. But you've been a great friend, Nigel, a great leader, and to you and Carol. And the kids, we wish you all the best in your retirement. Thanks for your contribution to our nation. To Senator Clare Moore, Clare, haven't had a lot to do with you on committee work. We did some committee work together. But where we teamed up most of all was in defence of our friends from Iran. Mohammed and Sayest are lovely people when they fled Iran and their friends and relatives who were trapped there in Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty. And we teamed up to say, give them a go, get them out of there. And finally, they all got out of there safe and well. Not all of them. Some were bombed, killed, shot, punished. It was a terrible situation. And luckily, uh, I was glad to have both Mohammed and Sayesta here at my valedictory. They're lovely people, and Claire, I was glad to team up for you in defence of the rights and the treatment of so many Iranians. And I hope that changes in the future. Well done, Claire. You're a thorough, you're a thorough lady, is the way I sum you up. Enjoyed a trip to Fiji with you, one of the, uh, the, the tours over there, my, my wife Nancy as well with you. 
We went to Mass and enjoyed the singing so much. Those Pacific Islanders are so good at their singing. It's, you'd pay money to hear them sing. It's, it's just wonderful. Now to my mate, Senator Cameron. Well, he told a few things tonight. He didn't tell one job he used to do. He was a pump salesman. But I can't go into that because it's a secret. Perhaps a journalist might ask him one day. But Dougie and I came in together in a 2008 class. Political opposites. You can't get two more political opposites than Doug Cameron and me, I can assure you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We, we became good mates. We worked together. The ASIC inquiry was Dougie's idea. We brought out so much wrongdoing in the financial planning, etc. Hopefully those days are behind us and the right thing is being done in the future. But I worked with Dougie when we put the memorial up for the workers' memorial. Those people are killed at work. Sadly, a young fellow yesterday, 18 years old, scaffolding collapsed and he lost his life. That was one of Dougie's passions. I was glad to work with him as we picked the design of the memorial, and that was, that's one of Dougie's legacy. But he's a ruthless attacker. Even his valedictory speech, he's still playing politics and attacking us. Something I didn't do, I just said thanks to everyone else. But Dougie can't help himself. He's got to go for the jugular vein for us all the time. But he does it in a way where I think the most important thing is, as soon as I say goodbye, probably my last words in this place. It's like a game of football. Play it hard on the field. When you get off the field, go and have a beer and your mates. That's how the Senate should always be. Play your hard game in here. When you walk out, we work together on committees and we're friends. So can I say to Nigel, Carol, Claire, all the best to you. Thank you for your wonderful long contribution. You're a very much respected lady in this place. And to Doug and Elaine, all the best to you in your retirement. I hope you have a good time down in Tasmania. Look out, Tasmania. Trouble's coming your way. Not with Elaine, but with Dougie. But he's a good bloke. You know where he stands all the time, even though he stands way opposite to me in politics. But I think the good thing with the Senate is we can work together. As Claire, you highlighted today, the committee work here achieves so much for our country. I hope it works together in the future parliaments ahead. I wish you all well. Thank you, Senator Williams. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I will keep this brief because uh, the accolades for Claire Moore have been well and truly uh, shared with the Chamber this evening. But I'm sure I speak for many of those coalition senators, Claire, uh, who are not here this evening. Uh, Sunday marked the seventh anniversary of the passing of uh, the former senator, Judith Adams. Uh, and I remember sitting on the other side of the chamber uh, when I, shortly after I was sworn in and you were sitting on this side of the chamber and hearing your contributions about Judith's contributions. Uh, and in that very early moment, instant, uh, I got a sense of the deep interest, compassion but genuine desire you have for improving the livelihoods of many, many people. Yeah. Uh, I know that if former Senator Sue Boyce was here, uh, she would be also applauding the contribution that you have made. Uh, the Senate is probably one of the most poorly understood institutions in our country, uh, and in it, the committee system, very, very poorly understood, uh, most particularly amongst our House of Representatives colleagues sometimes. Uh, and you and I have participated on inquiries, not just on the Community Affairs Committee, uh, but also on the Joint Human Rights Committee when I was the chairman. Um, uh, testing the boundaries of joint parliamentary committees and their work and pushing the boundaries against executive government. Um, but on behalf of all coalition senators that have worked with you, that have joined uh, in the contributions that you have made, uh, can I extend our deepest ap appreciation. Uh, your contribution has already reverberated through this building and through this country, and I'm sure it will continue to do so in decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Are there any further contributions on the valedictories of Senators Moores, Cameron and Scullion? No. Senators, in accordance with the variation of the routine of business agreed to this morning, I now put the questions required to dispose of the remaining bills. I will begin with the Treasury Laws Amendment North Queensland Flood Recovery Bill 2019. The question, uh, oh, sorry, the Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, for the information of the Chamber, I table explanatory memoranda and a second reading speech relating to bills listed for consideration today. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Clark, just, okay, I will, uh, so I begin with the Treasury Laws Amendment North Queensland Flood Recovery Bill of 2019. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. All those in favour? Aye. Against? That's carried. Uh, the, uh, Clark? 
a bill for an act to make provision in relation to certain aspects of flood and storm related assistance and for related purposes. The question now is that the, the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and that this bill is now passed. All those in favour? Aye. Against? That is carried. Oh, I've called the clerk. A bill for an act to make provision in relation to certain aspects of flood and storm related assistance and for related purposes. I now turn to the Governor General Amendment Salary Bill of 2019. Uh, the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 8677 circulated by Darren Hinch's Justice Party be agreed to. Uh, the question now, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Senator Hinch. Um, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to make a short statement, a very short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, Senator Hinch. Leave is not granted. Did you, did you leave? Yes. You have one minute, Senator Hinch. Thank you very much. Thank you. We all know why former Governor General Peter Hollingworth was uh, forced to resign in 2003. His repeated misconduct and handling allegations of sexual abuse is well documented and was again brought to light during the Royal Commission. It is just common sense that a government appointed, not elected official who is forced to resign due to serious misconduct should not then go on to receive a pension worth millions of dollars in retirement at the taxpayer's expense. My amendment enables the parliament to consider such cases and, if appropriate, they can put a stop to it. Thank you, Senator Hinch. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet uh, 8677 circulated by the Justice Party be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. All those against? No. Uh, I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Really? The hinge. No, there was two. There were two voices. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
block the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 8677 circulated by Darren Hinch's Justice Party be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Hinch, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ketter, teller for the noes. There being 13 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. All that, all that opinion say aye. aye. All those say, uh, against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Governor-General Act of 1974 and for related purposes. The question now is that the amendment on sheet 8675, circulated by Darren Hinch's Justice Party, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. I think the noes have it. I only had one voice. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment on sheet 8675, circulated by Darren Hinch's Justice Party, be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Hinch, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ketter, teller for the noes.
Thank you. There being 13 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and that the bill now be passed. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Governor General Act 1974 and for related purposes. I now turn to the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Amendment Bill of 2019. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a first time. The question is that this bill now be read a first time. All those in favour? Against? I think the ayes have it. Uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act 2018 and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill now be passed. All those in favour? Uh, against? That's carried. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act 2018 and for related purposes. I now turn to the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Amendment Support for Infrastructure Financing Bill of 2019. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. All those in favour? Aye. Against? That's carried. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Oh, can I recommit the vote? Uh, all those in favour? Against? Division required? I think, the no, I think the ayes have it. That's one voice. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. The ayes will move to the right of the chamber, the lows to the left. I appoint Senator Williams, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seward, teller for the noes.
the surface. Don't like this spot. It's too busy. There being 35 ayes and 11 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Thank you. Uh, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Act 1991 and for related purposes. The question now is that the amendments on sheets 8673 and 8674 circulated by Senator Storer be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. The question now is that the amendments on sheets 8653, 8676, and 8678, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. All of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question. The question. The, Senator Storer. Well, I, I've considered the legislation. Senator Storer, are you I've, seeking leave? Please, sir, put on record my support of the Greens amendments. Thank you, Senator Thank Storer. You. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill now be passed. All of, those, all of that opinion say aye. aye. All of those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and the bill now be passed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith Teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt Teller for the noes.
There being 35 ayes and 11 noes, the, uh, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Export a bill for oh, next. Sorry, Senator Patrick. Forgive me, clerk. Before we move to the next bill, um, Chair, I, I wish to um, put on the record that uh, Senator Alliance would, uh, uh, was in support of uh, the Greens' uh, amendment on sheet 8678. Thank you, Senator Late Patrick. Chair, Thank I you. call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation Act 1991 and for related purposes. I now turn to the Treasury Laws Amendment Mutual Reforms Bill 2019. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That is carried. The question now is that the remaining. Oh, so, sorry, forgive me. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to mutual entities and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill is now passed. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to mutual entities and for related purposes. I turn now to the Treasury Laws Amendment Making Sure Foreign Investors Pay Their Fair Share of Tax in Australia and Other Measures Bill 2019. The Income Tax Managed Investment Trust Withholding Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and the Income Tax Rates Amendment Sovereign Entities Bill of 2018. The question is that these bills now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. Treasury Laws Amendment Making Sure Foreign Investors Pay Their Fair Share of Tax in Australia and Other Measures Bill 2019, Income Tax Managed Investment Trust Withholding Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and Income Tax Rates Amendment Sovereign Entities Bill 2018. In relation to the Treasury Laws Amendment making sure foreign investors pay their fair share of tax in Australia now the Measures Bill of 2019, the question now is that the amendment on sheet 8586, revised, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills now be passed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Treasury Laws Amendment making sure foreign investors pay their fair share of tax in Australia and other measures bill 2019. Income Tax Managed Investment Trust Withholding Tax Amendment Bill 2018 and Income Tax Rates Amendment Sovereign Entities Bill 2018. I now turn to the Corporations Amendment Strengthening Protections for Employee Entitlements Bill 2018. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Corporation, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to protecting employee, employee entitlements and for related purposes. The question now is that the amendments on sheet SH108, circulated by the government, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill now be passed. All, of those, of that, all those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes, ha the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to protecting employee, employee entitlements and for related purposes. I now turn to the Treatment Benefits Special Access Bill of 2019 and the Treatment Benefits Special Access Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill of 2019. The question is that these bills now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Treatment Benefits Special Access Bill 2019 and Treatment Benefits Special Access Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills now be passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. 
Treatment Benefits Special Access Bill 2019 and Treatment Benefits Special Access Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. I now turn to the Criminal Code Amendment Sharing Abhorrent Violent Material Bill of 2019 and I call the Minister. I present the bill and move that it be now read a first time. The question is that the bill now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. Oh, Senator, sorry, clerk. Senator Spender. Bill. Spender, you, yes. I'm sorry. Thank you. I call the clerk. Oh, Senator Spender. What bill? The one that I just read out, Senator Spender, the Criminal Code Amendment Sharing of Abhorrent Violent Material Bill of 2019, and the one that the Minister just spoke upon. Thank you, Senator Spender. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 and for related purposes. Uh, the question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to, and the bill. Uh, Senator Di Natale. I know you're frustrated, but we're more frustrated than you are, Madam Deputy President. I it's understand. thanks to your party that we're being asked to ram through this legislation Senator, at a rate of sorry, knots. Senator Di Natale. So, so if you're, going to, if you're going to express your frustration, express it at Senator your Di Natale, colleagues. Are you, express it at your me, colleagues. Excuse me, Senator Di Natale, not at us. are you seeking leave? I am seeking leave to move a Seat motion. Leave is denied, to Senator refer Di Natale. So please resume your seat, Senator Di Natale. Senator, please resume your seat. Thank you. The question now is that the remaining stage of this bill be agreed to and this bill now be passed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 and for related purposes. I now turn to the Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management and Cashless Welfare Bill of 2019. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for concurrence, and I call the Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a first time. The question now is that the bill be read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Uh, the question now is that the amendments on sheet 8666 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Senator McAllister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move the amendments to opposition amendments on sheet 8682 as circulated in the chamber. Is leave, leave granted? Uh, Clark, where am I going to after this? You're moving the amendments? Thank you. The question is that the amendments to the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. no. Senator Seward. As far as I'm aware, I just heard Senator Fifield, I'm sorry if I missed it, read this a first time. It has not been read a second time. Their second you didn't put the second reading question. No. Did I? This is a Senator Seward, a second reading amendment is, is not required because the bill is under a guillotine. It wasn't required because debate is guillotined. So the question is that the amendments to the amendments be agreed to. All of those that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the amendments as amended now be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the amendment amendments on have I eight, skip skip that one. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and that the bill now be passed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. A division required. Ring, 
ring the bells for one minute. Hello. Pass. Lock the doors. I thank Senator Hume. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 40, noes 10. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. I now turn to the Treasury Laws Amendment Design and Distribution Obligations and Product Intervention Powers Bill 2019. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a first time. The question is the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to corporations and consumer credit protection and for related purposes. The question now is that the amendment on sheet 8571 revised, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. Um, Senator Spender. We haven't had the second reading. Why are we moving an amendment? Uh, so, as the clerk advised Senator Hume when she was previously in the chair, because these bills are under a guillotine, we proceed straight to um, the substantive matters. So, the question now is that the amendment on sheet 8571 revised, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to corporations and consumer credit protection and for related purposes. 
I now turn to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Petroleum Resource Rent Tax Reforms No. 1 Bill 2019. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to petroleum resource rent tax and for related purposes. The question now is that the amendment on sheet 8665, circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Sorry, Senator Spender. Are there any One Nation senators to move that? Um, I just asked the clerk this, uh, whether someone needed to be present to move it, and I was told that is not the case because we're operating under the guillotine. So they've been circulated, so they're deemed to have been moved. I've been informed. So the question is that the amendment on sheet 8665, circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The question now is that item 14 of Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 stand as printed. These are Australian Greens amendments 1 on sheet 8669 and 1 on sheet 8664. Senator Wish Wilson. Order, order of order, Mr. President. That's $323 billion. Senator Wish Wilson, resume your seat. Resume your seat. You know full well that is an inappropriate use of a prop. That the question now is, I will read the matter again. The question now is that item for Senator Dinatale, I'm putting your amendments to the vote. Order. So the question now is that item 14 of Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 stand as printed. These are Australian Greens Amendments 1 on sheet 8669 and 1 on sheet 8664. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the remaining amendments on sheet eight, sheets 8669 and 8664 and the amendments on sheets 8662 and 8663, circulated by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to petroleum resource rent tax and for related purposes. I now turn to the Customs Tariff Amendment Craft Beer Bill 2019. A number of people may like this. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for, for concurrence. The Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. I now turn to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 1 Bill 2019 and the Excise Tariff Amendment Supporting Craft Brewers Bill 2019. I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding these bills for concurrence. Minister. Uh, I move that these bills be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that these bills be taken together and be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation, taxation, corporations, financial services, consumers, competition and statistics and for related purposes. Excise tariff amendment supporting craft brewers bill 2019. 
The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I now turn. Oh, sorry, Clark. Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 1 Bill 2019 and Excise Tariff Amendment Supporting Craft Brewers Bill 2019. I now turn to the Australian Business Securitisation Fund Bill 2019. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to establish the Australian Business Securitisation Fund and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to establish the Australian Business Securitisation Fund and for related purposes. I will now turn to the motion listed in subsection 1C of the order agreed to this morning. And I, sorry, Senator Smith. Mr. President, just to um, indicate that uh, I would like the division bells rung for four minutes. I will do that on this particular matter. I will call Senator Farrell to move his motion. Senator Farrell. I so move. The question is that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Farrell, relating to the disallowance of item four of the Parliamentary Business Resources Amendment 2019 measures number one, regulations 2019, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ketter teller for the ayes and Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. We now move to the next item of business and I will call the clerk. Budget statement and documents 2019-20, resumption of debate. I'll let senators take their seat before I call you, Senator Di Natale. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, on the eve of this latest budget being handed down, Australia's Bureau of Meteorology confirmed that this has been the hottest quarter on record. We are all staring down the biggest threat humanity has ever faced, and this budget pretends it doesn't exist. No wonder people are angry and fed up with politics. They're crying out for leadership, for a clear plan to tackle the climate breakdown and transition us to a renewable economy, one that exports clean energy to the world instead of climate-damaging coal. They want to know that we've got a plan to look after people, those people who work in the coal industry, because they understand this transition is inevitable. They want a plan for jobs right across the country that are at risk from climate change caused by the mining, burning and exporting of coal. They want a plan for farmers, for tourism operators, people, workers, people working in construction, hospitality and emergency services. But this budget is not planning for their future. Instead, environment funding has hit rock bottom. As Australia's animal extinction crisis, the worst in the entire world, accelerates. Their electric vehicles offering is an embarrassment, and the handout to big polluters continue. This budget was an opportunity to protect our climate, our jobs, our farmlands and all the precious places we love to fight for the Murray-Darling and the Great Barrier Reef and all of those communities who rely upon them. But this budget does none of these things, because this is a government that is totally lacking in vision and leadership. Their only plan is for their re-election, a cynical attempt to buy a few votes with election bribes instead of planning for this nation's future. It is verging on the criminal 
that the Liberals have budgeted just $189 million over the next four years to deal with the climate crisis the Bureau of Meteorology is telling us is already here. Meanwhile, over the coming four years, the next Australian government, whether it be Liberal or Labor, will spend 174 times that amount to subsidise the burning of fossil fuels. A staggering $33 billion is set aside in the budget papers to underwrite the burning of our planet. Money is going from people's hard-earned wages into the offshore accounts of polluting corporations set up in elaborate tax havens. This is nothing short of a betrayal of future generations. It's a betrayal because there is no economic strength, there is no hope for economic resilience without a safe climate. We should have no expectation of continued economic prosperity if we continue to destroy the life system that sustains us. Both the Reserve, the Reserve Bank and, the, and Australia's prudential regulator are telling us very frankly, very clearly, that Australia's economy is dangerously exposed. They've made it clear that we've got two big problems ahead. First, our economy is skewed towards carbon-intensive investments. We're an emissions-intensive economy and global capital is already moving to lower emissions countries because they have less carbon risk. Across our economy, investments are exposed to dramatic price revaluations and stranded assets as the world moves on without us. Secondly, our agricultural and tourism exports are on the front, light, front line of climate change impacts. These crucially important industries have the most to lose from the breakdown of our climate system, destroying the crops and livelihoods, ruining those beautiful places that bring millions of visitors to our shores each year. From our temperate rainforests in Tasmania to our world-famous wine regions in South Australia to the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland, every one of these crucial national assets is at risk if we remain on our current path. Senator Hanson, reminds me, Hanson Young reminds me of the uh, impact on the great Australian bite. Indeed, another one of those magnificent wild places under threat. Here, here. Our country and our economy is hopelessly exposed, but our leaders are more stubborn than ever. And the tragedy is, of course, that the longer we delay serious action, the worse these problems become and the harder it is to get these multiplying risks under control. There are more jobs in new industries devoted to protecting our environment, improving agriculture, cleaning up our energy system, heavy industry and transport than there are in jobs, jobs in yesterday's dying, dirty industries. Yes, it's true that around 45,000 people are employed in the mining, burning and exporting of coal. But the Greens' alternative plan, the independently costed Renew Australia plan, would create four times the number of jobs every year over the decade. That is hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Jobs in engineering, in construction, in planning, in IT, in research and development. Jobs for designers, for farmers, for public servants, for land managers. Jobs in entirely new retail industries. Jobs for our regions and jobs for our cities. The science is cl crystal clear. A clean, modern, jobs-rich economy is ours to make if we can embrace progress and invest in the technological solutions that are already available to us. But no, instead the Liberal government is standing in the way of progress, standing in the way of this transition. And the Labor government-to-be aren't campaigning for change at the scale or the speed that is required. Hardly a surprise, dirty donations from the polluting coal, oil and gas industries are making sure of that. One thing this budget does make clear is that our government doesn't lack the financial resources to solve the problems we face as a nation. What they lack is the political vision. 
Our collective wealth is being squandered with a $302 billion tax splash, a giveaway paid for by cutting public services over decades. Let me tell you what the Greens would do. The Greens would use this money to make TAFE and university free again. We would get dental care into Medicare. We would increase New Start. We would build half a million new affordable homes and we'd invest in a clean energy system and guess what? We'd have billions to spare. But all the Liberals have are tax cuts. This is the full breadth and depth of what they think this country needs. Albert Einstein characterised this as insanity, trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. These tax cuts will expand economic inequality. These tax cuts will hamstring future parliaments from investing in quality schools and hospitals. These tax cuts will prevent us from creating the jobs that society needs, but a private market will never create. Of course, we know the wealthiest Australians, those who rely least on the public services that have been cut, are the ones who benefit most from these tax cuts. Middle and low income earners will pay for these tax cuts in crowded GP rooms and in hospital waiting rooms. They'll pay for it in overcrowded classrooms and burnt out teachers. And meanwhile, this budget has two thirds of the infrastructure funding going into military hardware. Or in other words, we are spending twice as much on machines of war as we are on public services. Mr Acting Deputy President, we didn't get to this place out of nowhere. It's been through the long, slow and meticulous cultivation of political influence. This budget, like all budgets before it, is the product of a political system that can be bought and sold. Our political donation system is legal corruption. It is state-sanctioned bribery. Nowhere has the sale of our democracy been more damaging than in its impact on this government's pathetic climate and energy policies, as we saw in yesterday's budget. Coal, oil and gas industry have given $8 million to both parties. They've created a giant merry-go-round of money and favours in which cash goes in as private donations and comes back, back out in many multiples of public funding. Corruption. Let me give you an example. The gas industry its the fastest growing source of pollution in Australia. But neither party will make them pay for their damage by reinstating a carbon price. Why? Because they make big donations to both sides of politics year in, year out. Australia is now the world's biggest exporter of gas, and the Commonwealth isn't collecting a cent in royalties or super profit taxes. It's hard <coughs> to conceive of a public policy that is more broken than that. If this budget makes one thing clear, it's how much a strong green voice in the Senate is needed to push back against the tide of political donations and hold the next government to account on a whole range of issues, but climate change chief among them. Now, the Liberal Party is a lost cause. The National Party, they are a lost cause. We <coughs> hope their days are numbered. <coughs> But Labor's climate policy isn't based on the science of what needs to be done to keep our oceans from rising and our land from burning. It's based on neutralising a tricky political issue and keeping vested interests on side. They're more afraid of political damage than of the damage facing our forests and farms. They've proposed a 50 per cent renewable energy target by 2030 when experts tell us that we'll exceed 80 per cent by doing nothing. Labor's climate policy actually reduces the amount of renewables rolling out rather than increase it. On coal, the situation is even more dire. Coal is the single biggest contributor to climate change. And given that 80 per cent of the coal that's mined in Australia is shipped off overseas, 
If you don't have a plan to phase out coal exports, you don't have a climate plan. It's as simple as that. Of course, we know the Liberals are addicted to coal. They bring it into parliament and they cuddle it. They kiss it. They share it amongst themselves like a precious stone. But what's the Labor Party's plan on coal? Well, they don't have one. For them, it's just business as usual. Only a strong Greens voice in the Senate will push Labor hard to take real action. And you know what? The good news is that we've done it before. Because of the Greens working constructively in a balance of power parliament with Labor in 2010, we got the world's best climate package and we drove the sharpest reduction in Australians, Australia's emissions on record. We've done it before and we can do it again. Just consider what the alternative is. Without the Greens in the Senate, the next government will be beholden to the climate deniers like Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Yep. It's only the Greens who will help create a new, clean, resilient economy by getting the lobbyists and the donations out of politics and bringing the people in. Yeah. Only then will we create a future for all of us. You see, people have had a gutful of politics as usual. We have too. We've had, to, we've had a gutful of it too. You see, it doesn't have to be that way. Politics should give people something to believe in. At this election, the Greens are putting up big, bold, evidence-based ideas that set Australia up for the future. We can tackle the big challenges we face as a nation. We can do it in a way that creates hundreds of thousands of new jobs, protects our environment and helps those people who are left behind. Of course, the Liberals don't want you to believe that an alternative is possible. They want you to think that the pressures and the problems that you're experiencing are all the fault of people who have chosen to make Australia their home. But we know where the blame lies. It lies squarely at the feet of the Liberal and National Party, who have let big corporations rot the system for their own interests. Sadly, the Labor Party aren't much better. They want you to believe that the bare minimum is enough. Well, we won't accept that. We'll continue to use our influence in the Senate to ensure we do more than the bare minimum. Through our big, forward-looking ideas, the Greens have worked with the community already to set much of the agenda in our parliament. Marriage equality, the Banking Royal Commission, a bank levy, a Royal Commission in people with, with disabilities, a national anti-corruption watchdog, a boost in funding for land care. I could go on and on. All Greens' ideas, all opposed by both major parties, and now government policy. Our team will continue to set much of the agenda in the next parliament too, built on our clear, achievable, fully costed plan for our country. Let me tell you a bit about that plan. It includes ending the billions of dollars in handouts to the mining industry and ending the $11 billion a year tax avoidance industry. We do that so we can raise enough money to give every child a place in childcare, so we can bring back TAFE and university free, so we can lift New Start and other government payments by $75 a week and return some dignity to the lives of those 838,000 Australians who depend on those payments but are now committed to living a life of poverty. Our plan includes taxing capital gains like regular income and ending the tax breaks on investment properties so that we can build half a million sustainable, affordable community homes over the next decade. No one in this country should be homeless. Everyone should be able to put a roof over their head. We would end the massive handouts to the private health insurance industry so that we can put those billions of dollars back into public hospitals, wipe out waiting lists and give everyone dental coverage under Medicare. It is the Greens who have a concrete plan to create a publicly owned bank and energy retailer so we can drive competition, lower the cost of essential services and bring an end to the toxic profit-at-all-costs mentality. 
It's the Greens' plan to ensure that the biggest polluters actually pay for their damage, the damage that they're doing to our oceans and atmosphere, so we can fund the infrastructure we need to modernise our cities and regions, to get to 100 per cent clean energy by 2030, and so we can ensure a managed transition for coal-dependent communities. With our evidence-based transition plan, we'll phase out coal, thermal coal exports over the next decade and build a clean energy export industry. It's an industry that will replace the dirty coal we currently ship overseas to our two biggest export markets, Japan and South Korea, with clean hydrogen-based power. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, this is the vision that we Greens will bring to the next parliament. It's one that is based on science. It is one that is based on what is good for people. These are the values that we'll ensure are in future budget papers. Now, getting rid of this rotten mob might feel good. I think it's going to feel bloody good, actually. <laughs> um, but it's not going to be good enough. It won't be good enough if the next Prime Minister is marginally better with a different coloured tie and an uninspiring and mediocre vision for the future. <coughs> Our job is to make sure we do better than that. Our job is for us to be our best selves. The Greens are the only party that you can rely on to think about the future, to care for people and to fight for the environment. This is our commitment to all of you. We can't wait to get started when the 46th parliament returns. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator. Senator Spender. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Reports that I have delivered my final speech are an exaggeration. I will take this opportunity to speak on the budget. Uh, Senator Lionhelm made it very easy to uh, understand what happens in the budget because in his negotiations he uh, arranged for the government to provide the last pages of the budget which provide data in real terms, so adjusted for inflation and per capita terms. So I don't really need to read the budget. I can just look to the last page. So here's the headline. This year, right now, tax per capita is the highest it has ever been in Australia. Did you hear that from Treasurer Frydenberg last night? I can't remember. Did he say tax per capita is the highest it has ever been in Australia? I don't remember him saying that. I wonder why. It seems to me the highlight of the budget. Okay, um, let's look to payments per capita. That, maybe that's a better story for the government. Okay. Uh, Payments per capita. Ah, oh, sorry again. Payments per capita, highest ever in the history of our federation. What a shame! Two for two. This government, what a coalition, liberal government. I think they call themselves. Liberal government has delivered the biggest government in Australia ever, both in tax, both in government spending, the biggest ever. It's not me. You published it. It's on the last page. Numbers are right here. Just to make it clear, on average, an Australian is taxed this financial year $15,465. No other number in the past has ever been as high. Isn't that something to be proud of, Liberal Party? And payments. Payments. Government spending per person. Government is spending on your behalf $16,634. So that's a bigger number. So even though they're taxing you more than they ever have in the past, ever, doesn't matter what government, Whitlam, Rudd, Gillard, more than they've ever taxed you in the past, they're still spending more than that on your behalf. That means more debt. They cannot live within their means. We heard last night that we're not taxing you that we're living within our means. It's just not true. The government said last night that they're doing things without increasing tax, but it is clearly the case that they are increasing tax. It is in their very own budget. Now, 
Another one of my favourite pages in the budget, because I am a bit of an uh, ex-Treasury wonk, is Table 7 in the Fiscal Strategy. This is the one where the government of either persuasion, Labor or Liberal, tries to pretend that they're not increasing spending. They often have tricks to say, we're uh, reducing overall spending. We've made decisions to reduce overall spending. Most budgets have it. This is the first budget I remember reading, and I've been reading budgets for about 20 years, where they don't even pretend. Don't even pretend to be making policy decisions that reduce overall levels of government spending. Normally you have these promises that will offset all new spending. It doesn't exist. This might be the first budget ever. No promise to offset new spending. The coalition must have just realised, hey, we've got no particular benefit in restraining government spending. There's no other party in this place that cares. The Liberal Labor Party don't care if we're increasing spending, so let's just do it. This financial year, the government, the very prudent government that we have, says we are going to make policy decisions to increase government spending by a mere $3 billion. Isn't that nice of them? We could have nearly had a budget surplus this year if the government just decided not to spend. And over the coming four years, the government has decided to spend, to make policy decisions to spend an additional $8 billion. This is unheralded in budgeting, particularly from a coalition government, which normally at least tries to pretend that they're reducing government spending. They use smoke and mirrors, they move money into out years. They didn't even bother doing it this year. It's an absolute disgrace. No one's watching. In an election year, they've made an assessment that no one cares about rising size of government. They've given up any semblance of being a liberal government. Anyone who thinks that government should be restrained, who continues to vote for the coalition, is absolutely crazy. Your only option is to vote for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you, Senator Spender. Senator Storer. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> Fairness is not a proposition that comes readily to the mind of ministers in this government, as this budget once again reminds us. The Treasurer's overnight backflip on the energy assistance, assistance payment is yet more evidence of this government's insensitivity to the need to enhance fairness and reverse inequality. That in insensitivity comes at a time when many Australians on low and, middle incomes, low and middle incomes are confronted with sluggish wages as they struggle with their food and power bills. I did, of course, vote for the measure today, the energy assistance payment, but I was appalled that when the payment was unveiled in the lead-up to the budget yesterday, people on Newstart were explicitly excluded. And if that's not bad enough that the value of Newstart and associated payments has not increased in real terms in a quarter of a century, some of the poorest people in the community were to be denied help to keep themselves warm and cook their food. Overnight, the government thought better of its stinginess, not because it genuinely, genuinely cares about the most unfortunate in our society, but because there is an election around the corner. Something is better than nothing, but a one-off payment of $75 is little more than a slap in the face to the well less well-off in our community who have been struggling with rises of much, much more in their energy bills in recent years. It is also a tacit acknowledgement that the price of energy is too high for comfort of most consumers. Despite that, this budget contains no measures to seriously address the issue. Australians are paying a high price, literally, for the failure of this government to get its act together on energy and climate change. It shows how little the government cares for the future health of the environment as well as the well-being and prosperity of the generation of Australians now voting for the first time. How else to explain the fact that the government still won't rule out wasting taxpayers' money underwriting new coal-fired power generation? This is despite the fact that renewables are the cheapest form of new generation in Australia. With our old, inefficient, increasingly unreliable and expensive coal power fleet set to retire in coming years, the government should be doing more to encourage new clean energy generation. On that score, the government should be using competitive, market-based approaches and not picking winners, as it, as it has shown a tendency to do. My home state, of, home state of South Australia has an incredible contribution to make in this field. 
but what we have in the wake of the budget is a one-off payment of $75 rather than long-term policies to encourage the development of cleaner and cheaper power into the future. Young voters, in particular, are understandably fed up with this appalling lack of leadership on climate and energy policy from this government. So don't be surprised if younger voters take it out on the final remnants of the boomer generation still in charge of policy in Canberra when they come to vote in a few weeks' time. But the story of the energy assistance payment is not the, is not the only indication that fairness has been far from top of mind for the government in the budget or elsewhere. In fact, last night's budget is a tacit admission from the government that last year's personal tax cut package offered too much to the well-off and did not do enough to assist low- and middle-income wage earners. The decision to give priority to the less well-off in the community in last night's tax program vindicates my decision to oppose stage two and stage three of the orig original package last June. On that score, I'm pleased Prime Minister and Treasurer have seen their way to clear to double the maximum relief provided by the low and middle income tax offset, which was part of stage one of the original tax package. It was a course I argued for last year, and I am pleased that in some measure the government accepted my conclusions. However, I am disappointed that the revamping of stage two and three now will see even more benefit for people on higher incomes but little to the less well off. We can get a sense of the government's long-term priorities by looking at their numbers. $19 billion, through the forward estimates, is the cost of tax relief for low- and middle-income earners. But to get an idea of just how much the overall tax package favours the well-off, we need to go, need only go to the 10-year figure, fully $300 billion. The time is long overdue for Australians to be rewarded with a government and a parliament that puts fairness right at the top of the agenda. In developing policy, Fairness ought to be the first thought, not an afterthought. The government's initial apathy on energy assistance was bad enough, but I am even more disappointed that neither the government nor Labor is prepared to commit to an increase in the criminally low level of New Start, which has not increased in real terms for fully a quarter of a century by no government, both sides included. In a nation as prosperous as Australia, this is simply a disgrace. At its current level of just $40 a day, New Start and associated payments condemn many job seekers to a life of poverty without the means to seek work in a realistic fashion, which is, after all, their primary purpose. From my earliest days in the Senate last year, I've used every opportunity and avenue to advocate an increase in New Start and associated payments to a more humane, more realistic level, not generous, but realistic. More than once, I've supported the push from ACOS and others for an increase of $75 a week, just over $10 a day. That would hardly buy a sandwich and a milkshake, to use the Amanda Vanstone Index. And it's not just ACOS leading the charge. To her credit, Jennifer Westacott from the Business Council of Australia has been advocating an increase for some years now. As she has repeatedly pointed out, at just $40 a day, New Start has itself become a barrier to effective job seeking. What a bizarre and perverse contradiction. A payment supposed to get people back into work is actually making it harder because the level is so low that job seekers cannot afford to make the clothes to make themselves presentable or bus tickets to get to job interviews. And then there's John Howard who says the new start freeze has gone on too long. Not to forget his former chief of staff and now Senator Arthur Sinodinus, who in various capacities has been at the centre of more fiscal reform and budget preparation than anyone else here. On Monday, he told Q&A on the ABC that over time it should be higher. Cautious, for sure, but we get the message and so should his coalition colleagues. Modelling by respected economist Chris Richardson of Deloitte Access Economics last year estimated that an increase of $75 a week would cost the budget $3.3 billion but produce a prosperity dividend, mainly through increased spending, of $4 billion and also provide a significant fairness di dividend, which was targeted at low, at, at low income earners, of course, and especially in regional areas. That sounds like a pretty, pretty sensible transaction, especially when the budget papers indicate consumption is sluggish. 
So it's appalling that neither major party is prepared to commit to a new start increase that would stop many people living in poverty as they try to get a job. Maybe there aren't enough votes among the job seekers. <clears throat> if that is the calculation of the major parties, they ought to stand condemned. The government is very pleased with itself that if current economic trends continue, all debt will be paid off by 2030. Perhaps the Prime Minister and the Treasurer might take a moment to thank those crossbenchers in the Senate who braved their scorn last June for opposing the full suite of the government's proposed company tax cuts. Not only did we save the budget $35 billion in revenue foregone, but the money saved is also making a massive contribution to the task of re reducing debt. Calculations by the Australian Institute today estimate that fully $90 billion of the projected reduction from the current net debt level of $374 billion over the next 10 years comes from the fact that the tax cuts to the big end of town were defeated in the Senate last year. It's another reminder of the value of the crossbench to the Senate. The government seems to be slow learners because this budget now bakes in tax cuts worth $300 billion into the budget for, the, for a decade, regardless of economic circumstances and their lack of fairness. Symbolism is stark, as is in the absence of any real action in the budget to make Australia a cleaner and healthier place for the generations who will follow us, who will have to clean up the mess we have made of the environment. They, generations who follow us, will pay a heavy price for the government's years of inaction, opposition and internal conflict over real action on climate change just as they may for rash commit commitments to tax cuts for the well-off two and three elections into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Storr. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I uh, rise tonight to uh, um, speak on the uh, budget. I'm only going to have a brief uh, um, uh, session on this. There are lots of good things in uh, this budget, and I'm not surprised it's an election budget. And, uh, I guess what we need to do now is look and see what uh, Mr Shorten does in the other place, what he announces, uh, and <coughs> voters will get to have their choice uh, in respect of uh, who they wish to, to lead and who might uh, better manage the economy and uh, provide leadership in the, in the building of this nation. Um, whilst there are many good things in the budget, and once again I have to concede that there are, uh, there are some issues, and some issues for South Australia, that I just want to put on the record. Now, South Australia uh, has a declining population uh, when compared to other states, and that's indeed why uh, we currently have uh, 11 members in the, uh, in the other place. Um, after this election, we'll only have 10 because of the, uh, the declining relative population of, of South Australia. And in some sense, that's because uh, uh, we've been constrained in terms of growth, and some of that growth uh, is, uh, ha has been because of poor migration, uh, immigration uh, policies. And I can see there are, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. We are looking now at bringing skilled migrants into regional areas, which is, uh, which is a good thing. Um, I'll also note that uh, this year we did actually get quite a good um, uh, percentage of the infrastructure spend. Last year uh, we were sort of uh, uh, less than our population uh, share. This, this year we've got about 13 per cent of new funds injected into South Australia, but, but there's a problem. Uh, this money seems to be have, have been injected in some sense in a, in a pork barrelling, un, um, targeted fashion rather than in accordance with a plan. Let me uh, just talk about it, uh, uh, a trip I, road trip I did last week uh, around uh, the northern part of uh, South Australia in the Eyre Peninsula. There's a number of uh, projects uh, around South Australia that could, be gr could be bring great wealth uh, to South Australia and indeed to the nation. Uh, we have the Braemar province to the uh, east, northeast of South Australia. Uh, where there is a, a quite a significant, uh, uh, was quite significant deposits of iron ore. I, go up, I was up in uh, Roxby Downs, Olympic Dam, last week, where we've got BHP uh, with a predominantly uh, uh, co copper mine, 
trying to expand. They're exploring expanding uh, their, their operations there. I went to Lee Creek. Uh, Lee Creek Energy last week announced to the Stock Exchange that uh, they have discovered uh, gas uh, with a quantity equivalent to that of the Cooper Basin, so it's a significant find. It's a significant opportunity for South Australia. We know GFG in uh, GFG in now it's an ex coal mine. I'll take that interjection. It was an ex, it, it was a coal mine, and now it, uh, now we can get uh, some some uh, gas from uh, from that mine. Uh, the uh, GFG, the steelworks in, in Wyala, also due for a significant upgrade. Fantastic thing. And we've also got uh, at Woodner, we've got the Iron Road project, which is another substantial uh, iron ore deposit where we could uh, open up uh, that region to a significant uh, iron ore mining uh, uh, um, opportunity. And people are working towards these things, but when I look at the infrastructure that we have uh, in those areas, there's very little in the way of rail to get uh, these, these uh, commodities to, to uh, any ports, and indeed uh, no seaports at all, uh, no deep seaports uh, in uh, South Australia on the Eyre Peninsula, where we uh, probably could be shipping uh, these resources at relatively low cost. CU River Mining, which ha they have an iron ore mine that is uh, very close to Cooper Pedy. Uh, they, uh, they're going to have to take their product down to Port Augusta and then uh, load it onto barges to take it out to a ship that can, uh, a Cape class vessel that can, can uh, e export that, uh, that iron ore. It's a rather inefficient way of doing things. But there's a lack of a plan. There's no plan to, to, to look at rail. In fact, I, I probably mislead uh, the chamber in some respects because one of the priority projects in our infrastructure uh, priority projects list uh, is uh, the Iron Road project, which uh, includes the iron ore mine at Woodner and a rail line running down to Cape Hardy, where we could have a seaport. But instead of backing that, instead of spending some money and actually seeding that project, a priority project nonetheless, the government sat on its hands and done nothing to support that project moving ahead. Nothing at all. And there's great opportunity for uh, Cape Hardy to become a multi-user seaport uh, where, where it uh, services uh, the, the, uh, the iron ore mine were it to go ahead at Woodna, uh, and indeed uh, grain growers all across the Eyre Peninsula and a number of other people that have, or companies that have indicated that they'd be most, uh, they'd be most pleased in using that port. But instead of backing that port, somehow we've now got a situation where additional port options have been thrown up. So now we've, had, we've got option, options at uh, Port Spencer, we've got options at uh, uh, Port uh, Stanback, we've, uh, sorry, not Port Stanback, uh, um, uh, Stony Point near Wyala, we've got a, uh, an option for a, a seaport at Lucky Bay, we've got an option for a seaport uh, uh, at Wyala. And of course, all that does is just create confusion. Business doesn't know what to do, and uh, so we're in this sort of vacuum of leadership. And uh, this uh, will uh, cause a delay, perhaps even uh, prevent some of these projects going ahead. And there's ten billion dollars worth of uh, activity, economic activity, that could flow from these projects. But no plan from the government, uh, no funding in the budget to assist uh, in that economic activity. In terms of uh, growing uh, South Australia, we, you know, one, one of the good things is that we may well get more migrants, but more, more migrants uh, are no good unless they're well trained. Okay? We, need, uh, we, we need skilled migrants. We also need skilled Australians. So Lee Creek will likely employ something like three, uh, three and a half thousand people. Wyala, uh, the steelworks, two and a half thousand people. Uh, Olympic Dam, probably around about three thousand. Iron Road project, somewhere around about three thousand people. This is, uh, you know, getting up to close to fifteen thousand people when I include the uh, the the people that will will be required in Adelaide 
for the naval shipbuilding program. And it's all good stuff, except uh, with the skills package that's been uh, uh, announced in the budget, uh, which I support to a certain extent. There are some problems there. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no indication of location of where these uh, training um, where this training will be directed, where it will be located. And I do have a problem. Uh, the, the budget does talk about 80,000 apprentices, and most people think that's great. We're creating, a, we're creating an opportunity for 80,000 young Australians to, to get a trade, except the government has cancelled or hasn't funded uh, the mentoring program that. Uh, we've seen in South Australia move completion rates from 50 per cent to 95 per cent. So it's no good creating 80,000 places. I mean, there is some good in that, but it's much, much better to have 80,000 apprentices finishing their trade. And that's missing from this budget, that mentoring program that was so successful in boosting the completion rates for apprentices. So that's a little bit disappointing. Once again, because of those numbers, uh, of jobs that could be, uh, that, that could be uh, 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 formed in these uh, projects running all across, uh, all across uh, uh, regional South Australia. I welcome the government's uh, $100 million injection into regional airports. That's really good. We can have some upgrades to our airports and uh, that, that, uh, uh, those upgrades would otherwise end up uh, being funded by councils, by ratepayers, and air transport is the lifeblood of regional communities. People in regional communities they want to connect to the cities. They want to be able to get access to medical services. They want to be able to get access to, to educational services. They need to be able to get access to their headquarters, businesses to their headquarters in the capital cities. Um, uh, we need to be able to get locums to, to, to travel to these places. But right now we're facing a, a problem where we've got very uh, expensive regional airfares. And uh, the government, what have they done? Last year they announced uh, they're going to spend, in the last year's budget, they announced they're going to spend $51 billion to upgrade security at some of the regional airports. And that's fine. That pays for the, uh, for the screening equipment, that, uh, the X-ray equipment that might be needed uh, f uh, to upgrade security. But they've failed to pay for the somewhere between $530 and $760,000 per annum required to operate that, is, that security equipment. So councils are going to have to somehow find you know, more than half a million dollars to run those security services at the airports. And they can't just make that money. That, what, what they're going to have to do is uh, pass that charge on uh, to the airlines, who are going to pass it on to their customers, who are going to raise their prices. And uh, the, the Senate committee that's looking at rural airfares uh, has heard evidence from Qantas, uh, specifically in relation to, uh, to Port Lincoln, to Wyala, uh, to Kangaroo Island, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the examples given by Qantas. Those services may become unviable when those uh, additional costs are passed on to the airlines. Now, at, uh, at a hearing we had in uh, Old Parliament House on, on Monday, the department conceded they had never done any analysis on the effect of these security changes, of these costs, on regional communities. Total lack of due diligence. They would only looked at things from a, uh, from a security perspective. So we needed something in the budget. If you're going to impose a security uh, uh, regime on regional airports and note it's to deal with national security, national security should be paid uh, across the nation, not lumped onto to, uh, to local councils. So that's a hugely problematic uh, um, a situation we've got, and I have foreshadowed in, in the committee, I'll do so here in the chamber, that I will uh, move to disallow the, uh, the regulation that requires that, uh, that, that uh, uh, additional security until such time 
as we make sure that uh, regional communities don't have to bear the cost and perhaps lose air services. So that's uh, that's also on uh, certainly on my radar uh, for when we when we come back. Uh, energy prices. I know we have uh, the uh, energy assistance uh, 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 package uh, that uh, Senator Storr has just mentioned before. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in uh, a speech earlier today, um, that idea came uh, from uh, Centre Alliance when we were negotiating the uh, tax enterprise uh, a bill uh, that gave tax cuts to businesses with a turnover of less than uh, $50 million uh, back in 2017. So I find it interesting that the, uh, the bill mentions one-off payments, because it's not a one-off payment, it's the second uh, time. It's, well, this is an ongoing payment, and, it, and it's an ongoing payment because of a failure of government policy. When we negotiated uh, that particular payment with the government, we did so on the basis that, uh, that uh, people needed help with their electricity bills, their, their energy bills, uh, whilst the government sorted out uh, our energy problems. Now, since that time, we've seen uh, an EIS proposed, we've seen a clean energy target by uh, Professor Finkel, we've seen a, uh, a, a NEG. We've seen a neg plus. We've seen uh, uh, we've seen a big stick even waved around, but no changes, which means we now have to make this payment. So I think that payment, that bill, is just a good example of, uh, or it's the most stark evidence that this Senate can can uh, uh, possibly have that there has been a total failure uh, in energy policy and electricity uh, policy uh, from this government and. Uh, uh, it's not that the Senate wouldn't have supported an egg. Uh, I think we, we could have got there. There was some debate about, uh, about whether or not uh, the emissions would be Paris targets, uh, would we use the Paris targets or 35 per cent or 60 per cent, whatever the Greens were proposing. That could have been dealt with. The problem was uh, the coalition couldn't get it past their own party room. In fact, uh, I, I recall. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Turnbull did get it past the party room, then a week later, for some reason, just backflipped, and, uh, 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 and then a week later was no longer the Prime Minister. So, uh, so that's a signal in the, in the budget that there's a, there's a real problem. Um, finally, I'll just wrap up with, uh, with uh, uh, concerns about GST. So it appears that uh, South Australia will miss out, uh, lose out on uh, $517 million of GST. So we've got a negative, uh, uh, we've got a hole in, our, in the South Australian budget, a punishment uh, to the South Australians. Now I remember being in this chamber where we were talking about GST and trying to make it absolutely fair. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we needed to appease the, uh, the Western Australians. We needed to give them more, uh, more GST. Well, I guess no, it worked out well for Western Australians, okay? but it didn't work out well for South Australian Senator Gallagher. I, I take your interjection. Uh, so that's another big problem, and that's something uh, that I undertake to address when we, when we do come back, uh, perhaps in the next parliament. So to summing up, I think, uh, I think the budget uh, is, uh, has got some, some goodies in there. I am keen to see what uh, Mr Shorten will offer, what his plan is as well, as, as the electorate uh, uh, we'll be watching. Uh, however, um, I, I think I'm grateful for the, so for the infrastructure spend, but I don't think it's well targeted. And we have to do better. We have to plan our infrastructure better around the projects that will get this country moving along and, to, and get South Australia uh, moving in the right direction. Um, uh, we've got to make sure we, uh, we promote our, our regions. Uh, in, in South Australia, the Mount Gambiers, the Riverlands, uh, you know, the, the Wyalas, the Port Pirries, the Sejunas, Port Lincolns. Uh, and, uh, we, in order to do that, we need to invest properly. We need to have a plan. Um, uh, so, uh, reasonable job by the government but, uh, uh, for, for most of Australia, but I think South Australia has actually missed out here and that's of major concern to me. Okay. Um, I'll go to Senator Smith first, I understand. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I present uh, all reports and documents as listed at items 18 and 22 on today's order of business. B. Additional reports from the Appropriations, Staffing and Security Committee and the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee. C. Additional information from the Community Affairs References Committee. And D. On behalf of the Minister, five government responses. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr President, I move that the Senate at its rising adjourn till Monday 13 May 2019 at 10 a.m. or such other time as may be fixed by the President or in the event of the President being unavailable by the Deputy President and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each Senator. The question is the motion moved by Senator Fifield be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The eyes have it. I promise not to act unilaterally. Senator Fifield. That's rhetorical. To Senator call Fifield. That one. Um, Mr. President, I move that uh, leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting today to the day on which the Senate next meets. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The eyes have it. I propose that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the federal seat of Petrie is home to many hard-working Queenslanders who want a hand up in life, not, not a hand out. And Petrie is represented in this parliament by one of the hardest-working Australians I've ever had the good fortune of knowing, my friend and colleague Luke Howth, MP. During the six years that Luke Howth has been the federal member, he's been fighting for locals and delivering for locals. The Bruce Highway has been upgraded, the Gateway Motorway upgraded, the Moreton Bay, Bay Link has been built, uh, the Rothwell Roundabout fixed, Boundary Road has been upgraded, the Dolphin Stadium has been built. Luke has fought for funding to install CCCTV, keeping the community safer. Environmental projects, solar for local community groups and, of course, more funding for schools and hospitals. Luke Howth is a hard-working, honest man who is delivering for his community. He's exactly the sort of person we need in Parliament because he's exactly that type of person who fights for the people of Petrie. Bill Shorten's candidate for Petrie, Corinne Mulholland, doesn't even come close. She has no real-world experience, having worked for politicians and now the council for her entire career. She was campaigning for a year while still employed by the council, campaigning for the Labor Party on a cushy six-figure taxpayer-funded council salary. Worse, worse, Mr President, as detailed by the Sydney Morning Herald on 13 September of last year and by the Brisbane Times on 7 November 2018, the Labor candidate is connected to allegations of cronyism and corruption within the council. And as the Herald notes, Ms Mulholland controlled much of the Mayor's diary and oversaw the Council's events and marketing operations. This is the same Council that is now under investigation by Queensland's Crime and Corruption Commission. And I call on Ms Mulholland to come forward and, and detail— Order, Senator McGrath. Mm. Senator O'Neill and I, I think it's a shame at this time of the evening that we are subjected to this tirade from Senator McGrath, who's making all sorts of allegations. In, a, in, in an outrageous way, I think he should order. withdraw the allegations he's put to. I, 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 firstly, Senator O'Neill, I don't gather, unless you can correct me uh, on anything unparliamentary that has been said, um, and I will say that it is not uncommon for adjournment speeches to deal with similar subject matter. Senator McGrath, Senator O'Neill, I, I didn't hear anything unparliamentary. I'm happy to be corrected if there is something. I agree that it really wasn't worth listening to, but I do believe that the senator accused somebody of being corrupt. Now that's point of order, Mr. President. I've well, said there are allegations. Sure, that'd be great. I've said there are allegations. Yeah, that's, that's low. Um, uh, well, Senator O'Neill, that's not unparliamentary. Um, senator McGrath. What we're seeing, uh, for those listening at home, is a protection racket. Protection racket from the Labor, the Labor senators opposite, who want who want to cover up. And I call on Ms. Mulholland to come forward and detail detail her involvement in this dodginess, this dodginess that, 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 that the allegations are circulating about her. Come Senator forward Ketter, and detail on a point of order, Senator Ketter. Point of order. I just note the clock, uh, Mr. President, has been reset. Uh, so. Um, I, I, I think Senator McGrath had about three minutes to go. Senator McGrath. Uh, Senator McGrath. 
Oh, I'm disappointed, uh, Senator Kedder. I mean, I, I could speak for 20 minutes on, 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 on the miscreant behaviour of, of Labor candidates. But, um, and this is, this is an addition to the hypocrisy of Bill Shorten's Labor candidate for Petrie on saving the North Lakes Golf Club from being sold to developers, an issue which the North Lakes community and Luke Health has been passionately advocating against. And Luke Health has been on the community side with this issue from the start. And it was only when Ms Mulholland saw that the community groundswell was starting to grow that she got on side. And this is really suspicious, Mr President, because Ms Mulholland was previously suspiciously silent on this important community issue. And many have said this is because it may have been due to her close relationship with the council. So the choice for locals in Petrie is between two polar opposites. There's Luke Howarth, who has been working hard and delivering for his constituents. Luke Howarth is a tradie who grew up at Bracken Ridge, who taught at the local judo club and has run his own business. And it's Luke Howarth who understands the hard work that goes into providing for and raising a family, who will always be there for the people of Petrie and making sure it's easier for them to get ahead. Or there's Bill Shorten's Labor candidate. The Labor candidate has been taking advantage of, of, of ratepayer money and working for the Labor Party on, on the clock. The Labor candidate has never worked order. outside Senator of the. Senator McGrath, Senator, um, Senator O'Neill on a point of order. Well, Senator McGrath is getting a little excited, and I'm pretty sure he just accused. He didn't, he didn't say the word allegation. He just accused the uh, Labor candidate of taking something. Taking um, money. Uh, uh -huh. um, Senator O'Neill, again, if, if something unparliamentary was said, I'm happy to have the record brought to me. I didn't detect anything unparliamentary at that point. So, Senator McGrath, to continue. Protection racket, Mr President. What we're seeing opposite here is a protection racket. Labor senators are coming in to try and protect this, this poorly, poorly uh, performing Labor candidate up in Petrie because they know that Luke Howarth is a brilliant local member and Luke Howarth is going to hold Petrie like he did at the last election. And the arrogance of Labor, Mr President, they thought they were going to take Petrie in 2016 and they didn't. And there was a swing. There was a swing to, to Luke Howarth. And I guarantee you, Mr President, there will be a swing to Luke Howarth at this coming election. Now, so, so the choice is the choice is here. You can vote for, a, for a, a Labor candidate with all these allegations hanging over her, or you can vote for one of the hardest working members in Parliament, Luke Howth MP, and you can send a message to the protection racket over there. Send a message to the Labor Party and say you're going to stand up to stand up for real serving members of the community, not these fake plastic Labor people who come in here and you know, get their jobs in the public service. Stand up for people like Luke Howth because they're going to stand up for you. Thank you, Mr President. Order. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, uh, that was a very entertaining uh, uh, dissertation from Senator McGrath. But I speak on a very important matter, uh, Mr. President. As Deputy Chair of the Joint Standing Committee of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I've learned a lot in the last uh, four or five years. I've learned an enormous amount about this sector, this community, uh, the people in it, the people who provide services in it, and we are engaged in what truly was a bipartisan uh, effort to dramatically change the lives of people with disability. And we've seen people's lives turned around through uh, acceptance into the scheme and funding of, uh, of their needs and aspirations. And we've seen ageing parents relieved of an enormous amount of uh, stress and worry because there is uh, something in place for their children uh, as they move into uh, you know, uh, more fragile circumstances. And, and there's no doubt that the, the agency has had an enormous task set in front of it and has improved on its delivery. We need to thank the workers at the NDIA that worked so hard to make the lives of participants so much better. We've had wonderful uh, assistance from the Secretariat, uh, a wonderful team that's resourced the uh, Joint Standing Committee for uh, you know, a couple of parliaments now. Really great work. And as a senator for South Australia, the members and the senators' contact officers at the NDIA have helped enormously with representations from concerned NDIS participants and members of the public. You know, still the frustration with the scheme is there. Our families, carers, service providers, and, and those people in the NDIS workforce are, uh, are under stress. There is a lot of concern about service delivery. There are providers who are concerned in a whole range of areas, and some would be even construed as additional red tape, which has been the, uh, quite contrary to the mantra of this government. 
But what we've come to, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, and I listened very carefully to Ms. Uh, Minister Fifield's answer to questions today um, about the, uh, the use of surplus funds in the NDIS uh, appropriations in, in balancing, so to speak, the budget. Now, nobody in the sector makes any, uh, any aspersions. It's entirely reasonable for governments to be prudent with taxpayers' money. But if you look at what the uh, Deputy Chief Executive has said, governments, of course, year on year will look at expenditure, and I can never guarantee you in any year that it, what a government would do. It, the scheme funds, used to be our appropriation, but the scheme funds are now the Department of Service, uh, Social Services appropriation. This technicality essentially makes the department the post box for NDIA money, currently worth about $18 billion, and makes it much easier for a government to obscure how much money is actually being spent. And it is this money which contributes to the predicted surplus. Very clearly, this is an accounting uh, shift, if you like, and there are people within the scheme who are not very happy about it, and I can understand why. There are people who require 24-hour, seven-day-a-week support. And in, through my office, as late as last week, one such person was advised there are no funds available. 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week service, no funds available. Now, there is a crisis allocation, there is a crisis process there, and you know, it's unlikely that a person will be in that as dire a situation. But that's what they were advised. There are people who have an audiologist and a doctor verifying that their hearing aid is uh, not suiting their hearing requirements, and under the scheme, uh, the decision is you have to wait till it depreciates a bit further before it gets replaced. <coughs> It doesn't make a lot of sense to people who cannot see their plan until it's been approved. And when it doesn't contain the things that they need, uh, to be told you'll have to go through a review process, or the funds which were done under a state or territory allocation are not available under the NDIS scheme. It makes no sense to these people. It actually looks cruel and hurtful. And you know the government will do what governments do to balance their books, but the money in this scheme, properly and prudently appropriated, for people with disability, should remain in that sector and be expended prudently, carefully, and in accordance with the scheme guidelines, not shifted. Order, Senator Gallagher. Senator Storer. Thank you, Mr. President. In an era of fake news, the ABC stands out like a beacon in Australia's media landscape. A public opinion survey by the Roy, Roy Morgan organisation is but the latest to confirm that the ABC is by far the nation's most trusted media organisation. For example, the survey found that while, while close to half of all Australians—47 per cent, to be precise—distrust social media, just 9 per cent distrust the ABC. 80 per cent of those polled trust the ABC, telling the Morgan organisation that their trust is driven by its lack of bias and impartiality, quality journalism and ethics. Yeah. Australians expect their ABC not only to be independent, but for the nation's broadcasters, management and board to protect that independence. The events of last August and September, the sacking of Michelle Guthrie and the subsequent resignation of Justine Milne, are at the very least undermine the confidence at the very least, undermine the confidence of Australians that the board and the managing director were, were defending the ABC's independence. Indeed, Mr Milne has acknowledged that he saw himself as a conduit between the government and the ABC. By his own evidence to the Senate inquiry of, that I participated into allegations of political interference to the ABC, by his own evidence to this and other interviews, he acknowledged his concerns about the impact of the reporting of some of the corporation's most senior journalists and Triple J's decision to shift its Hottest 100 broadcast would have an impact on ABC funding. In 2012, Parliament passed amendments to the ABC Act designed to ensure enhanced independence, integrity and transparency in the process for appointing directors to the ABC board. This government has had a habit of ignoring the spirit of that legislation. Three appointees to the board by this government were not recommended by the independent nomination panel. A fourth was highly rated by the panel but then withdrew from the process 
but was subsequently appointed by the minister. As evidence to the inquiry indicated, the appointment, approach to appointments by this government may have directly led to the problems centering on Mr Milne and Guthrie. Only one member of the board had direct media experience. None, apart from the staff elected director, had experience in public broadcasting. Despite all that and the impression of many Australians that the government did put pressure on the ABC on many occasions, the Prime Minister again ignored the spirit of the appointment process with a captain's pick for the position of ABC board chair. Ida Buttrose does appear to be better qualified than any other recent appointment, but in the circumstances I believe it would have been better that she had gone through the independent nomination process. The fact that she was not approached does not necessarily point to deficiencies in the appointment process. It may well have been a consequence of deficiencies in the approach taken by the executive search firm. This is one reason I readily endorse readily endorse the inquiry's recommendation to enhance the transparency and accountability of the nomination panel. Equally, I also endorse the recommendation to require the Prime Minister to table a statement advising the Parliament on the extent and outcome of consultations with the Leader of the Opposition on board appointments. No process will be perfect, but the more transparency the better, especially in the light of the events surrounding Mr Milne and Mr Guthrie. I would like to take note of the recommendation acknowledging in this report, acknowledging the, that the benefit and desirability of stable funding as a guard, in part, against political interference. The ABC would like a five-year cycle rather than three, and they may well be right. However, I believe it is even more important to guard against out-of-cycle cuts to the ABC budget. Since this government came to office in 2013, the ABC has had its base funding cut by at least $340 million, according to the MEAA. No organisation can plan for its future on that basis. In my view, it would be wise for the national broadcasters, SBS as well as the ABC, to make public their funding requirements ahead of the budget cycle. The government should be required to then respond. That would be no guarantee of certainty, but at least if there were out-of-cycle cuts, the responsibility and consequences could be well and truly sheeted home. The ABC is the nation's most trusted and valued cultural institution. I sincerely hope that we will never see its independence challenged again by a government in the way we have seen in recent years, and that the inquiry we undertook, uh, and of which we delivered a major majority uh, uh, committee report, will in help ensure that this is the case. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Uh, Mr President, I'd just like to take the opportunity to note that that was perhaps the last contribution that we might have in this place from Senator Storer. And, um, I know it's just a little bit over a year since you've, you've been in this place, Senator Storer, and perhaps you haven't grabbed as many headlines as other people who sit down at the end of that chap at that cha at the chamber here with us. But I, I, um, while I wish that you had voted with the Labor Party on, on every occasion, I think it's really important to note that um, your contribution to this place has reflected an incredible uh, work ethic and a genuine, genuine and professional uh, manner of communicating with all of your colleagues. And I think your thoughtful con contributions to debate have really added to the work that we have done here in the Senate. And I think uh, your final speech here, still doing the work, uh, standing up for what you believe in and putting on the record your thoughts as part of the national debate for the historical record of the nation um, is worthy of comment and I think that you have been an embellishment to the chamber in the time that you've been here and I wanted that to be recorded and noted. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I remind senators that legislation committees are scheduled to meet to consider estimates commencing tomorrow morning at 9am. Program details will be published on the Senate website. The Senate stands adjourned and is scheduled to meet again on Monday the 13th of May at 10am.